Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Judge, uh, thank you. Good day yesterday. The family did great. Y'all clean up well. You look good. So uh, the game plan for today is to do our first round of 30-minute questioning. Each senator will have 30 minutes to interact with Judge Barrett. Uh, then we'll follow up with a second round of 20 minutes. That's what we've been doing in the committee since I've been here. I, doubt, <clears throat> I know we won't get it all done today, but the goal is to get through the first 30-minute period today, uh, then come back uh, Wednesday and finish up, then we'll go on about our business. So uh, I will try to, I'll make sure I stay within 30 minutes for sure, and if I can shorten it up, I will. So uh, let's get to it. You can start the clock. <laughs> so uh, you can relax a bit here, Judge, and take your mask off. So yesterday we had a lot of discussion about the Affordable Health Care Act. What I'm going to try to do very briefly this morning is to demonstrate the difference between politics and judging. All of my colleagues on the other side had uh, very emotional pleas about Obamacare, uh, charts of people with pre-existing conditions. I want to give you my side of the story about Obamacare. Now this is Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, talking. This is not a question directed at you. From my point of view, Obamacare has been a disaster for the state of South Carolina. All of you over there want to impose Obamacare on South Carolina. We don't want it. We want something better. We want something different. You know what we want in South Carolina? South Carolina care, not Obamacare. Now, why do we want that? Under the Affordable Care Act, <clears throat> three states get 35% of the money, folks. Can you name them? I'll help you. California, New York, and Massachusetts. They're 22% of the population. Senator Feinstein's from California. Nancy Pelosi's from California. Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Democratic Senate, is from New York. And Massachusetts uh, is Elizabeth Warren. Now, why do they get 35% of the money when they're only 22% of the population? That's the way they designed the law. The more you spend, the more you get. What does it mean for the people of South Carolina? If you had a per patient, per patient formula where you got the same amount from the federal government to the state, whether you lived in Charleston, Columbia, or San Francisco, or New York City, if you leveled that out, it'd be almost a billion dollars more for us in South Carolina. So to my friends over there, we're going to fight back. We want our money. If you're going to have money allocated for Obamacare, we're not going to sit back and quietly let you give 35% of it to three states. What else has happened in South Carolina? Four rural hospitals have closed because the revenue streams are uncertain. 30% increase in premiums in South Carolina for those on Obamacare. I was on Obamacare for a few years before I got on TRICARE. My premiums went up 300%, my coverage was almost non-existent, a $6,000 deductible. So I want a better deal. And that's a political fight. I'm in a campaign at home. If it were up to me, we would block grant this money, send it back to the states in a more fair allocation, and we would require pre-existing conditions to be covered as part of the block grant. We want sick people covered, but I got an idea. I think South Carolina may, may be able to deal with diabetes better than, and different than California. If you want good outcomes in medicine, you need innovation. And the best way to get innovation is to allow people to try different things to get better outcomes. So the debate on health care is consolidating all the power in Washington, have some bureaucrat you'll never meet running this program versus having it centered in the state where you live. Under my proposal, South Carolina would get almost a billion dollars more. The state of South Carolina would be in charge of administering Obamacare. They couldn't build football stadiums with the money. They have to spend it on health care. They'd have to cover pre-existing conditions. But if, as a patient in South Carolina, you would have a voice you don't have today. If you didn't like what was happening to you on the health care front, you could go to local officials and complain. And the people you're complaining to live in your state. They send their family to the same hospital as you go. That's a structural difference. That's got nothing to do with this hearing. 
It's got everything to do with politics. We on this side do not believe Obamacare is the best way to provide quality health care over time. Our friends on the other side, this is a placeholder for single-payer health care. If you don't believe me, just ask them. So that's the fight going into 2020. Doesn't make them bad, it just makes them different. If we're up to me, bureaucrats would not be administering health care from Washington. People in South Carolina would be running health care. If we're up to me, we'd get more money under Obamacare than we do today. 35% would not go to three states. And sick people would be covered. So that's the political debate. We're involved in a campaign in South Carolina, and my fate will be left up to the people of South Carolina. So that's what Obamacare is all about. Now, how do you play in here, Judge? There's a lawsuit involving the Affordable Care Act before the Supreme Court, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And the difference between analyzing a lawsuit and having a political argument is fundamentally different, and I hope to be able to demonstrate that over the course of the day. And I hope that my colleagues on this side of the aisle will not feel shy about telling my colleagues on the other side of the aisle why we think we have a better idea on health care. Now, the bottom line here, Judge, you said yesterday something that struck me, uh, and I want the American people to understand what you meant. You said you're an originalist. Is that true? What does that mean in English? Uh, pass the button. I mean, we all love Senator Lee, but in English. In English. Okay, so in English, that means that I interpret the Constitution as a law, that I interpret its text as text, and I understand it to have the meaning that it had at the time people ratified it. Okay. So that meaning doesn't change over time, and it's not up to me to update it or infuse my own policy views into it. So in other words, you're, you're bound by the people who wrote it at the time they wrote it. That keeps you from substituting your judgment for theirs. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, Justice Scalia, he was an originalist, right? Yes, he was. People say that you're a female Scalia. What would you say? I would say that Justice Scalia was obviously a mentor. And as I said um, in the, when I accepted the president's nomination, that his philosophy is mine too. You know, he was a very eloquent um, defender of originalism, and that was also true of textualism, which is the way that I approach statutes in their interpretation. And similarly to what I just said about originalism, for textualism, the judge approaches the text as it was written with the meaning it had at the time and doesn't infuse <coughs> her own meaning into it. But I want to be careful to say that if I'm confirmed, you would not be getting Justice Scalia. You would be getting Justice Barrett. And that's so because originalists don't always agree, and neither do textualists. Justices Scalia and Thomas disagreed often enough that my friend Judge Amul Thapar teaches a class called Scalia versus Thomas. You know, it's not a mechanical exercise. Well, I'll wait till the movie comes out. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, the bottom line for me is there is a narrative building in this country, and again, you can stand down. This is just me speaking for me. Justice Ginsburg was an iconic figure in American history, just not the law. She was a trailblazer. She fought for better conditions for women throughout society. She was unashamedly progressive in her personal thought. She was uh, devout to her faith. Uh, she worked for the ACLU. She was proudly pro-choice personally. But all of us on this side, apparently when they voted, accepted that she was highly qualified. What I want the American people to know, I think it's okay to be religiously conservative. I think it's okay to be personally pro-choice. I think it's okay to live your life in a traditional Catholic fashion and you still be qualified for the Supreme Court. So all the young conservative women out there, this hearing to me is about a place for you. I hope when this is all over that you, there'll be a place for you at the table. There'll be a spot for you at the Supreme Court like there was for Judge Ginsburg. And to President Trump, I don't know if you're listening or not, by picking Judge Barrett, you have publicly said you find value in all of these characteristics, but beyond anything else, you find Judge Barrett to be highly qualified. I would say you're one of the greatest picks President Trump could have made. And from the conservative side of the aisle, 
you're one of the most qualified people uh, of your generation. Let's talk about Brown versus Board of Education, because I know Senator Blumenthal will. I'm going <laughs> to talk about that. You said in writings it was a super president. What did you mean? Well, in my writings, so as a professor, I talked about the doctrine of stare decisis. And super precedent is not a doctrinal term that comes from the Supreme Court. And I think maybe in political conversation or in newspapers, people use it different ways. But in my writing, I was using a framework that's been articulated by other scholars. And in that context, super precedent means precedent that is so well established that it would be unthinkable that it would ever be overruled. And there are about six cases on this list that other scholars have identified. Let's talk about Brown and talk about why it would be unthinkable. <clears throat> First, let's talk about what's the process that would lead to it being overruled. What would have to happen? For Brown to be overruled, you would have to have Congress or some state or local government impose segregation again, open segregation. Okay, let's stop right there. If you want to make yourself famous, by the end of the day, you can say we want to go back to segregation. I promise you, you'll be on every cable TV channel in America. I doubt if you'll go very far, but the point we're trying to make here is the court just can't wake up and say, let's revisit Brown. It has to be a case in controversy. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So before a Brown decision, could you could review Brown, somebody out there would have to be dumb enough to pass a law saying, let's go back to segregated schools. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Do you see that happening anytime soon? I do not see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, so let's talk about the process in general. <clears throat> There's the Heller case. What's that about? The Heller case is a case decided by the Supreme Court, which held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms. Okay. Now, my friends on the left, some of them have a problem with Heller. They may try to challenge the construct of Heller. If a state or local government passed a law in defiance of Heller, what would happen? In defiance of Heller? Or, or that was challenging the construct of Heller? That challenged the construct of Heller. If it was a lower, if it was brought in a lower court, Heller binds. I mean, Heller's lower courts always have to follow Supreme Court precedent. And so that and if law the if the uh, Supreme Court wanted to revisit Heller, what would they do? Um, if someone challenged Heller below because a state or local government passed a law contradicting Heller, the Supreme Court would have to take that case once it was appealed all the way up. So the court would have to decide, yes, we want to overrule Heller and we have enough votes uh, to grant cert and then do so. So that's the way the process works. Yes, it would start because there was a law, then there was a lawsuit, then there was an appeal, then the court granted cert, and then the court decided the case. Is that true no matter what the issue is, whether it's gun, abortion, health care, uh, campaign finance, does that process hold true for everything? Yes, you always, no, judges can't just wake up one day and say, I have an agenda, I like guns, I hate guns, I like abortion, I hate abortion, and walk in like a a royal queen and impose you know, their will on the world. You have to wait for cases and controversies, which is the language of the Constitution, to wind their way through the process. All right, well, Senator Sass gave us a good uh, civics lesson. I hope that's the basic lesson in the law here. So if a state said, you know, I don't think you should have over six bullets, and somebody believed that violated the Second Amendment, there would be a lawsuit and the same process would work, right? The same process would work. Um, in that case, there would be parties would have to sue the state who, uh, you know, uh, arguing that that law was unconstitutional. It would wind its way up. And if it got to the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court decided to take it, a whole decision making process begins. You hear arguments from litigants on both sides, they write briefs. You talk to clerks as a judge, you talk to your colleagues. Then you write an opinion. Opinions circulate, and you get feedback from your colleagues. So it's, a, it's an entire process. It's not something that a judge or justice would wake up and say, oh, we're hearing this case. I know what my vote's going to be. Well, let's talk about uh, <clears throat> the two Supreme Court cases regarding abortion. What are the two leading cases in America regarding a, uh, abortion? Well, I think most people think of Roe versus Wade, and Casey uh, is the case after Roe that preserved Roe's central holding but grounded it in a slightly different rationale. So what is that rationale? Rationale is that the state <coughs> cannot uh, 
impose an undue burden on a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. Okay, unlike Brown, there, there are states challenging on the abortion front. There are states uh, that are going to a fetal heartbeat bill. I have a bill, Judge, uh, that would uh, disallow abortion on demand at the 20 weeks, the fifth month of the pregnancy. We're one of seven nations in the entire world that allow abortion on demand in, at the fifth month. Uh, the construct of my bill is because a child is capable of feeling pain in the fifth month, uh, doctors tell us to save the child's life. You have to provide anesthesia if you operate because they can feel pain. The argument I'm making is if you have to provide anesthesia to save the child's life because they can feel pain, it must be a terrible death to be dismembered by an abortion. That's a theory to protect the unborn at the fifth month. If that litigation comes before you, will you listen to both sides? Of course. I'll do that in every case. So I think 14 states have already passed a version of what I've just described. So there really is a debate in, in America still, unlike Brown versus Board of Education, about the rights of the unborn. That's just one example. Uh, so if there's a challenge coming from a state, if a state passes a law and uh, it goes into court where people say this violates Casey. How do you decide that? Well, it would begin in a district court, in a trial court. You know, the trial court would make a record. You know, the parties would litigate and fully develop that record in the trial court. Then it would go up to a court of appeals that would review that record looking for error. And then, again, it would be the same process. Someone would have to seek certiorari at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would have to grant it. And then at that point, it would be the full judicial process. It would be briefs, oral argument, conversations with law clerks in chambers, consultation with colleagues, writing an opinion, um, really digging down into it. It's not, it's not just a vote. You all do that. You all have a policy and you cast a vote. The judicial process is different. OK. So uh, when it comes to <clears throat> your personal views about this topic, do you own a gun? Uh, we do own a gun. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, do you think you could fairly decide a case even though you own a gun? Yes. All right. You're Catholic. I am. I think we've established that. Uh, the tenets of your faith mean a lot to you personally. Is that correct? That is true. You've chosen to raise your fa uh, family in the Catholic faith. Is that correct? That's true. Can you set aside whatever Catholic beliefs you have regarding any issue before you? I can. I have done that in my time on the Seventh Circuit. If I stay on the Seventh Circuit, I'll continue to do that. If I'm confirmed to the Supreme Court, I will do that still. And I would dare say that there are personal views on the Supreme Court, uh, and nobody questions whether our liberal friends can set aside their beliefs. There's no re question, no reason to question yours, in my view. Uh, so the bottom line here is that there's a process. You fill in the blanks, whether it's about guns and Heller, abortion rights. Let's go to Citizens United. To my good friend, Senator Whitehouse, me and you are going to come closer and closer about regulating money, because I don't know what's going on out there, but I can tell you there's a lot of money being raised in this campaign. I'd like to know where the hell some of it's coming from. But that's not your problem. Citizens United says what? Um, Citizen United uh, extends the protection of the First Amendment to corporations who are engaged in political speech. So if Congress wanted to revisit that and, and somebody challenged it in, under Citizens United that Congress went too far, what would you do? How would the process work? Well, it would be the same process I've been describing. First, somebody would have to challenge that law in a case, somebody presumably who wanted to spend the money in a political campaign. It would wind its way up, and you know, judges would decide it after briefs and oral argument and consultation with colleagues and the process of opinion writing. Okay. Uh, Same-sex marriage. Uh, what's the case that established same-sex marriage as the law of the land? Obergefell. Okay. Uh, if there was a state who tried to outlaw same-sex marriage and there's litigation, would it follow the same process? Well, it would, and one thing I've neglected to say before that's occurring to me now is that not only would someone have to challenge um, that statute, and you know, somebody, so if they if they outlaw if they outlawed same-sex marriage, there'd have to be a case challenging it, and for the Supreme Court to take it up, 
you'd have to have lower courts going along and saying we're going to flout Obergefell. And the most likely result would be that lower courts who are bound by Obergefell would shut such a lawsuit down and it wouldn't make its way up to the Supreme Court. But if it did, it would be the same process I've described. Well, let's turn now to <clears throat> Senator Hawley's favorite topic, substantive due process as a legal theory. What am I talking about? Can you explain it for the country? Because if you can't, we're in trouble. I think I'll have a hard time doing it. So both the 14th and 5th Amendments protect life or provide that the state cannot take life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that sounds like a procedural um, guarantee, but in Supreme Court precedent, it has a substantive component. And so the Substantive Due Process Clause says that there are some liberties, some rights that people possess that the state can't take away or can't take away without a really good reason. So the right to use birth control, the right to an abortion are examples of rights protected by substantive due process. These are judicially created rights not found in the document called the Constitution. Is that correct? Well, the Supreme Court has grounded them in the Constitution. Although but they're they not written. They're not expressed. Okay. So is it fair to say there's a great debate in the law about how far this should go and what limits should apply, if any? Um, that's fair to say. There's also a lot of debate in Supreme Court opinions. I'm not aware of anybody proposing to throw it over entirely, but there's certainly a debate about how to define these rights and how far it should go. Well, let's just say that you're in the camp or anybody's in the camp that substantive due process as a legal concept is unbounded. It basically makes the Constitution no more certain than the five people interpreting it at any given time in the country. Whatever rights they think you have, you get. Whatever rights they want to take away from you, they can. It's a pretty nebulous legal concept. That's sort of my view of it. I'm not imposing my views on yours. But then there's a thing called precedent. Let's say you didn't like a case decided under substantive due process. You thought the whole concept was constitutionally uh, an era. How does precedent play? So precedent is the principle that cases that have been decided by the court before this one lands on the docket um, are presumptively controlling. And so, you know, precedent comes from a concept called stare decisis, which is a shorthand for a longer Latin phrase that means stand by the thing decided and do not disturb the calm. So precedent um, is a principle that you're not going to overrule something without good reason or roil up the law without justification for doing so. So you could say I, uh, the underlying analysis that led to any case, just case X, I reject that analysis, but I will now apply precedent to whether or not it should be reversed. Is that what you're telling us? That is, because okay. precedent is What are the absolute. factors would a judge look at in terms of overruling a precedent? Well, of course, the inquiry begins because there's been some argument that the precedent was wrong. But that's not enough to justify an overruling. You also consider... You could say structurally this case should... Uh, constitutionally, it was wrongly decided, but that doesn't end the debate. Is that correct? No, that's right. You have to look at reliance interests. You have to look whether the law or the facts... Well, stop right quick. Reliance interests by who? Uh, reliance interest by those who have relied on the precedent. So the people you, of the United States. People of the United States who've ordered their affairs around it. So the Heller case, people have relied upon the Second Amendment being an individual right. Is that correct? Um, precedent, yeah, presumably so. People yeah. have. Well, an abortion would be the, the right to have abortion. That'd be a, a reliance factor, right? Uh, the court in Casey spent a lot of time describing the reliance of people okay. on the, the right to an abortion. So what I want the, the public to know is that if you overrule a precedent of the court, even if you think it was wrongly decided, there's a list of things you have to look at before you actually uh, overrule uh, uh, the case. Is that a fair way of saying it? It's a fair way of saying it. Would you apply those factors if you ever found yourself in a position where you wanted to consider overruling a precedent? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, have precedents of the court been overruled before? Yes. Can you give me an example? Brown versus the Board of Education overruled Plessy versus Ferguson to get rid of the separate but equal doctrine. Okay. So recusal. Uh, my colleagues are asking you to recuse yourself uh, from litigation around the Affordable Care Act. Uh, what's the precedent regarding the Affordable Care Act, if any? The, the precedent that might, well, 
Is there precedent on this issue? There's not precedent on the issue that's coming up before the court. It it's turns on a doctrine called severability, which was not an issue in either the two big Affordable Care Act cases. Okay, so the, the issue uh, that was before the court was NFIB versus Sibilis, is that correct? Uh, that was the first about the constitutionality of the mandate. Okay, and I think Congress has zeroed out what the court called a tax, and the real issue now is does it stand and can it be severable? Right, so the issue now is now that Congress has zeroed it out, is it, can it be called a tax or is it now a penalty? And then the second issue is if it is a penalty, can it be just cut out from the statute so that the rest of the statute, including protection for pre-existing <coughs> conditions, stands? Well, a lot smarter people than me suggest that severability would be a hard challenge for, for those who are opposing the law, but time will tell. Do you feel like you should recuse yourself from that case because you're being nominated by President Trump? Well, Senator, recusal itself is a legal issue. You know, it, there's a statute, 28 U.S.C. 455, that governs when judges and justices have to recuse. There's precedent under that rule. Um, Justice Ginsburg, in explaining the way recusal works, said that it's always up to the individual justice, but it always involves consultation with the colleagues, with the other eight justices. So that's not a question that I could answer in the abstract. So if you're appointed by Obama, that's no reason to recuse yourself in a case involving Obama policy, is that correct? Well, that would be a decision for each justice right. to make. But if a justice had a, justice had a conflict with a particular policy issue, they helped draft it, that would be a consideration, is that correct? That would be a consideration. Okay. So when it comes to recusing yourself, you'll do what the Supreme Court requires of every justice? I will. Uh, thank you very much. Um, how does it feel to be nominated for the Supreme Court of the United States? Um, well, Senator, I've tried to be on a media blackout for the sake of my mental health, but you know you can't keep yourself walled off from everything, and I'm aware of a lot of the caricatures that are floating around. So I think what I would like to say in response to that question is that um, Look, I've made distinct choices. I've decided to pursue a career and have a large family. I have a multiracial family. Our faith is important to us. Um, all of those things are true, but they are my choices. And in my personal interactions with people, I mean, I have a life brimming with people who've made different choices, and I've never tried in my personal life to impose my choices on them. And the same is true professionally. I mean, I apply the law, and, and Senator, I think um, I should say why I'm sitting in this seat in response to that question, too. Why I've agreed to be here, because I don't think it's any secret to any of you or to the American people that this is a really difficult, some might say excruciating, process. Um, and Jesse and I had a very brief amount of time to make a decision with momentous consequences for our family. We knew that our lives would be combed over for any negative detail. We knew that our faith would be caricatured. We knew our family would be attacked. And so we had to decide whether those difficulties would be worth it, because what sane person would go through that if there wasn't a benefit on the other side? And the benefit, I think, is that I'm committed to the rule of law and the role of the Supreme Court in dispensing equal justice for all. And I'm not the only person who could do this job, but I was asked, and it would be difficult for anyone. So why should I say someone else should do the difficulty if the difficulty is the only reason to say no, I should serve my country? And my family's all in on that because they share my belief in the rule of law. Well, thank you. I think a lot of people would say you've got to be <clears throat> sort of insane to run for the Senate in this world. But good news for you, we all, we've all chosen kind of crazy stuff to do. Uh, I'll just end with this. I'm glad you said yes. I'm glad President Trump chose you. Uh, and really, before the people of the United States is a very basic question. Is it okay to be religiously conservative? Is it okay to be pro-life in your personal life? It clearly is okay to be progressive and be pro-choice and seek the, uh, a seat on the Supreme Court. I think resoundingly yes. And here's why your nomination is so important to me. In my world, to be a young conservative woman is not an easy path to take. We have two women on this committee. They can talk about it better than I. So I want to thank uh, President Trump for choosing you, and I will do everything I can to make sure that you have a seat at the table. 
and that table is the Supreme Court. And if anybody in the country, in my view, deserves to have a seat at the table based on the way they've lived their life and their capabilities in the law, it is you, Judge. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Chairman Feinstein. Mr. Chairman, um, Judge, it's wonderful to see you here. Also with the family that I have been observing, <laughs> they st sit still, quiet. You've done a very good job. I have eyes in the back of my head, so they uh, know I'm watching. I was wondering if you might introduce us to them. Sure. So I have my husband, Jesse, my son, JP, my daughter, Emma, my daughter, Juliet, my daughter, Tess, my daughter, Vivian, and my son, Liam. And then behind them are my um, six siblings who are with me today. I'll start the, uh, the side right behind Vivian. It's my sister, Vivian, my sister, Eileen, my brother, Michael, my sister, Megan, and my sister, Amanda. And is Carrie in the room? And my sister, Carrie, is sitting right over there. Uh, you don't have a magic formula for how you do it and handle all the children and your job and your work and your thought process, which is obviously excellent, do you? It's improv. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, let me begin with um, a question that the chairman touched on. And it's of, a great, it's of great importance, I think, because it goes to a woman's fundamental right to make the most personal decisions about their own body. And as a college student in the 1950s, I saw what happened to young women who became pregnant at a time when abortion was not legal in this country. I went to Stanford. Um, I saw the trips to Mexico. Uh, I saw young women uh, try to hurt themselves. And it was really deeply, deeply concerning. During her confirmation hearing before this committee in 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked several questions about her views on whether the Constitution protects a woman's right to abortion. She unequivocally confirmed her view that the Constitution protects a woman's right to abortion. And she explained it like this, and I quote, the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It's a decision she must make for herself. When government controls that decision for her, she is being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choice." End quote. At one point, our former colleague, Orrin Hatch, then the ranking member of this committee, commended her for her being, quote, very forthright in talking about that, end quote. So I hope, and you have been thus far, uh, be equally forthright with your answers. In Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, Justice Scalia, as was said uh, earlier, joined the dissent, which took the position, and I quote, we believe that Roe was wrongly decided and that it can and should be overruled, consistent with our traditional approach to stare decisis in constitutional cases. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? So, Senator, I do want to be forthright and answer every question so far as I can. I think on that question, I, you know, I'm going to invoke Justice Kagan's description, which I think is um, perfectly put. When she was in her confirmation hearing, she said that she was not going to grade precedent or give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And I think in an area where precedent continues to be pressed and litigated, as is true of Casey, it would be particularly, um, it would actually be wrong and a violation of the canons for me to do that as a sitting judge. Um, so if, if I express a view on a precedent one way or another, whether I say I love it or I hate it, it signals to litigants that I might tilt one way or another in a pending case. So on something that is really a major cause with major effect on over half of the population of this country who are women, after all. It's, it's distressing not to get a straight answer. So let me try 
again. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? <clears throat> Senator, I completely understand why you are asking the question, but again, I can't pre-commit or say, yes, I'm going in with some agenda, because I'm not. I don't have any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. Um, I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come. Well, what I'm, as a person, uh, I don't know if you'll answer this one either. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe can and should be overturned by the Supreme Court? Well, I think my answer is the same because, you know, that's a case that's litigated. It could, you know, its contours could come up again. In fact, do come up. You know, they, they came up last term before the court. So I think, you know, what the Casey standard is and um, that's just it's a contentious issue, which is, I know, one reason why it would be comforting to you to have an answer. But I can't express views on cases or pre-commit um, to approaching a case any particular way. Well, that makes it difficult for me, and I think for other women also on this committee, because this is a very important case, and it affects a lot of people, millions and millions of women, and you could be a very important vote. And I had hoped you would say, as a person, uh, you've got a lovely family. You understand all the implications of family life. Um, you should be very proud of that. I'm proud of you for that. Um, but my position is a little different. You're going on the biggest court of this land with a problem out there that all women see one way or another in their life. And <clears throat> not all, but yeah, certainly married women do, and others too. And so the question comes, um, what happens? And will this justice uh, support a law that has substantial precedent now? Would you commit yourself on whether you would or would not? Senator, what I will commit is that I will obey all the rules of stare decisis, that if a question comes up before me about whether Casey or any other case should be overruled, that I will follow the law of stare decisis, applying it as the court has articulated it, applying all the factors, reliance, workability, um, being undermined by later facts and law, just all the standard factors. And I promise to do that for any issue that comes up, abortion or anything else. I'll follow the law. Well, I, I think that's expected. And um, uh, well, I, I guess I've gone as far as I can. Let me go to another issue. This country is facing great gun violence. Uh, there's been a surge in gun sales during the COVID-19 crisis, which has led to more lives being needlessly lost. According to the Gun Violence Archive, Archive excuse me, an independent research organization, there were 60 mass shootings in May alone. These shootings killed 40 people. They hurt 250 more. Also, there's been a troubling spike in gun sales. Americans bought approximately 2 million guns this past March. It's the second highest month ever for gun sales. That figure does not take into account all the gun sales that could not be completed because the purchaser failed a background test, a check, excuse me, a number that has also skyrocketed. For example, this past March, the FBI's background check system blocked 23,692 sales, more than double the 9,500 sales blocked in March of 2019. Do you agree that federal, state, and local governments have a compelling interest in preventing a rise in gun violence, particularly during a pandemic? Well, Senator, um, of course, the constitutionality of any particular measure that were passed, that was passed by state or local governments or by this body would be subject to the same judicial process that I described with Senator Graham. 
What I will say, as because this is just descriptive of Heller, Heller leaves room for gun regulations. And that's why there has been a lot of litigation in the lower courts, which makes me constrained not to comment on the limits of it. But Heller does not make a right absolute um, by its, you know, says so in the opinion. Well, let me ask one more question. In a recent dissenting opinion that you wrote, you said there was, quote, no question, end quote, that, quote, keeping guns out of the hands of those who are likely to misuse them, quote, is, quote, a very strong governmental interest. Do you stand by that statement? So I don't, let's see. I can't remember precisely the words of Cantor, which is the case in which I dissented, which That's I think That's correct, Cantor v. Barr. Cantor v. Barr. Um, what I said in that opinion, I stand by, which is that the original meaning of the Second Amendment, and I went through a lot of detailed history in that case, does support the idea that governments are free to keep guns out of the hands of the dangerous. So for example, the mentally ill, others who would be likely to misuse guns. So where, where does that leave you on Roe? Um, the chairman asked, I thought, a very good question. Uh, for many people, and particularly for women, this is a fundamental question. We all have our moral values. We have our religions. We live by that. I respect you and your family for doing just that. Um, but this is a very real problem out there. And um, if you could be more specific in any way with respect how you would view your place on the court with respect to controlling weapons in this country? Um, I think what I can say is that my opinion in Cantor shows how I approach questions as a matter of judicial philosophy. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in that opinion looking at the history of the Second Amendment and looking at the Supreme Court's cases. And so the way in which I would approach um, the review of gun regulation is in that same way, to look very carefully at the text, to look carefully at what the original meaning was. That, that was the method that both the majority and dissent in Heller took. So I promised that I would come to that with an open mind, um, applying the law as I could best determine it. OK, let me move on. Um, one of my constituents, Christina Garcia, was able to obtain insurance coverage and have surgery that saved her eyesight only before the Affordable Care Act. Her experience is not unique. Senator Tammy ba uh, Baldwin has a constituent, Jimmy Anderson, in her home state of Wisconsin, and she asks that this story be shared. Jimmy is a 34-year-old and member of the Wisconsin State Legislature. In 2010, a drunk driver hit the family's car as they were returning home from celebrating Jimmy's 24th birthday. Jimmy's mother, father, and little brother were killed in the accident. Mm. Jimmy was paralyzed from the waist down. His medical recovery was intense. As Jimmy has said, quote, doctors managed to patch me up with dozens of stitches and multiple surgeries and about a pound of steel on my spine, end quote. But soon after, his insurance company told him he was nearing his lifetime maximums and he would have to pay for the rest of his health care expenses. As Jimmy explains, quote, with hundreds of thousands of dollars still left to go, I don't know what I was going to do. I was scared. I was terrified. I was just a student. I didn't have that kind of money. Fortunately, a few days later, the insurance company sent him another letter this one informed him that the provisions of the ACA had kicked in, which meant there were no longer lifetime maximums and his care would be covered. In Jimmy's own words, I was able to put my life back together and I credit the Affordable Care Act for that. Judge Barrett, how should the loss of ACA's protection against lifetime coverage caps caps that can be used to end coverage for life-saving care factor into a court's consideration of the validity of the ACA. 
Senator, so far as I know, the case next week doesn't present that issue. It's not a challenge to pre-existing existing, pre -existing conditions coverage or to the lifetime maximum you know, relief from a cap. Well, what, what is your view? Of how it should factor in? The, I, let's see, I think that any issue that would arise under the Affordable Care Act or any other statute should be determined by the law, by looking at the text of the statute, by looking at precedent um, the same way that it would for anyone. And if there were policy differences or policy consequences, those are for this body. Um, for the court, it's really a question of adhering to the law and going where the law leads and leaving the policy decisions up to you. For me, my vote depends a lot on these responses because these are life or death questions for people. It's my understanding that you were critical of Justice Roberts for upholding the ACA, stating that he, quote, pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute, end quote. And in what way did Justice did the Chief Justice go beyond the ACA's plausible meaning? Um, so I've written about this, and that description is consistent with the way the Chief Justice described in his own majority. Um, that was King versus Burwell, where the court had to decide whether the phrase established by a state also included exchanges that were established by the federal government. And the majority in that case acknowledged that treating the phrase established by a state as including exchanges established by the federal government was not the most natural reading, but for other reasons, other policy reasons and canons of interpretation, they chose to adopt the less natural reading. You see, for me, um, the case coming up, California v. Texas, puts a whole new weight on your nomination. Um, because the Affordable Care Act is now being so well accepted. I represent the largest state, as does Senator Harris, um, that we have. And there are just m m over 10 million people dependent on the activities under this act and that they be sustained. And so there is really great concern about what your view is. Uh, that case is coming up. Um, can you give us at least your view? Well, Senator, the issue in the case that's coming up doesn't involve, it's not the same issue as the ones in NFIB versus Sebelius or King versus Burwell. It's a different issue. Well, so, then give us both. Well, Let's see. So what I said, what you quoted to me, was that I thought that the interpretation of the phrase established by a state was stretched when the court held that it was established by the federal government. That's not the issue in California versus Texas. The issue in California versus Texas is if whether now that Congress has just completely, you know, zeroed out the uh, mandate, whether it's still a tax or a penalty, and even if so, is it constitutional? And then even so, is that fatal to the statute? There's a doctrine called severability, which sounds like legalese, but what it means is, is it okay with the statute? Could you just pluck that part out and let the rest of the statute stand? Or is that provision, which has been zeroed out, so critical to the statute that the whole statute falls? So really, the issue in the case is this doctrine of severability, and that's not something that I've ever talked about with respect to the Affordable Care Act. Honestly, I haven't written anything about severability that I know of um, at all. So you have no thoughts on the subject? Well, it's a case that's on the court's docket, and the canons of judicial conduct you know, would prohibit me from expressing a view. OK, I'll move on. Um, on July 30th, 2020, President Trump made claims of voter fraud and suggested he wanted to delay the upcoming election. Does the Constitution give the President of the United States the authority 
to unilaterally delay a general election under any circumstances? Does federal law? Well, Senator, if that question ever came before me, I would need to hear arguments from the litigants and read briefs and consult with my law clerks and talk to my colleagues and go through the opinion writing process. So, you know, if, if I give off the cuff answers, then I would be basically a legal pundit. And I don't think we want judges to be legal pundits. I think we want judges to approach cases thoughtfully and with an open mind. Okay, let me try something else. In 2017, in a case called EEOC v. AutoZone, the Seventh Circuit, your circuit, issued an opinion which permitted an employer to intentionally assign its employees to specific stores due to their race. The dissent in this opinion argued the decision permitted employers to legally establish separate but equal facilities and argued, um, if upheld, this decision would be, quote, contrary to the position that the Supreme Court has taken in analogous equal protection cases as far back as Brown v. the Board of Education. The case was appealed to the full panel of the seventh, and you sided, as I understand it, with the majority to deny a rehearing and let the opinion stand. Is that correct? Um, that is correct, and I think I need to give a little context for what it means to vote to deny, uh, to rehear something on bunk. Um, our court, just like the Supreme Court and the certiorari process, doesn't take cases just because we think the panel got it wrong. There's a lot of deference to panels, and Rule 35 of the you know, Rules of Appellate Procedure constrains and limits the times in which we take the resources of the full court to rehear a case. So I was not on that panel, and I did not express a view on the merits. A vote to deny to hear something en banc is like a vote not to, to deny certiorari, not a vote that expresses a view on the merits. Okay. It was a statutory case. It was not an equal protection case. Let me ask you a question um, as a person. Yes. If an employer can transfer an employee based solely on his or her race, and that does not constitute a materially adverse employment action because it was purely lateral job transfer, please explain what factors must be present for a policy based on race to violate Brown v. the board's prohibition of separate but equal? Um, well, Senator, to my knowledge, Brown wasn't at issue in the majority opinion. It turned on statutory language in Title VII. Um, but again, I didn't express a view on the merits, and so I can't comment on whether I think that the panel majority got that right or got that wrong. You know, that's an issue that may well come before me, even in the Seventh Circuit. Some may press for its overruling, and I may be on a panel that has to decide whether that precedent was wrong. Well, let me ask you, as a person, do you have a general belief? As a person, I have a general belief that racism is abhorrent. That racism is what? Abhorrent. Well, I think that's, that's I think we would all agree with that. Um, so how should a lower court in the seventh determine when race-based policies could constitute a materially adverse employment action? Well, I'm not aware of cases presenting the exact same facts. Is that Just awesome? asking you for your view. Um, you know, I know that the material adverse consequence was the standard at issue in that case. I have to confess that I would need to look at the statute and the precedent to, um, well, even if I had a specific hypothetical in front of me, I couldn't really say without looking at the statute and the precedent what factors are involved, because um, I wasn't on that panel and haven't decided a similar case. Okay, let me go to another issue. Um, the issue of LGBT equality is very personal for me. I spent two decades um, as a county supervisor and mayor of a city. I watched firsthand as the LGBT community fought for legal recognition of their lives, 
their relationships, their personal dignity. I, I was there before the law, so I saw in San Francisco what was happening. I want to speak briefly about one couple, Del Martin and Phy Phyllis Lyon, who I met in the 1970s. They were vibrant members of San Francisco's community. I was president of the Board of Supervisors. They worked with me to pass a citywide ordinance in 1978 that provided critical protection against discrimination in employment, housing, <clears throat> and public accommodations. At that time, this was one of the strongest protections for the gay community in the entire nation. We've come a long way since then, and I think we should never go back. In June of 2008, 58 years after they met, my two friends were finally able to marry when the California Supreme Court ruled that same-sex couples cannot be denied the fundamental right to marry. Dell died two months later. Before, because of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, Phyllis was denied Social Security survivor benefits, even though her spouse had paid into this basic safety net for her entire working life. Phil had to re re rely on the help of friends and fellow activists. In 2013, as you probably know, because you know so much about this, U.S. v. Windsor, the Supreme Court struck DOMA down. Two years later, in Obergefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court recognized that the fundamental right to marry could not be denied to LGBT Americans. Both decisions were decided by a five to four margin. Justice Ginsburg was in the majority. Justice Scalia dissented in both cases. Now, you said in your acceptance speech for this nomination that Justice Scalia's philosophy is your philosophy. Do you agree with this particular point of Justice Scalia's view that the U.S. Constitution does not afford gay people the fundamental right to marry. Um, Senator Feinstein, as I said to Senator Graham at the outset, if I were confirmed, you would be getting Justice Barrett, not Justice Scalia. So I don't think that anybody should assume that just because Justice Scalia decided a decision a certain way that I would too. But I'm not going to express a view on whether I agree or disagree with Justice Scalia for the same reasons that I've been giving. You know, Justice Ginsburg, um, with her characteristic pithiness, used this way, this to describe um, how a nominee should comport herself at a hearing. No hints, no previews, no forecasts. Um, that had been the practice of nominees before her, but everybody calls it the Ginsburg rule because she stated it so concisely, and it's been the practice of every nominee since. So I can't, um, and I'm sorry to not be able to, to embrace or disavow Justice Scalia's position, but I really can't do that on any point of law. Well, that's really too bad because it's rather a fundamental point for large numbers of people, I think, in this country. I understand you don't want to answer these questions directly, but the great, you identify yourself with the justice uh, that you, like him, would be a consistent vote to roll back hard-fought freedoms and protections for the LGBT community. And what I was hoping you would say is that this would be a point of difference where those freedoms would be respected. And you haven't said that. Senator, I have no agenda, and I do want to be clear that I have never discriminated on the basis of sexual preference and would not ever discriminate on the basis of sexual preference. You know, like racism, I think discrimination is abhorrent. Um, on the questions of law, however, I just, because I'm a sitting judge and because you can't answer questions without going through the judicial process, can't give answers to those very specific questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Grassley. Yeah. Judge, uh, welcome you again. And uh, you can rest for a minute because I've got some things to say uh, to uh, my colleagues, but more importantly, so people around the country understand what's going on here. First of all, for your family and friends, I'm sure they're very proud and they ought to be. Uh, 
I think everybody recognizes your sharp intellect, a deep understanding of, and even great reverence for the Constitution. <clears throat> your legal experience and public service are impressive. Your dedication to mentoring young students and women in the legal profession ought to be admired by everybody. In all respects, you're exceptionally qualified to be a justice. Many groups and individuals have written in strong support, so uh, I guess now that the chairman's gone, I'm going to ask, uh, as, as the next one ranking, I got some letters from uh, 21 state lieutenant governors and uh, from 20 secretaries of state that I want to put in the record at this point. Before I question, I have a few points to make. Yesterday, my Democrat colleagues spoke about their concern that you, Judge, wouldn't uphold certain laws, including the Affordable Care Act, and that you would strip Americans of their uh, health care rights and those protections that come with it. Uh, these uh, opponents said that Republicans just want to confirm you so that you, quote, will carry their policies forward, meaning Republican policies forward on the Supreme Court. But this only shows Democrats fundamentally misunderstand what judges are supposed to do. A judge is supposed to interpret laws in an impartial manner, consistent with the Constitution. Republicans aren't interested in seeing judges, quote, unquote, carry their policies forward. Republicans want judges to interpret the law and the Constitution, not make law. We want judges that won't impose their policies and personal preferences in their decision making. Plain and simple, policy making is not the proper role of the judicial branch. That role is reserved for legislative and executive branches. As the judge said, the political branches elected by and accountable to the people because you've got a lifetime appointment. And if you do lawmaking, we can't vote you out of office. Lawmaking's our job. If people don't like what we do, they can vote us out of office. Some other points on the Affordable Care Act. The Democrats continue to misrepresent or claim to know Barrett's view on affordable care and access to health care. In fact, they made it their entire game plan yesterday, and I suppose today we'll see it again. But we should dispense with the total fiction the Democrats are peddling. Apparently, her technical concerns with Chief Judge Chief Justice Roberts' legal reasoning in the Obama decision disqualifies her. Democrats are painting the judge as heartless and on a mission to scrap the health care law. Frankly, that's absurd. Not only is Judge Barrett a mother of seven, she has children with pre-existing medical challenges of her own. No one on this committee or anyone has any right to suggest that she doesn't care about access to health care or protection for the vulnerable. Now, getting back to the technical concerns about Robert's uh, Affordable Care Act opinion, first, and I got four points along this line, her comments dealt with Robert's statutory interpretation of just one provision of the law. That provision is no longer even in effect. In 2017, Congress zeroed out the so-called tax, the tax con connected with the individual mandate. The question before the court this fall are entirely separate. She never ruled on the Affordable Care Act, nor commented on how she'd vote, meaning the judge, how she would vote. So it's pointless to speculate, but we're going to get a lot of speculation during this election season, just two and a half weeks before the election. Now, second point, lawyers and legal academics often consider a court reasoning 
even when they have no disagreement with the outcome of the case. For instance, the New York Times recently reported Ginsburg, before joining the Supreme Court, quote, wasn't really fond of Roe v. Wade. She didn't like how it was structured, end of quote. I don't blame or don't know why Democrats have a different standard for you, Judge Barrett. Now a third point. It's blatantly inconsistent for the left to use this line of attack. We all know that President Obama said that the ACA le legislative mandate was not a tax. Even liberal Jeffrey Tubin said Robert's argument was, quote, not a persuasive one, end of quote. So Judge Barrett's analysis of Robert's legal reasoning is well inside the mainstream. Now a fourth point, more inconsistency. The same Democrats vilify Judge Barrett as a threat to those with pre-existing conditions. Well, it seems that those same people just filibustered the COVID relief bill that would have protected pre-existing conditions. They're the ones that blocked the COVID relief legislation. Republicans stood ready to move forward with that bill and remain ready. Seems to me it's the other side who really playing politics with health care during a pandemic. The truth is, Judge Barrett already said, quote, a judge must apply the law as written, end of quote. She further commented, quote, to decide cases according to the rule of law, beginning to end, end of quote. That's what we should all look for judges to do. Now, for my first question. When Justice Scalia came to my office before his confirmation, and I think I brought this up with every nominee to the Supreme Court by Republican or Democrat nominees, I don't think I brought it up in my private conversation with you, but I always bring up, what's your attitude about legislative history? Um, no, uh, let me ask oh, my sorry. question for I'm sorry. Uh, I thought well, that was it. <laughs> I think you probably know, uh, Judge, how important it is. Uh, I want to know how important legislative history is to you. When is it appropriate to look to legislative history to interpret the statute? And are there some circumstances when more appropriate than other? And I'd like to also give a, your uh, view on uh, legislative history compared to what I heard from Scalia 35 years ago. Sure. So I'm very comfortable talking about the use of legislative history because that's a matter of interpretive philosophy. Um, what governs, of course, is the text of the statute. So, you know, the legislative history can never supersede um, the text and it should never substitute for the text of the statute. Justice Scalia, as was well known, you know, railed against the use of legislative history. And I think it was because at the time that Justice Scalia went on to the DC Circuit before he was on the Supreme Court, the use of legislative history had really kind of gotten out of control. And many courts you know, were saying things, Justice Scalia in his book quotes this line from a brief, you know, the legislative history being unclear, we turn to that other reliable guide in statutory interpretation, the statute. And that has things backwards, and so I think Justice Scalia really tried to clean that up and say, listen, the priority is the text, and when the text answers the question, you don't go to legislative history, and there's some pragmatic reasons to be careful about doing so. You know, legislative history can be long. Um, there's a famous quotation from Judge Leventhal that legislative history is like going to a cocktail party and picking out your friends. It can be easy to manipulate because there might be something in there for everyone. So as a general rule, I don't look to legislative history when I'm deciding cases. I wouldn't say that it would never be relevant. Even Justice Scalia himself said that there could be instances, for example, if you were trying to determine whether a term used in a statute, how it was used, if it had a technical meaning or how it was understood, that that might be an appropriate time to consult legislative history. 
or Justice Scalia himself consulted it when he was trying to determine whether they had, there had been an error in the way the statute was drafted. He looked to legislative history to see whether what seemed unthinkable actually was unthinkable. Uh, now I'd like to go to a specific case. <clears throat> I'd like to go to United States versus Urarte, uh, which involved the interpretation of Section 403 of the First Step Act, which you know I had a big part along with Senator Lee and Senator Durbin in getting that passed in 2018. Uh, this is the most significant criminal justice legislation in generation. Our criminal justice system can't uh, just punish and deter. Uh, it must also rehabilitate and promote successful reentry into society. The First Step Act accomplished uh, these goals through prison and sentencing reform. It was well known that the goal of the First Step Act was to make smart and cost-effective changes to the criminal code and to reduce uh, risk of recidivism. So I want to ask you about your dissent in this case. Uh, the issue was whether the sentencing reform provision of the First Step Act applied to a defendant whose sentence had been vacated. Uh, here, the defendant had been convicted but not resentenced at the time of the First Step Act becoming law. The majority opinion cited the plain meaning of the First Step Act and congressional intent in finding that Section 403 would apply to a defendant with a vacated sentence. Your uh, dissent, as I understand it, uh, argued, among other things, that congressional intent shouldn't be heavily relied on since, quote, every statute requires a resolution of competing policy interests, end of quote. President Trump signed the First Step Act into law only two years ago, so wouldn't re-referencing congressional intent be accessible and relevant? And then another question, why did you find the majority relying on legislative history unpersuasive? So I th we did. The majority it was a very, very difficult case. Um, it was voted on en banc by our full court. And the quote from my dissent that you're pointing to was actually that we had a dispute about what the plain text of the statute required. And so that portion of my dissent that you just read was saying that I thought that the majority had permitted the policy goals of the act to supersede the text. And in dissent, I argued that the text drew the line after someone had been sentenced. So if someone had already been sentenced on the date of the First Step Act's passage, and the relevant language was, you know, if a sentence had already been imposed, I thought with my dissenting colleagues, and this was consistent with the approach the Third Circuit had already taken, that that meant if the person had already been through sentencing. You know, in this case involved a resentencing. And resentencing can happen years after, and so it it didn't seem to my dissenting colleagues and I that looking in the statute that the plain language of the text um, supported the majority's approach to it. Now, I think on my next question on the same case, you may have just uh, partially answered it, but let me uh, go ahead with my lead in and then also a question. Both the majority and your dissent in the case reviewed 403 of the act under a plain reading of the text. As an author and leader in this law's passage, I'd like to discuss how a plain reading of the statute could lead to varying outcomes. The, sec the section in question contemplates when a sentence has been imposed on a defendant. According to the text of the statute and relevant case law, a defendant's sentence, if vacated, creates a clean slate. That means defendant is placed in the same position as if he had never been sentenced. But your dissent comes to the opposite conclusion on whether a sentence has been imposed. Note that I agree with you that the laws need to be read and interpreted literally. So my question is this, how could we come to different conclusions? Well, that language, um, you know, that it, it only, that it did not apply to defendants on whom sentences had already been imposed my dissenting colleagues and I said, well, the language is sentences. It doesn't say 
you know, invalid sentences. And one could certainly say, if asked if someone had been sentenced, yes, he was sentenced, but that sentence was later vacated. And you're right that the majority relied heavily on this clean slate principle. But in my review of the law, this clean slate principle wasn't really present because, you know, the Sentencing Reform Act, for example, instructs district courts applying the guidelines at sentencing to apply those that were in effect on the date of the original sentencing. So I thought that the clean slate principle, they were pushing a little too hard on it. And then, you know, there's certainly unfairness. You know, the First Step Act, its, its policy is clearly to bring justice to sentencing. Um, but whenever you draw a line and who gets the benefit of a law, and this is especially acutely true in the sentencing, er in the sentencing area, it's very difficult. And you know, some people right on either side of the line will not get the benefit of the law wherever you draw it. So for example, in this case, Mr. Uriarte had a co-defendant named Sparkman. His case came up right behind uh, together. They had been tried together and initially sentenced together. But Uriarte's appeal took longer to resolve, or his resentencing took longer because of a lot of delays. So there was unfairness there, too, in the majority's approach, because Uriarte, despite the fact that he was more culpable than Sparkman, wound up with a, a sentence that was like 15 years less. Um, uh, I, 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 that's the end of my questioning on that. But let me make a comment before I go to my next question. Uh, my position has always been that legislative history can be instructive with respect to the intent of the statute, so judges should not completely disregard it. Certainly, I acknowledge that the legislative branch can be more careful about drafting laws, but I also think that judges should pay attention to congressional intent as set forth in history uh, when uh, there might be a dispute about how to interpret the statute. Uh, Justice Skinberg, at her hearing, Quote, and you've discussed this a little bit already, but I think it deserves emphasis because you're going to go through a lot of this business of maybe not being, and, and I know legitimately not being able to comment on a prospective case. So she said, quote, a judge sworn to decide impartiality can offer no forecast, no hints for what would show not only disregard for the specifics of this particular case, it would display disdain for the entire judicial process. <clears throat> uh, obviously, we all know, end of quote, we all know that that's the Ginsburg standard. The underlying reason for this rule is that making promises or giving hints on how a judge would rule in a case undermines the very independence of our system. But you're going to be asked about your personal views, as you just have been on various topics topics and how you might correctly decide. Of course, you know the judicial nominees should never promise their future votes in, uh, on the bench in exchange for the president's nomination or a senator's support. You'd be showing the opposite of independence. So my question. <clears throat> so I ask you, do you agree with the Ginsburg standard that it goes to the question of judicial branches' independence for legislative history, and all you got to do is say yes because I've heard you talk <laughs> about it. Yes, I agree. The Ginsburg Rule uh, reinforces judicial independence. Yeah. Now, here's something that a lot of pe people suspicion, so I want to ask you. Have you made any promises or guarantees to anyone about how you might rule on a case or issue uh, that might come before you if you're confirmed to the Supreme Court? I want to be very, very clear about this, Senator Grassley. The answer is no, and I submitted a questionnaire to this committee in which I said no. No one ever talked about any case with me. No one on the executive branch side of it. And that's one reason, you know, one reason you asked that question, I think, as a committee, is that you don't, you want to know that no nominee has made any pre-commitments. And so just as I didn't make any pre-commitments and was not asked to make any commitments on the executive branch side, I can't make any pre-commitments to this body either. It would be inconsistent with judicial independence. Now, I know the answer to my last question, and Mr. Chairman, I'm going to reserve the rest of my time. Uh, the Democrats claim that you're being put on the Supreme Court so you can vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Is that your agenda? If confirmed, is your goal repealing the Affordable Care Act? Have you 
committed to the President or anyone else that you will vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act if confirmed by, uh, to the court? Absolutely not. I was never asked, and if I had been, that would have been a short conversation. Uh, I think that your record shows that you'll be a faithful judge that takes each case seriously and approach each case in an unbiased way rather than with the policy agenda in mind. Is it uh, fair? Uh, we can reserve our time. Absolutely. Okay. Senator Leahy. Chairman, letters for the record. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will introduce uh, the okay. letters uh, by Senator Feinstein will be introduced into the record without an objection. Senator Leahy, are you with us? I, I think I am. Do you hear me there? Yes, sir. Uh, see if we can get you up on the screen here. There you go. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and, Judge, I was watching as you introduced your family. Thank you for doing that. Uh, it's obvious your family is very important to you, as they should be. I know my wife and I have been married for 58 years, and our children and our grandchildren are the most important things in our life. And I was pleased to see you and to introduce the family. Now, as a senator, of course, another important part of my life is referring to and representing uh, the people of Vermont. And let me, let me talk to you about some of the things I've been hearing from Vermonters. And you have to understand, in Vermont, uh, Vermonters just walk up to you at the grocery store or coming out of church or whatever, and perfectly happy to express their views. And they're concerned about what the Republicans' Affordable Care Act lawsuit on November 10th would mean for them. Now, do you know how many Americans have attained insurance through the Affordable Care Act? I do not. It's more than 20 million. And do you know how many children under the age of 26 are able to stay on their parents' insurance because of the Affordable Care Act? I do not. It's uh, 2.3 million. And do you know how many Americans are covered under the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion? I do not. I do not. It's uh, a little more than 15 million. And I, I look at that because I look at the people uh, called me from Vermont. I think of Alex Johnson. She's a single mother. She's a childhood cancer survivor. She works as a nanny in South Burlington, Vermont. She relies on Medicaid for her doctor's visits, her blood drawings, her other testing. All that done to make sure her leukemia stays in remission. She tells me she stays, she stays awake at night worrying about losing Medicaid. Now, if uh, the Republicans are successful in what they're trying to do on November 10th, then Alex and actually 60,600 other Vermonters enrolled in Medicaid expansion are going to be left behind. And con in a contract COVID-19, that's seen as a, a pre-existing condition. I do know how many, approximately how many million Americans have tested positive for the coronavirus and survived. I do not. That's more than 7 million, 700,000. Those are people now considered to have a existing condition. And one of the uh, uh, most common pre-existing conditions is diabetes. The CDC estimates that 34 million Americans, that's about 1 in 10 Americans, have diabetes. This shows that the ACA's Medicaid expansion is the single most important factor for expanding access to affordable insulin. The less than a Vermont, Vermonter diagnosed with late onset type 1 diabetes at the age of 25. For years, she has uh, depended on Medicaid to keep her alive and out of bankruptcy. Now, President Trump recently claimed that he's made insulin as cheap as water. I wish he had told the truth of that. We all know it's not. Leslie now has insurance to pay for insulin. And without this insurance, do you know how much 
because unlike what the president says, insulin is not as cheap as water. Do you have an idea how much less these out-of-pocket expenses for insulin would increase? No, I do not. Thank you. Um, and I wouldn't expect you to. There's no reason why you should, but Leslie's cost would more than triple. It would go up by $11,215 a year. That's in a state where the per capita income is $33,000. So I'm not suggesting that you're callous or indifferent to the consequences if the Affordable Care Act is overturned. Uh, you know that these are real cases, and I think you're a sympathetic person. But I do believe that the president selected you because he wanted somebody with your philosophy, and he had a reason for it. Now, some are going to pretend that it's a mystery, and that's what some of my colleagues have. But as Justice Barrett would do when the Supreme Court takes up the latest attack in the ACA, President Trump has made it crystal clear. He's promised that his nominees would overturn the ACA. It's even in the official Republican Party platform. And he said of the case to be argued next month, he said, we want to terminate health care under Obamacare, the ACA. And without, within hours of nominating you, he again repeated his hope to the ACA would be overturned. Um, I know I mentioned my friend, the chairman, Senator Graham, knows the president as well as anyone here. Uh, he goes golfing with him. He spends a lot of time with him. And I think uh, Chairman Graham knows that the president would not repeatedly promise the American people that his judges would overturn the ACA if he didn't mean it. And I think uh, Senator Graham would have to agree that um, the president's confident Judge Barrett would side with him on November 10. That's not necessarily a question of either one of you, but of course the chairman has an opportunity to respond at his time if he wants. But I think we know the president's confidence. There's not been an issue in the last decade that's animated Republicans in Congress more than their zeal to overturn the Affordable Care Act. In fact, I counted up the other day. I was surprised at the answers. Do uh, you know, Judge Barrett, that Republicans in Congress have voted to repeal or gut the ACA more than 70 times, seven old times, in the last 10 years? And when they failed, they turned to the court. Do you know how many Republicans on this committee have joined amicus briefs urging courts to overturn the ACA in NFIB versus Sebelius and King versus Burwell. How many Republicans had voted? Was that the question? No, no. Do, do you know how many Republicans in this committee have joined an amicus brief urging the courts to overturn I, the ACA? I don't. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing, Senator Leahy. Is there a way for the volume to be turned up? Yes, ma'am. Um, I am sorry for that. Um, it's, it's, it's on our end, Senator Lee. That's okay. You can repeat the question and... Well, uh, how is it coming through now? Very good. Very well. Thank you. Well, and as you know, I've, I've stayed away simply because I don't think it is safe for you or anybody else uh, to be there. But uh, my question is, do you know how many times Republicans on the committee you're sitting before have joined amicus briefs urging courts to overturn the Affordable Care Act? I do not know. It's at least nine, by my count. In fact, they've already weighed in on the November 10 case. Two weeks ago, the Senate voted on whether to side with, the pre with President Trump in Texas versus California. And 11 of the 12 senators 
on uh, this committee sided with the Trump administration and asked to kill the ACA. Now, I understand that you will not share your views on Texas versus California. I know you look at Judicial Canon 3A6 and you're concerned that commenting may give future litigants that appear before you an indication of which way you would rule. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Now, my, uh, my concern uh, uh, my, my, my concern uh, is that you've already given us every indication. Every time you weighed in, it hasn't even been close. You've repeatedly disagreed with Chief Justice Roberts. What you said, you clearly believe the statute is unconstitutional. The president has made very clear he expects to, you to side with him. And let me tell you another area where he expects you to side with him. He expects you to side with him in an election dispute. He says he needs a ninth justice because he has, he's counting on the court to look at the ballots. He says the election will be rigged. Um, the recusal statute, 28 U.S.C. 455, requires recusal where impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Now, when the president declares he needs his nominee to secure his re-election, and then the nominee is ran through the Senate in record time during the middle of an election, some are going to question that nominee's impartiality. Would you, uh, to protect confidence in both you and the court, would you commit to recuse yourself from any dispute that arises out of the 2020 presidential election? Senator Leahy, I want to begin by making two very important points, and they have to do with the ACA and with any election dispute that may or may not arise. I have had no conversation with the president or any of his staff on how I might rule in that case. It would be a gross violation of judicial independence for me to make any such commitment or for me to be asked about that case and how I would rule. Um, I also think it would be a complete violation of the independence of the judiciary for anyone to put a justice on the court as a means of obtaining a particular result. And that's why, as I was mentioning, I think, to Senator Grassley, that the questionnaire that I fill out for this committee makes clear that I have made no pre-commitments to anyone about how I would decide a case. That's out of respect for Article Three and its designation of the judiciary as a co-equal and independent branch of government. On the recusal well, I, question. Well, I, and, and I might say that uh, you gave a similar answer uh, when I talked with you and Mr. Cipollone. I, I had a question, of course, because one of the members of our uh, of the Judiciary Committee said that he would not support you unless he had a commitment uh, that you would vote that way. Uh, vote vote on, on the election? On, on, on another case, Roe versus Wade. Mm. And I understand what you're saying is notwithstanding what a member of this committee said, you have not made that commitment to anybody. Is that correct? Senator Leahy, let me be clear. I have made no commitment to anyone, not in this Senate, not over at the White House, about how I would decide any case. Well, that, and the reason I ask is we also have the question of appearance. Now, uh, Judge Joan Larson of the Sixth Circuit sat next to you during your 2017 hearing. She was confronted with this issue as a judge on the Michigan Supreme Court in 2016. Then President-elect Trump challenged a ballot recount. Judge Larson was on a short list for the Supreme Court at the time. She found that being on the short list was a conflict and it required her recusal. You were actually, you were also on the short list and then you were actually chosen. Now he's not the president-elect, he's the president. And then the president 
makes a similar thing as he did uh, in the Judge Larson looked at. He's counting on you to deliver him the election. Judge Larson said that was a conflict uh, for her and would have to recuse. You do not find his comments a conflict for you, is that correct? Um, Senator Leahy, I'm not familiar with Judge Larson's decision, but she clearly made it once it was presented to her in the context of an actual case where she had to weigh her obligations under 28 U.S.C. 455. If presented to me, I would, like Judge, like Judge Larson, apply that statute. And I recently read a description by Justice Ginsburg of the process that Supreme Court justices go through in deciding whether to recuse. And it involves not only reading the statute, looking at the precedent, consulting counsel if, po if, if necessary, but the crucial last step is that while it is always the decision of an individual justice, it always happens after consultation with the full court. So I can't offer an opinion on recusal without short-circuiting that entire process. Well, I think that what I worry about and I've said over and over again, that if the courts are politicized, from the Supreme Court down to other courts, and I've written cases in, in all of those of our, our federal courts, uh, I've always assumed that judges are totally impartial, no matter what uh, president had nominated them. But this president has not been subtle, and he expects his nominee to side with him in an election dispute. I'm thinking of the credibility of our federal courts, and I hope you would at least consider that. The president said he needs a ninth justice because he's counting on the court to look at the ballots in case he loses, because that would, if he lost, that meant the Democrats had rigged the election. The um, Recusal statute, as you know as well as anyone, in 28 U.S.C. 455 requires a justice recuse herself in any proceeding in which impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Now, whether you like it or not, and I suspect you probably do not, the president has placed both you and the Supreme Court in the worst of positions. And so let me ask you a, a different type of question. I assume you agree with me that it's critical for Americans to have confidence in the Supreme Court. Is that true? That is true. And I agree with your earlier statement that the courts should not be politicized. Thank you. And uh, I voted for an awful lot of Republican and, and uh, Democratic nominated justices, as I did, of course, for Chief Justice Roberts, uh, because I wanted to keep Supreme Court and other courts out of politics. But when the president repeatedly declares his, he needs his nominee as a way of securing his reelection, and that nominee is then ran through the Senate uh, in the uh, uh, in the middle of that election, what you can see with the nominees and partiality might be questioned. So um, my, my request is in, that, in protecting confidence in both you and the court, are you able to commit to recuse yourself from disputes that rise out of the 2020 presidential election? Senator Leahy, I commit to you to fully and faithfully applying the law of recusal, and part of that law is to consider um, any appearance questions, and I will apply the factors that other justices have before me in determining whether the circumstances require my recusal or not. But I can't offer a legal conclusion right now about the outcome of the decision I would reach. Which is sort of boilerplate uh, response on, on recusal. So let me ask you another question. You laid out the case for blocking President Obama's Supreme Court nominee, Judge Merrick Garland, for 10 months during election year. You have argued in part that Justice Scalia was the staunchest conservative on the court, and Justice Scalia and I were 
personal friends, I'd voted for him, and I agree with you on that. You claim that the moderate and eminently qualified Judge Garland would dramatically flip the balance of the court. You said it was not a lateral move. That's your, your quote. It was not a lateral move. So now you're, you're nominated to replace Justice Ginsburg, perhaps a staunchest champion for civil rights of the court. You claim that philosophy of Justice Scalia is your own. Of course, he was the opposite side of Justice Ginsburg in countless civil rights cases. Would you say that replacing Justice Ginsburg by yourself is not a lateral move like you would uh, urge when you supported the blocking of uh, President Obama's nominee, Judge Garland? Um, Senator Lee, I want to be very clear. I think that's not quite what I said um, in the interview. It was an interview that I gave shortly after Justice Scalia's death. And at that time, both sides of the aisle were arguing that precedent supported their decision. And I said, while I had not done the research myself, my understanding of, this, of the statistics was that there, neither side could claim precedent that this was a decision that was the political branches to make. And I didn't say which way they should go. I simply said it was the Senate's call. I didn't advocate yep. or publicly support the blockade of Justice uh, Judge Garland's nomination, as you're suggesting. You, uh, that's not what I'm suggesting. You said it was a lateral. Uh, it would not be a lateral move. Uh, I, what I was suggesting is that it was unsurprising that there was resistance as a political matter to that nomination because it would change the balance of the court. Um, well, I, that's kind I, of a, it's I just was a, surprised. I was surprised there was resistance insofar as there's so many, at that time, Republican members of the uh, Judiciary Committee who had stated publicly before the vacancy that they thought Merrick Garland would be a good person to have on the uh, court and somebody could appeal to both conservatives, liberals, and moderates. But I have uh, full I respect for Judge Garland. I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, I missed the I first see. part. Are they right to say? Could you repeat the question? No, it's not a question. I was just saying that uh, we had many members of our uh, committee, a number of Republicans who prior to the vacancy had been saying Merrick Garland would be a good person for President Obama to nominate because mm. he, he could appeal to moderates, conservatives, and liberals. And then, then of course, their response was, well, we can't have a, uh, we can't have a nominee confirmed uh, by one party that's in control of the Senate and nominated by a president of another party. As I point out, I was here when Democrats controlled the Senate and uh, President Reagan nominated Anthony Kennedy and in an election year, Democrats confirmed it. But, um, Let me go to another area. Three-judge panel of the uh, Seventh Circuit struck down three provisions of an Indiana law restricting reproductive rights. The state of Indiana requested en banc review of just one of the provisions, the fetal tissue disposition provision. Of course, wouldn't whether to review the case, leaving intact the panel decision striking down the law. You join Judge Easterbrook in his dissent. But then the dissent went out of its way to address a separate provision not before the court, the so-called reason ban. Your dissent called a eugenic statute. Um, Judge Barrett, the issue before your court was a narrow one. Why didn't uh, you limit your dissent to the one issue the state of Indiana was asking you to review? Um, so we dissenters from that denial of rehearing on Bonk 
first of all, dissented, as you say, on the fetal remains disposition portion, which the Supreme Court wound up summarily reversing the panel. On the um, eugenics portion of the bill, uh, it is true that the state of Indiana did not seek en banc rehearing on that, but we had many other states enter the case as amici, urging us to take that claim up. And what Judge Easterbrook's dissent did was explain why he actually thought it was an open question, but one best left to the Supreme Court. And we didn't reach any conclusion with respect to it. Well, and, and your whatever position you took would not have changed the uh, final decision of the, of the court. Um, now, in 2006, you, you signed an open letter that's published in the South Bend uh, Tribune. Uh, you, on one side, the advertisement describes the legacy of Roe versus Wade as barbaric. On the other side, what you signed, it stated that you oppose abortion demand, defend the right to life from fertilization to natural death. And I have certainly voted for some judges to take that position. But while not mentioned in the letter, the organization that led the effort believes that in vitro fertilization, IVF, is equivalent to manslaughter and should be prosecuted. Do you agree with them that uh, IVF is tantamount to manslaughter? Senator, the statement that I signed, as you said, simply said, we, I signed it on the way out of church. It was consistent with the views of my church, and it simply said, we support the right to life from conception to natural death. It took no position on IVF. No, I, I, I understand that. And I, as I said, I voted for judges who take the same position you do. But I'm asking, uh, do you agree with the St. Joseph County Right to Life that sponsored the uh, ad that um, uh, IVF is tantamount to manslaughter? Well, Senator, I signed the statement that you and I have just discussed. And you're right that the St. Joseph County Right to Life ran an ad on the next page, but I didn't, I don't even think the IVF view that you're expressing was on that page, but regardless, I've never expressed a view on it. And for the reasons that I've already stated, I can't take policy positions or express my personal views before the committee. Because okay. my personal views don't have anything to do with how I would decide cases, and I don't want anybody to be unclear about that. Let me talk about some of the positions you have taken. Before you became a judge, you were paid by the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, for five lectures. You gave them on originalism at the Blackstone Legal uh, Fellowship. Now, I recall some being asked about some of their uh, controversies. Um, were you aware? of ADF's decades-long efforts to recriminalize homosexuality? Um, I am not aware of those efforts, no. OK, one of the um, reading materials they had for the program that you uh, lectured to uh, five, several times, um, spoke of that. In fact, they had filed a a brief in Lawrence versus Texas uh, supporting, uh, in support of state laws punishing private homosexual activity. They celebrated when India restored a law punishing sodomy to 10 years in prison. Now, I don't, whether you believe that being gay is right or wrong is irrelevant to me, but my concern is what you you work with an organization working to criminalize people from uh, for loving a person that they are in love with. So that that's what uh, that's what worried me. Did did you? I wasn't sure if you wanted me to answer that. Um, you know, Mike. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Mike's, go ahead. 
My experience with the Blackstone program at which I spoke was a wonderful one. It gathers, you know, best and brightest Christian law students from around, law students from around the country. And as you said, I gave a one-hour lecture on originalism. I didn't read all of the material that the students were given to read. That had nothing to do with my lecture. I enjoyed teaching the students about what my specialty was, which is constitutional law, and nothing about any of my interactions with anyone involved in the Blackstone program were ever indicative of any kind of discrimination on the basis of anything. As you know, uh, same-sex marriage, for example, in uh, Senator Pines, I mentioned this at the beginning, is legal, certainly legal in my state, has been for some time. Uh, do you feel that should be a crime? Same-sex marriage? Yes. Obergefell clearly says that there is a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And do you agree with that, uh, stare decisis? Well, Senator, for the reasons that I've already said, I'm not going to, as Justice Kagan put it, give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to any particular precedent. It's precedent of the Supreme Court that gives same-sex couples the right to marry. Well, you mentioned Justice Kagan. She once wrote an opinion that it's not enough that five justices believe a precedent is wrong. Reversing course demands a special justification over and above the belief that the president was wrongly decided. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. The doctrine of stare decisis itself requires that. Thank you. Um, having relied on stare decisis in many of my arguments before courts of appeals, I thank you for your answer. Um, Chief Justice Roberts. Senator Leahy, uh, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I know you don't have a clock in front oh. of you, but we're about a little over a minute over. So if you I'm, I am sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I do not have a No, I understand. Me, I totally understand. I appreciate it, and uh, I will look forward to the next round of questioning. Thank you. We'll make Thank sure you. that happens. Uh, very briefly, uh, before I go to Senator Cornyn, uh, Senator Lee mentioned my uh, time with the President. I think probably all of us on this side were consulted by the President regarding how to fill the opening. Uh, he gave me a list of a small list of names, all women. You were on it. I was enthusiastic about everybody and very enthusiastic about your nomination by the president. Uh, play a lot of golf with the president, I guess. Uh, I've enjoyed it. <clears throat> we talk about a lot on the golf course, some policy. Killing Soleimani, we talked about that. That was an interesting discussion. I promise you I've never talked about severability with the president. <laughs> Senator Cornyn. Speak for yourself. <laughs> good, good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Senator Cornyn. You know, most of us have multiple notebooks and notes and books and things like that in front of us. Can you hold up what you've been referring to and answering our questions? Is there anything on it? Uh, that letterhead that says United States Senate. That's, imp that's impressive. Well, Judge, um, the best I can understand the objections to your nomination are not to your qualifications, your experience, or training, but it's that you have or you will violate your oath of office. I find that terribly insulting. They suggest that you can't be unbiased in deciding a case you haven't even participated in yet. I found that insulting as well. You know, almost as, maybe almost as pernicious as attacking somebody for their faith and suggesting that that disqualifies them from holding a public office is the attack that's being made on judicial independence, something that uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, among others, observed the crown jewels of the American Constitution and the American system. But I want to just take a little walk down memory lane here. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of people who guessed how judges would actually rule on cases 
and almost always they've been spectacularly wrong. I was struck by, uh, by just a couple. Uh, Harry Truman said, whenever you put a man, and that, he's talking about a man, but a man or woman on the Supreme Court, he ceases to be your friend. He said some more colorful things, too. But Theodore Roosevelt said about Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., he said, I could carve out, a out of a banana a judge with more backbone than that. And as I think about people like Harry Blackman, nominated by Richard Nixon, who wrote Roe versus Wade, as I think about Warren Burger, you know, they were called the Minnesota Twins, and obviously over time they became sort of polar opposites on the court. I think about the attacks on Neil Gorsuch for his unwillingness to make a, a prior commitment on LGBT issues. He wrote the Bostock case extending Title VII of the Civil Rights Act to gay or transgender individuals. Obviously, those predictions were wrong. And then, since we're talking about the ACA, it's the ACA versus ACB, I guess. Chief Justice Roberts was the one who wrote the opinion upholding the Affordable Care Act, as you know. So I would just say that all of these predictions about how judges under our independent judiciary will make decisions are just pure speculation. But I think they're worse than speculation. I think they're propaganda in order to try to make a political point. So, Judge, you're not willing to make a deal. No, Senator Cornyn, I'm not willing to make a deal, not with the committee, not with the president, not with anyone. I'm independent. I just uh, would like to hear maybe some of your thoughts on, in the Ober fell case, which established, as you said, a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Part of that decision struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. That was a bill that Joe Biden voted for? I don't know well, about that. I, I do. Okay. Joe, Joe Biden voted for it, Pat Leahy, and Bill Clinton signed it into law. Can you just I'm not asking you to get into the details, but just sort of differentiate for everybody listening what the approach of a legislator is in voting for a piece of legislation as opposed to the role of a judge in interpreting the constitutionality of a, of a, of a piece of legislation. Are they the same or are they different? They're quite different. Um, a judge isn't expressing a policy view. You know, I, I tell my students in constitutional law that newspapers do courts a disservice when you know they say things like you know court um, favors same-sex marriage or you know just giving the headline without showing any of the reasoning that goes into it because courts are not just expressing a policy preference they're digging in they're looking at the precedent they're looking at the constitution and even when the result cuts against policy preferences judges are obliged to follow them I suspect that this body doesn't cast votes that conflict with their policy preferences. Well, that's right. And the difference between us and you is uh, you don't run for election. That's right. You don't run on a platform. You don't say, if I'm confirmed, I'm going to do this or that. You don't do that, do you? It would be wholly, wildly inappropriate for me to do so. Well, your mentor, Justice Scalia said something back in 2005 that I, I find intriguing but reassuring. He said, if you're going to be a good and faithful judge, you have to resign yourself to the fact that you're not always going to like the conclusions you reach. If you like them all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. Do you agree with that? And if you do, would you explain what you mean? I do agree with that, and that you know, has been my experience on the Seventh Circuit so far. It's your job to pass the statutes. It's your job to choose policy. And then it's my job to uh, interpret those laws and apply them to facts of particular cases. 
and they don't always lead me to results that I would reach if I were, you know, queen of the world and I could say, you win, you lose, or this is how I want it to be because I just don't have the power by fiat to impose my policy preferences or choose the result I prefer. That's just not my role. I've got to go with what you guys have chosen. Well, why in the world would the American people surrender their right to govern themselves through their elected representatives and through the Constitution to nine people who don't even run for election and who serve for life? Why in the world would, should the American people do that? Well, I think part of the rationale for courts adhering to the rule of law and for judges taking great care to avoid imposing their policy preferences is that it's inconsistent with democracy. Nobody wants to live in accord with the law of Amy. I'm sure you, my children don't even want to do that. So I can't, as a judge, get up on the bench and say, you're going to live by my policy preferences because I have life tenure and you can't kick me out if you don't like them. Well, thankfully, uh, under the Constitution, even if the Supreme Court strikes down a statute, Congress can come back and revisit that topic and do so in a way that doesn't violate the Constitution as determined by the court. And ultimately, it doesn't happen very often in our history, but ultimately we can amend the Constitution itself, correct? That is correct. So the, the basis of legitimacy of governmental power is consent of the governed. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Not what nine people in black robes, the high nine on the Potomac, I think they're sometimes called, the decisions they make. Those are, that's not the final word in our form of government, correct? We are a, a, a law, um, a government of laws, not of men. Well, Judge Barrett, I'm almost through, but I, I can't pass up the opportunity to ask you a question about the Establishment Clause. Uh, I did with uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch as well. It's born out of my frustration. Uh, one of the couple of times I had a chance as Attorney General of Texas to argue before the Supreme Court, I argued in a case called Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe. This was about a commonplace practice where before football games in Texas, students would volunteer to offer a, a invocation or an inspirational a poem or saying or something like that. The ACLU uh, sued the school district, and obviously it made its way all the way all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm not going to ask you your opinion on the outcome of the case, but what troubles me the most, what troubled me the most about that experience is when the Supreme Court struck down uh, or held that practice unconstitutional and in violation of the Establishment Clause, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, the Constitution requires neutrality toward religion, but the court's approach sp speaks ho of hostility toward religion. Could you just talk a little bit about the Establishment Clause generally, with not in regard to any particular set of facts, but sort of what the, what the courts over time have tried to do to, to, uh, to enforce the mandate of the Constitution? Well, Senator Cornyn, when I interviewed for my job with Justice Scalia, he asked what area of the court's precedent that I thought you know, needed to be uh, better organized or that sort of thing. And off the cuff, I said, well, gosh, the First Amendment. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I fell down a rabbit hole of trying to explain without success, because it is a very complicated area of the law, um, how one might see one's way through the thicket of balancing the Establishment Clause against the Free Exercise Clause. It's a notoriously different, difficult area of the law. And to the extent that you know, there is tension in the court's cases, um, and I'm giving you no better an answer, I assure you, than I did to Justice Scalia that day, it's been something that the court has struggled with you know, for decades to try to come to a sensible way to apply both of those clauses. Well, I wish you well. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to reserve the rest of my time. Thank, Thank you, Senator Cornett. Uh, for planning purposes, if it's okay with the committee, uh, we'll have Senator Durbin and Senator Lee. We'll break uh, for about a half hour for lunch and come back with Senator Whitehouse. Is that okay? Senator Durbin.
Are you okay with that? Do you need a break? No, that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Judge Barrett, and your family for being here with us today uh, for this marathon of <laughs> questioning. Thank uh, you, Senator Durbin. Appreciate it. I would like to respond to two of my colleagues quickly before I ask a few questions of you. How, who came up with this notion, this insulting notion that you might violate your oath? Where could this idea have come from? Could it have come from the White House? Could it have come from the President's tweets of what he expects a Supreme Court nominee to do politically for him? That's where it comes from. That's where it originated. And you have said very clearly today, without equivocation, you are not going to be influenced by President Trump's importuning or the importuning of this committee or anyone else, which is what we expect you to say. But this notion that this whole idea of your being used for political purposes is a democratic creation. Read the tweets, and you have plenty to work with. Read the tweets. The second thing I would like to say is I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, defending uh, the Affordable Care Act, although I think it's the most important single vote I've cast as a member of Congress, period. But I will say that when the chairman opened up on it and said what he did, I was puzzled. Three states get 35 percent of the money? How can that possibly be true? Well, it turns out because those states decided to extend Medicaid coverage to the people who lived in the states, and his did not. And as a consequence, fewer people in South Carolina have the protection of health insurance, and those that do are paying for their services, and those that don't are not, which imperils hospitals and others in the process. So I would say there is an explanation as to why some states are spending more. And incidentally, there was a Republican governor of your state, Indiana, by the name of Mike Pence, who decided to break with other Republican governors and extend Medicaid coverage under the Affordable Care Act. I think it was the right thing to do for Indiana as it was for Illinois. But that's part of the reasoning. Let me just say that the Affordable Care Act really is at the heart of this, as you can tell on the Democratic side. We really believe the Supreme Court's consideration of that case is going to, could literally change America for millions of people. I have with me today another group I'd like you to at least be aware of because they're pretty amazing people. But um, this is the Williams family. They live in Naperville, not too far from Chicago. Yeah. Kathy and Les Williams have four sons from left to right. Matt, Joey, Tommy, and Mikey. Matt, who's 27, was diagnosed with type 1 di diabetes when he was 13. The other three Williams boys were all born with cystic fibrosis. Mm. Joey is 24, Mikey's 21. Sadly, Mikey's twin, Tommy, after this picture was taken, passed away in January 2019 from complications. This is the last photo that was ever taken of their full family. Here's what they wrote me. We cannot imagine having to go through losing another child. People with cystic fibrosis require daily medication, regular doctor visits, access to high-quality, specialized care. That means people with pre-existing conditions like cystic fibrosis cannot be discriminated against. The ACA's protections ensure a ban on annual and lifetime caps and enforce the requirement that insurers cover essential health benefits such as hospitalizations or mental health services. People with CF and other pre-existing conditions need adequate, affordable health care to live longer, healthier lives. That's why we keep bringing this up real people that we run into all the time. There's a chart here I'd like to share, too, while we're at it. On the Republican side, there's some obvious controversy as to whether we're right or wrong. But there are an awful lot of people in each of the states represented by our Republican senators who have their health care and literally, in some cases, their lives hanging in the balance. South Carolina, 242,000 people would lose their insurance coverage if the Affordable Care Act were eliminated. Two million living in that state have pre-existing conditions. You can imagine the list goes on. Thank you. Here's what it comes down to. You've been unequivocal in being critical of the decisions both in uh, NFIB Sibelius and in King Burwell. And we naturally draw the conclusion there's going to be a third strike uh, it, when it comes to Texas and California. You said it won't affect pre-existing conditions. If the petitioners have their way, there will not be an Affordable Care Act to protect pre-existing conditions on the severability question. So give us an insight. 
how you can be so unequivocal in opposing the majority decisions in NFIB Sibelius and in King and Burwell, but have an open mind when it comes to the future of the Affordable Care Act. Sure. Thank you for that question, Senator Durbin, because it gives me an opportunity to make my position clear. Um, when I wrote, and I add this was as a law professor, about those decisions, I did critique the statutory interpretation of the majority opinions. And as I mentioned before, my description of them was consistent with the way that Chief Justice Roberts described the statutory question. But I think that your concern is that because I critiqued the statutory reasoning that I'm hostile to the ACA, and that because I'm hostile to the ACA, that I would decide a case a particular way. And I assure you that I am not. I'm not hostile to the ACA. I'm not hostile to any statute that you pass. And the cases on which I commented, and we can talk at another time, I guess, about the context, the distinctions between academic writing and judicial decision making, but those were on entirely different issues. So to assume that because I critiqued the interpretation of the mandate or the phrase established by a state means that on the entirely different legal question of severability, I would reach a particular result just assumes that I'm hostile. And that's not the case. I apply the law, I follow the law, you make the policy. <clears throat> so let, let's talk about that for a moment from a different issue perspective. Bear with me for a couple questions. Have you seen the George Floyd video? I have. What impact did it have on you? Um, Senator, as you might imagine, given that I have two black children, that was very, very personal for my family. Um, Jesse was with the boys on a camping trip out in South Dakota, so I was there, and my 17-year-old daughter, Vivian, who's adopted from Haiti, um, all of this was erupting. It was very difficult for her. Um, we wept together in my room, and then it was also difficult for my daughter, Juliet, who's 10. I had to try to explain some of this to them. I mean, my children, to this point in their lives have had the benefit of growing up in a cocoon where they have not yet experienced hatred or violence. Um, and for Vivian, you know, to understand that there would be a risk to her brother or the son she might have one day of that kind of brutality has been an ongoing conversation. It's a difficult one for us, like it is for Americans all over the country. And so, I'd like to ask you, as an originalist who obviously has a passion for history, I can't imagine that you could separate the two, to reflect on the history of this country. Where are we today when it comes to the issue of race? Some argue it's fine. Everything's fine, and you don't have to even teach children about the history of slavery or discrimination. Others say there is implicit bias in so many aspects of American life that we have to be very candid about and address. Others go further and say, no, it's systemic racism that's built into America, and we have to be much more pointed in our, our, our addressing it. How do you feel? So I think it is an entirely uncontroversial and obvious statement, given, as we just talked about the George Floyd video, that racism persists in our country. As to putting my finger on the nature of the problem, you know, whether, as you say, it's just outright or systemic racism, or how to tackle the, prop, the issue of making it better, those things you know, are policy questions. They're hotly contested policy contest, uh, questions that have been in the news and discussed all summer. So while, you know, as I did share my personal experience, I'm very you know, happy to discuss the, the reaction our family had to the George Floyd video, giving broader statements or making, you know, broader diagnoses about the problem of racism is kind of beyond what I'm capable of doing as a judge. Well, I, I would doubt that. I just don't believe you can be as passionate about originalism and the history behind language that we've had for decades, if not centuries, without having some thought about where we stand today. But I'm not going to press you on that. 
I'm going to take you to a case which uh, I have read and reread, Cantor versus Barr. Mm -hmm. And you know the case well because it's all, already been referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it clearly is a case where you had your day in court. You wrote the sole dissent, uh, in a 64 page case, 37 pages were your dissent. So you gave to the court, I assume, a pretty full uh, accounting of your thoughts on the subject. And here's the way I understand the case. A fellow named, fellow named Ricky Cantor from McQuan, Wisconsin, invented some pads to put in a shoe to be sold to particularly older Americans under Medicare uh, to relieve foot pain. And he designed them and submitted them to Medicare and didn't get the approval that he was looking for, but instead sold them and represented to many customers that they had been approved by Medicare. Mm -hmm. And so he was charged with fraud. Now, this wasn't a matter of a casual uh, mis misapplication of the law. When it was all said and done, Ricky Cantor of McQuan, Wisconsin, ended up spending over a year, a year and a day, uh, in federal prison, paying somewhere near $300,000 in penalties and fines, and $27 million in a civil settlement on this issue. So this was not a casual wrongdoing. This man was a swindler, and he was taking the federal government for a ride, as, lo as well as other customers, and misleading senior citizens about his product, uh, and paid a heavy price for it. Then he decided, having left prison, that it's just fundamentally unfair that the law says that if you've been convicted of a felony, you can't own a firearm. Now, I don't know what his appetite is when it comes to firearms, whether it's a revolver or an AK-47 with a banana clip. I have no idea. But he went to court and said, this is unfair. It was just mail fraud, and you're taking away my Second Amendment rights. So two out of three of your colleagues then uh, basically said, sorry, Ricky, you have forfeited your right to own a firearm because of your conviction of a felony. You took a different approach, exactly the opposite approach, and went deep into history. I think the earliest citation I see here was 1662 uh, to figure out just what was going on here and whether or not he had to have committed a violent felony to have forfeited this right to own a firearm. Have I stated the facts close to what you remember? I don't remember the amount of the loss, some of those details, but yes, Ricky Cantor was um, convicted of selling fraudulent shoe inserts, and it was a felony. Mm -hmm. $27 million settlement along the way. So I'd like to take you into your thinking on this. When the Heller decision was handed down, Justice Scalia expressly said, I'm not taking away the authority of government to impose limitations based on felonies, not violent felonies, felonies and mental illness. He said as much in the Heller decision. And yet, this man who was your inspiration, as you've told us all, uh, you decided he was wrong and that it had to be a violent felony. Can you explain why? I can. So we've talked about precedent. And in my court, the Seventh Circuit, there is precedent saying that that phrase doesn't control, as you know, my colleague Judge Frank Easterbrook has said a number of times, that judicial opinions aren't statutes and shouldn't be read as if they were. So Heller obviously wasn't about the scope of the right, you know, um, its application to felons or those who are mentally ill, et cetera. And so that passage was dicta. It didn't fully dive down into it. But what I did was apply Heller's methodology, both Justice Scalia's majority opinion and Justice Stevens' dissent used an originalist methodology to answer that question. And I concluded that based on that history, one couldn't take the right away simply because one was a felon, that there had to be a showing of dangerousness. And I didn't rule out the possibility that the government might be able to make that showing about Ricky Cantor. But I think we could all agree that we ought to be careful of saying that because someone's a felon, they lose any of their individual rights. I want to get to that point, but I'd like to stick with this for just a moment more. Um, I'm honored to represent the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. It's a great city, but it has great problems too. And one of them is gun violence. 
On the average, we know in America, 100 Americans are killed every day by gunfire, 40,000 per year. In the city of Chicago, more than 3,200 people have been shot just this year, 3,200. According to the city's gun trace report in 2017, the majority of illegally used or possessed firearms recovered in Chicago are traced back to states with less regulation over firearms, such as Indiana and Mississippi. The 2017 report found that Indiana alone was the source of 21% of all Chicago's recovered crime guns. We know how it works. Where you live, you know how it works. There's a traffic between Chicago, northern Indiana, and Michigan going on constantly. Gun shows are held in Gary, Indiana, and other places. And when they're selling these firearms without background checks, unfortunately, these gangbangers and thugs fill up the trunks of their cars with firearms and head into the city of Chicago and kill everyone from infants to older people. It just, it's a horrific situation. Law enforcement is fighting it, trying to get Indiana to at least do background checks at these gun shows with limited success. And we are trying to apply the standards that you disqualify yourself from buy, buying a firearm to felonies and mental illness. And you want to take away part of that uh, protection with your decision in this case. Because if you eliminate felonies and just confine it to violent felonies, you're opening up more opportunities for people to buy firearms, are you not? Well, Senator, you referred to gang members and thugs um, buying guns in Indiana and taking them across the border. And certainly, that if they, if they had felony convictions for doing the kinds of things that members of gangs and thugs do, nothing in Cantor says that the government can't deprive them of firearms. And nothing says, in my opinion, that the government can't deprive Ricky Cantor of having firearms. They simply had to make a showing of dangerousness before they did so. And nothing in the opinion opines at all on the legality of background checks and gun licensing. Those are all separate issues. But the majority zeroes in and says what you've just said is totally impractical, that we are going to go case by case and decide, well, what kind of felonies and what kind of person. And then they go on to produce evidence. I can read the numbers here, but you know them well because you wrote the dissent where the likelihood of committing a violent felony after being convicted of a felony is pretty dramatic. And they're saying to us, don't let us, don't force us to make it case by case. We want to make it by category. It's the only practical way to deal with the thousands, if not millions, of people who are buying firearms. You are aware of the fact that even those who are so-called not violent felons, quote, only felons, like Ricky Cantor, have a propensity to, to commit violent felonies in the future, are you not? There was no evidence of that in the case. And we on courts, for example, the Armed Career Criminal Act, um, that's a federal statute, have to make judgments categorically all the time about what count as crimes of violence. Um, so I don't think that's beyond the ken of courts in any area to identify which felonies are violent and you know which felonies are not. So let's um, but go Excuse me, but I, yeah. I won't address that issue. Let's go to page 21 of the opinion and what the court said, the majority in the court. Most felons, they quoted Yancey, most felons are nonviolent, but someone with felony conviction on his record is more likely than a non-felon to engage in illegal and violent gun use. For example, one study, this goes on to say, 210,886 nonviolent offenders found that one out of five were rearrested for a violent crime within three years. So the evidence is there. It, it is there for the court to consider, and you ignored it. Senator, I didn't ignore it. Um, as I recall, that evidence and the studies were unclear. Um, it, and let's see. I can't remember, as I'm sitting here, the details of all the statistics. But I did consider it, and I recall saying something in the opinion about the reliability of those studies, because they didn't say whether someone had been convicted of a nonviolent crime but had later been convicted of a, vi a violent crime as well. I mean, felonies cover a broad range of things, including selling pigs without a license in some states, redeeming too many bottle caps in Michigan. I mean, so felonies now cover a broad swath of conduct, not all of which seems indicative of whether someone's likely to abuse a firearm. So let's. Let me take you, I'm not going to go so far back in history, uh, but I'm, I'm going to take you back in history for a moment uh, and note that when that Second Amendment was written 
and you did the analysis of it, we were talking about the likelihood that a person could purchase a muzzle-loading musket. We are now talking about virtual military weapons that can kill hundreds of innocent people. It is a much different circumstance. Maybe an originalist pins all their thinking to that musket, but I've got to bring it to the 21st century. And the 21st century has people being killed on the streets of Chicago because of the proliferation of deadly firearms. But let me bring it closer to home and, and tie up the George Floyd question with where I'm headed. There's also a question as whether the commission of a felony disqualifies you from voting in America. And the history on that is pretty clear. In an article, the American Journal of so Sociology found that many <clears throat> felony voting bans were pa passed in the late 1860s and 1870s when implementation of the 15th Amendment and its extension of voting rights to African Americans were ardently contested. It still goes on today with voter suppression, but we know that in Reconstruction, uh, in the Jim Crow era, in Black Code era, that was used, a felony conviction was used to disqualify African Americans from voting in the South and, and many other places. The sentencing project today has found that more than six million Americans can't vote because of a felony conviction, and one out of every 13 black Americans have lost their voting rights. The reason I raise that is that in your dissent, you said disqualifying a person, person from voting because of a simple, simple, because of a felony is okay. But when it comes to the possession of firearms, wait a minute, we're talking about the individual right of a Second Amendment. What we're talking about in voting is a civic right, a community right, however you define it. I don't get it. So you're saying that a felony should not disqualify Ricky from buying an AK-47, but using a felony conviction that someone's passed to deny them the right to vote is all right? Um, Senator, what I said was that the Constitution contemplates that states have the freedom to deprive felons of the right to vote. It's expressed in the constitutional text but I expressed no view on whether that was a good idea, whether states should do that. And I didn't explore in that opinion because it was completely irrelevant to it what limits, if any, there might be on a state's um, ability to curtail felon voting rights. But did you not distinguish the Second Amendment right from the right to vote, calling one an individual right under the Constitution and the other a civic right? That's consistent with the language in the historical context, the way the briefs described it, and it was part of the dispute in Heller of whether the Second Amendment was an individual right or a civic one that was possessed collectively for the sake of the common good. And everybody was treating voting as one of the civic rights. Well, I will just tell you that the, the conclusion of this is hard to swallow. The notion that Mr. Cantor, after all that he did, should not be even slowed down when he's on his way to buy a firearm. My goodness, it's just a felony. It's not a violent felony that he committed. And then to turn around on the other hand and say, well, but when it comes to taking away a person's right to vote, that's the civic duty. It, it, it's something that we could countenance. That is, really goes back to the original George Floyd question. That was thinking in the 19th century that resulted in voter suppression and taking away the right to vote from millions of African Americans across this country. And it still continues to this day. I just don't see it. I think the right to vote should be given at least as much respect as any Second Amendment right. Do you? Senator, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that voting is a fundamental right. And I fear that you might be taking my statement and canter out of context. What I said in that opinion was distinguishing between it was a descriptive statement of the state of the court's case law comparing it to felon, uh, stripping felons of Second Amendment rights. I expressed no view about whether what the constitutional limits of that might be or whether the law should change with respect to felon voting rights. And obviously, that's a contested issue in some states that are considering it right now. And I have no view on that. And it wasn't the subject of Cantor. It may not have been. It wasn't the subject of the case, that's for sure. But in your writings, you raise this. It was part of your dissent discussing the right to vote and a felony conviction uh, eliminating it. Uh, I'm afraid it's inescapable. You've, you've got to be prepared to answer this kind of question. I read it and thought I can't imagine that she's saying this. But I'm afraid I was left with the suggestion you might. Which brings me to the conclusion here. 
We hear over and over from the other side of the aisle, we don't want any activist judges. We want judges that are going to go back to the original document, literally take it word for word, put it in a historical context, and don't get in the way of making laws. We make the laws, you're a judge, you stay away from them. And yet, when we look at this case, the notion of what disqualifies you from buying a firearm was being rewritten by the dissenting judge and saying, when we say felony, we just mean violent felony. Well, the word violent isn't in there, but you found it, or at least found reference to it. It's not the only time this has happened. In Citizens United and its progeny, Republican-appointed justices struck down bipartisan campaign finance reform to unleash a flood of dark money into our political system. Part of that flood is paying for the ad campaign promoting your nomination for the Supreme Court. I know you've said you've gone radio silent in following the media. I don't blame you. I do the same thing politically. But I can just tell you, I've seen them. They are beautiful, expensive ads boosting your nomination for the Supreme Court from organizations we've never heard of, spending millions of dollars to make sure you get on the Supreme Court. Citizens United opened the door for that. And in Shelby County, conservative justices gutted the Voting Rights Act to unleash a wave of voter suppression across the country, going back to the George Floyd moment. Unfortunately, a lot of it is for racial purposes. And this is an example, two or three examples that I've given here, of activist judges rewriting the law, abolishing the law, People have to get real. As I said to you on our phone conversation, I don't think you put the facts here and the law here and nine justices come to the same conclusion. Cases are five, four, six, three, seven, two, unanimous. People see things differently based on their backgrounds, their values, their experience. And I think it's simplistic to think this is a robotic performance once we put a judge on the bench. They just go back, read the Constitution, and rule. It's not that simple, and I think you've acknowledged that by saying even originalists disagree with one another. Is that true? Yes, law is hard and it's complicated, and people who approach it from different jurisprudential perspectives will sometimes reach different results. I mean, I, I think that's hard to deny because as you say, every vote from the Supreme Court isn't unanimous, and sometimes it is, but cases don't get to the Supreme Court unless the circuits disagree among themselves, so it's hard. But to the extent, Senator Durbin, that you're suggesting that I have some sort of agenda on felon voting rights or guns or campaign finance or anything else, I can assure you and the whole committee that I do not. I didn't say that, and I wouldn't say that. But I will say that you come, if you're successful in this pursuit, you come to the Supreme Court with life experiences. You come to the Supreme Court having read a lot, I'm sure and drawn some conclusions in your own mind about certain things and certain issues. Everyone on the court has that same background. They bring something to it that is just not generic, it's individual. And that's the point I'm making. There's an individualism to this. The class of originalists on the Supreme Court are not all going to vote the same on every case. Uh, and I think merely saying originalism does not absolve you or us from uh, observing the obvious. There are going to be differences. I think. Would you like to say something? I don't want to cut you off. No, that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Durbin. We'll uh, go to Senator Lee, and after that, we'll take a 30-minute uh, lunch break and start back with Senator Whitehouse. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two letters for the record that I'd like to have admitted. They're authored by former law clerks of Judge Barrett's. Without objection. I'd encourage all of my colleagues to read them. They're outstanding and provide great insight into Judge Barrett's immense qualifications. Judge Barrett, moments ago, we went through um, a rather interesting set of exchanges. One of my colleagues, I, I, uh, I hope I misunderstood him, seems to have suggested that it's a political talking point for you to decline to indicate how you would rule on a particular case or a particular type of case. To the extent that that's what any colleague has suggested, I'd remind that colleague, that's just wildly incorrect. It's wildly incorrect with canons of judicial ethics, with federal law, with the statement laid out by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her own confirmation proceedings before this very body in this very room nearly 30 years ago. It is imperative that you uphold those standards, and I applaud you for doing so. And I think on no planet 
is it appropriate for anybody su to suggest that that's a political talking point for you to say, I'm not going to indicate how I'm going to rule in a particular case? Justice Ginsburg did, in fact, say it well, and some of this has been quoted today. I'm going to quote it again just for good measure. She said, judges in our system are bound to decide concrete cases, not abstract issues. A judge sworn to decide impartially can offer no forecast, no hints for that would show not only disregard for the specifics of a particular case, it would display disdain for the entire judicial process. Similarly, because you are considering my capacity for independent judging, my personal views on how I would vote on a publicly debated issue were I in your shoes, were I a legislator, are not what you will be closely examining. That's what she said. She said it well. It was true in 1993, and it remains true today. I want to turn next to uh, uh, a line of, of questioning that you just uh, uh, finished, that you just completed. I, I, too, have read the Cantor case, and I am thrilled that we've got a jurist who is willing, when looking at somebody whose constitutional rights are about to be taken away, thrilled to have a jurist who's willing to consider a pre-deprivation review for that individual. Is it unusual, Judge Barrett, to consider someone's constitutional rights on an individualized basis before having a specifically enumerated, constitutionally protected right removed? Uh, that would be very, very unusual. It would be very, very unusual, and it would be unwise, would it not? Um, well, I think what I could say to that, just to be careful about how much law I'm analyzing is that the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause certainly guarantees to each individual due process before liberty is taken away. I also appreciated the thorough analysis that you undertook, making clear that uh, our, our, our rights in this area don't just date back a few decades. They don't just date back to the 60s. They don't date just back to the uh, 1780s or the 1760s. They date back at least to the 1660s. I mean, they go way, way back. There's a lot of history that went into what became the Second Amendment. There were conflicts. This involved not just partisan conflicts, but conflicts between the king and subjects. And not just between the king and subjects in the abstract, but very often it was between Protestants and Catholics. Sometimes it was Catholics who weren't trusted with guns. Sometimes it was Protestants who weren't trusted with guns. But there was a lot of violence that went into that and that led to our adoption of that amendment. I appreciated your historical analysis of this, your willingness to be thorough, to make sure that when someone's constitutionally protected rights are taken into account, you're going to do your homework. You're going to do your homework even if it's hard. You're going to do it even if you've got colleagues who aren't willing to go there. That's what judicial leadership is. Judicial leadership involves willingness to stand alone. Judge Barrett, one of the things that came out to me uh, uh, as, as I read your opinion in the Cantor case is that your commitment to textualism and originalism are, in fact, real. They're not feigned. This is the kind of thing you can't fake. This isn't something you make up at the last minute. And yes, I agree with Senator Durbin. Being a textualist and originalist doesn't guarantee a particular result, a particular outcome in any particular case. But it does indicate a style a preference. Tell me why textualism and originalism are important to you. Because I think that both statutes and the Constitution are law. Um, they derive their democratic legitimacy from the fact that they have been enacted in the case of statutes by the people's representatives or in the case of the Constitution through the Constitution making process. And I, as a judge, have an obligation to respect and enforce only that law that the people themselves have embraced. As I was saying earlier, it's not the law of Amy, it's the law of the American people. And I think originalism and textualism, to me, boil down to that, to a commitment to the rule of law, to not disturbing or changing or updating or you know, adjusting in, in line with my own policy preferences what that law requires. And is it, is it the subjective motivation, the subjective intent of an individual lawmaker or drafter of a constitutional provision that we're looking at, or is it original public meaning? Uh, and if so, what, what's the difference between those two? Um, it's original public meaning, not the subjective intent of any particular drafter. 
So one thing I have told my students in constitutional law is that the question is not what would James Madison do. We don't, are not, we're not controlled by how James Madison perceived any particular problem. That's because the law is what the people understand it to be, not what goes on in any individual legislator's, legislator's mind. Is, I respect you greatly, Senator Lee, but what you think in your mind rather than what passes through both houses and is signed by the president, that's what's the law, not any private intentions you have. So, so regardless of, of what, uh, uh, I, let's say I, I, I pass bill XYZ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the sponsor of it, I, I take it down to the floor. And I say, here's Bill XYZ, and here's what I think about it. Here's what I intend to do with it. And I put that statement into the legislative record. What, if any, impact should that statement have on the meaning of law XYZ once it becomes law? Um, nothing. You've got to get it into the law itself if you want it to be law. Legislative history is not what goes to the process of bicameralism and presentment. Regardless of, of how passionately and, and persuasively I make that point in whatever glorious speech I give in support of Bill XYZ, it doesn't make a darn bit of difference, does it? It doesn't. I'm sure the speech would be glorious, but I assume the point you make probably would be made by the advocates in the case, too. And so in that respect, you are functioning as an advocate when you make the glorious statement, but not speaking with the voice of the lawmaker because no individual does. It's the full body that speaks. I want to speak next about um, the Affordable Care Act. We, we've seen posters going up over and over and over again. We've seen them yesterday. We've seen them today. We've seen a lot of compelling stories of, about people whose uh, lives have been marked by difficult things that they've endured. Uh, they've involved touching and heartwarming stories. I continue to doubt the relevance of uh, things like that here, especially insofar as they're being used to suggest that your confirmation to the Supreme Court of the United States has anything to do with their health care. Tell me why you think that any individual American's health care status is or is not tied to your confirmation to the Supreme Court of the United States? Um, it is not tied to my nomination to the Supreme Court of the United States. I have said repeatedly under oath that I had no conversations with anyone in the White House about that case. And I I'm not sure, it, to the extent there's a suggestion that I have an agenda that I want to strike down people's protection for pre-existing conditions, that's just not true. Um, I've never taken that position, and as I've also said repeatedly, any policy pre pre preferences that I have don't matter anyway. They're irrelevant. So making that law, coming out with the contours of the ACA, that's your job. It is our job. It is the job of policy-making branches of government. It's the job of whatever combination of state and federal lawmakers and other policymakers have. But a judge is not a policymaker. When Congress passes a law, Congress is in charge of making sure that that law works. Insofar as that doesn't work or that law ends up being stricken down, it's our job to replace it with something that does work, whether uh, constitutionally or otherwise in all respects. That's our job, not yours. You made some comments a few years ago, comments with which I wholeheartedly agree. Raising a criticism with Chief Justice Roberts and his majority decision in NFIB versus Sebelius. A decision, and don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to, to weigh in on this. You made those comments at the time, and they're not relevant to me now, but I set this up for reasons I'll explain in a moment. He rewrote the Affordable Care Act, not just once but twice, in substantive ways in order to save that law from an otherwise inevitable finding of unconstitutionality. Because that law, as written by this Congress, was in fact unconstitutional in two material respects at issue in NFIB versus Sebelius. Blatantly unconstitutional. He effectively acknowledged that the law, as written, couldn't pass constitutional muster. And so he re rewrote it, not just once, but twice, in order to save it. That's water under the bridge. 
that happened. It's inexcusable that he did that. He misused the judicial authority. That case has absolutely nothing to do with California versus Texas. It has absolutely nothing to do with the question of severability in that case. Would it be fair to say that my very strong opinions uh, uh, that I've just expressed do not indicate how I would feel, uh, how I would lean were I a jurist uh, a, a, in California versus Texas? Um, I think you're correct, Senator Lee, that the question, the legal issue is entirely different in California versus Texas. Severability is its own independent doctrine and has nothing to do with the statutory interpretation questions presented in Sebelius. In many circumstances in this country, we see emotionally charged issues that boil and boil for a long time. They can't always be resolved. Not everybody's going to agree on everything. Not everybody is going to agree on certain hot-button social issues that uh, result in some cases from just basic differences in how people view life and how people view their place in the universe. One of those areas where it manifests itself is in the area of abortion. People view life and when it begins differently. Some of that's informed by religious beliefs. Some of it's informed just by people's common sense approach to what they think the law ought to say and what it ought not to say. Disputes regarding when life begins and disputes regarding abortion didn't begin with Roe versus Wade. What did change with Roe versus Wade, however, was the federalization and the grasping of the issue and the taking it beyond the realm of political debate within the federal judiciary such that elected lawmakers were no longer in a position to be the primary drivers of policy. As a result, over the last few decades, You've had all kinds of questions that have been put into uncertainty. You've got uncertainty by people at the state level who want to make their own decisions about certain things around abortion. They know they can't prohibit it entirely. They know that uh, there's this undue burden standard that has to be addressed. Nobody's completely sure in advance what that means, and so they work around it. There are discussions that arise regarding health and safety qualifications for abortion clinics, how close an abortion clinic needs to be to an accredited hospital, how it needs to be staffed, and what the sanitation protocols are. Then you've got, uh, more recently, uh, some states passing laws saying, look, there's abundant medical science showing that an unborn human can feel and respond to pain as early as, I don't know, 10 or 12 gestational weeks, but certainly by 20 weeks. And so by 20 weeks, we're going to adopt a different set of legal procedures for an abortion as a result of that, because if this is a human that everybody agrees can feel and respond to pain, we ought to handle that differently. All of those things, the legitimacy of those laws, are thrown into the federal courts yet again, all because those were made federal issues. Now, I want to be very clear. You'd have the impression from watching debates in circumstances like this one and in protests outside the Supreme Court of the United States, you'd have the impression that if Roe versus Wade didn't exist, that all of a sudden abortion would immediately become illegal in every state in America. That assumes a lot of facts, not in evidence. In fact, that assumes a lot of things contrary to evidence. It is not the fact that it is simply not the case that the fate of health care in America turns on whether or not someone is confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States, nor is it a fact to suggest that the availability of an abortion or lack thereof is contingent upon anyone's confirmation to the Supreme Court of the United States. The fact that we have this debate and the fact that it's become as protracted, as personal, as ugly as it has, could, I, I suspect, be traced to the fact that we've tried to take a debatable matter 
beyond debate. And we've tried to take it outside the political branches of government where people can elect their individual representatives and have laws respecting and reflecting the views of their respective communities. We're a country of, what, 330 million Americans. It's really, really difficult to have those 330 million Americans reflected in nine members of the Supreme Court. It's still really hard to have them reflected in 100 senators and 435 representatives. Uh, that's doable, especially when those people are elected. And they stand for election every couple years in the case of the House, every six years in the case of the Senate. It doesn't happen that way in the Supreme Court of the United States. So to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, we're fear-mongering on this, causing people to worry and lose sleep over this, fundraising over this, fundraising over threats that people are going to lose their health care, fundraising over threats that people are going to be dying in the streets because of the lack of availability of this or that medical procedure. I'd ask, have we created a monster? Have we ourselves, through our own inaction, through our own voluntary cessation of authority to a non-legislative, non-political branch, have we created the very set of untenable social circumstances that are causing people to protest outside of a non-political entity? I think we have to ask ourselves that question from time to time. Life is, in fact, valuable. It's not a religious statement to make that observation. In fact, it's the foundation of basically all of our laws, not just in this country, not just in, in countries with Christian origins, but in basically every country that has ever existed anywhere in the world. The purpose of government is to protect life. That's what it's about. If we can't agree on the fact that it's reasonable that people ought to be able to have some say at least at some limit, at least at some point beyond the moment when uh, an unborn human can feel and respond to pain. Something's wrong with us. And if we're going to leave those things perpetually in the hands of the unelected, it might be really convenient for political fundraising within Congress. But it's not good for the United States of America. It's not good for constitutionally limited government. It's not good for our individual liberties. Judge Barrett, <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton was prescient in a number of areas. He had some crazy ideas. He did some crazy things. He was also freaking brilliant. I think he foresaw certain aspects of our lives when he described the differences between the branches of government in Federalist 78. And in Federalist 78, he said that the legislative branch, Congress, being a political branch, a branch whose job it is to make policy, to make law, is possessed with will, and that what's possessed by the judicial branch is not will, but judgment. He then went on to explain that it's really important to maintain that, that clear distinction between will and judgment, lest you have the judicial branch consisting of people who are not elected by the people, not accountable to the people at the regular intervals, and who serve basically for the rest of their lives so long as they're on good behavior. You can't have them exercising will because it's not their job. What do you think he meant? What's the difference between will and judgment? I think will is the imposition of policy preferences as happens in the making of law. Um, Judgment is evaluating that law for its consistency with the Constitution, for example, or to give another example, to interpret what that law means. But it most certainly is not the imposition of policy preferences. A judge who approaches a case um, as an opportunity for an exercise of will has acted, um, has betrayed her judicial duty. How does she know when she's reached that point? Um, so I think it requires disciplined judicial decision-making. 
So you approach the text, you treat it as a text, you treat it as law. You know, I've described originalism and textualism, so I won't belabor that point. But I will say that one practice that I have, um, one check that I put on myself to, to make sure that I'm not biased, is that when I write an opinion, I try to read it from the perspective of the losing party so that any sympathy that I might feel for the particular result that I reach, I try to make the sympathy run the other way to see if it will still hold. And also to see like, you know, I would be disappointed in this outcome if it was my child whose sentence or criminal conviction or civil loss, whatever it is, is on the line. But would I still think it was a well-reasoned opinion? And that's the test that I use for myself. I think discipline is required. Um, but I take it very, very seriously. As we've had this conversation today, one of the, uh, one of the arguments that's been made by some of my colleagues is referred to activism and has, has uh, uh, accused, uh, if I understood the argument correctly, uh, some textualist, originalist jurists as having engaged in activism. Now, I want to be clear, I, 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 I'm one who doesn't believe that there is anything worse about an activist judge than a pacifist judge, meaning I think it's every bit as bad to be a pacifist. That is, for example, to let stand an invalid unconstitutional law as if it were valid and constitutional. It's every bit as bad to do that as it is to invalidate as unconstitutional something that is, in fact, not unconstitutional. Would you, you agree with me that uh, both of those are equally in instances of bad judging? They are both instances, of, as you've posed them, of not following the law, not following the Constitution, or not correctly uh, interpreting a statute. By the same token, um, a, a judge who fails to grant a meritorious dispositive motion and a judge who grants a non-meritorious dispositive motion. They've both probably done an equally bad thing. Is that right? Yeah. Does the Constitution say anything about the size of the Supreme Court? Um, the Constitution does not. Uh, that is a question left open to Congress. Uh, it's my understanding that it's been nine for about 150 years, but that's as a matter of statute, not constitutional requirement. So it's statutory. It's a statutory uh, decision, one that stood for uh, more than a century and a half. It's a decision, nonetheless, that uh, uh, has some bearing, could have some bearing on constitutional issues, correct? Um, insofar as there would be more decision makers on yeah. the court? If, if we abandoned uh, the longstanding historical practice and tradition of having nine justices, could that have an impact on the way the three branches of government interact with each other? Possibly, but it's difficult for me to imagine what specific constitutional question you're asking. And of course, of course. if there were one, I could opine on it. Of course. There are strong reasons, I believe, why over the last more than a century and a half, we've left that number at nine. Uh, as you point out, there's nothing in the Constitution that requires it. Uh, we could come up with any number we wanted. There does have to be a Supreme Court and such inferior courts as we choose to create. Uh, but it doesn't specify the number of seats that can be on there. There are nonetheless good prudential reasons, reasons having to do with respect for the separation of powers between the three branches of government, reasons that have, over the last 150 plus years, left us to leave that number at nine. The last time, as far as I can tell, there was any serious effort to move the number above nine it was in the fall of 1936, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt got tired of this so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, a uh, few members of the Supreme Court who were consistently voting uh, against his agenda and sometimes joined by one or more other members of the Supreme Court. 
He got particularly tired of this, and so he proposed packing the court. And let me explain what I mean by packing the court here. What I mean when I refer to this is increasing the number of seats on the Supreme Court and doing so by statute with the intent of altering the composition of the court for short-term political gain. That's what FDR wanted to do. Notwithstanding the fact that he had a, uh, an overwhelming supermajority in both houses of Congress, fortunately, FDR's idea that he pushed in the fall of 1936 didn't make it anywhere. It didn't gain progress. It met enough opposition, even with both houses of Congress being overwhelmingly controlled by his political party, that it stalled quite mercifully. And it's remained ever since then at nine justices. I think it would have been a colossal mistake. Joe Biden himself, as a US senator, as a member of this body, in a proceeding of this committee in 1983, gave a rousing speech that I recommend to all, talking about that very thing acknowledging that the Constitution doesn't require it, but our respect for the separation of powers really ought to lead to us sticking to the number nine. Don't pack the court. In recent days, I've seen some in the media and some in this body try to redefine what it means to pack the court. Some have suggested, well, court packing takes various forms, and it can mean confirming a lot of people uh, 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 all at once. Some have defined it so as to suggest that it consists of doing that which the Trump administration and the Republican Senate have been doing over the last three and a half years, which is filling vacancies as they have arisen and doing so with textualist, originalist judges. This may not be something that some like, but this is not court packing. Court packing is itself manipulative. It's something that has great danger to do immense political and constitutional harm to our system of government, in part because it would set up a one-way ratchet. Once you create a position and confirm someone to that position, absent death, retirement, or impeachment and removal, that position remains in place. So if, for example, a future Congress and White House were to decide to get together and to pack the court, and increase the number, say, to 11. And let's say it's Democrats who do that. And we've got Joe Biden now as a presidential candidate who's refusing to say whether he would do it. There's a reason he's not saying whether he would do it. There's only one reason why you refuse to answer that question, and it's you're, if you're wanting to be able to do it. But you don't want to take the heat for the fact that you're thinking about doing it right now. So if they do that, where does it lead? Well, it inevitably leads to the point where the next time Republicans have control of both houses of Congress and the White House, they'd increase it as well. You'd end up increasing it incrementally. Before long, it looks like the Senate in Star Wars, where you've got hundreds of people on there. I don't know what the total number would be, but you increase it at all, you change the number at all, you do so for partisan political purposes at all, you delegitimize the court. And you can't delegitimize the court without fundamentally threatening and eroding and impairing some of our most valued liberties. You can't do that without inevitably threatening things like religious freedom, things like free speech, things that are themselves often unpopular but are protected by the Constitution precisely because they are unpopular. And yes, in that respect, the Constitution is sometimes counter-democratic. Sometimes it can be described as fundamentally undemocratic. In fact, it's the whole reason to have a Constitution, is to protect us from the impulse of a majority that might be bent on harming the few in the name of the many. That's why the law is so important. That's why the position for which you're being considered is so essential. That's why we've got to do our job to make sure that the only people who get the job for which you've been nominated fit the bill. You, Judge Barrett, are someone in whom I have immense confidence, immense trust, and I look forward to voting, to confirming you for that very position. Uh, thanks, Senator Lee. Uh, we'll take, let's uh, come back at 1245.
We'll uh, start with uh, Senator Whitehouse. <clears throat> we have 15 senators left. Everybody takes the 30 minutes, uh, seven and a half hours. We'll take a break for, uh, for dinner tonight, sometime later on, and a short break. Uh, are you doing okay? Mm -hmm. Three hours about right? So we'll come back at 1245, and right now we're on schedule to be here to 9 o'clock, but we'll do whatever the committee wants. Uh, we're in recess to 1245.
Yeah, or you can just put it on top of your camera. No, I can't. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I was going to say that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I
ready when you are. Are we, are we live? Are we going up? Yeah. Order, uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Judge Barrett, um, you can take a bit of a breather on your uh, return to the committee, um, because what I want to do is go through with the people who are uh, watching this now the um, conversation that you and I had when we spoke on the telephone. <clears throat> you were kind enough to hear out a presentation uh, that I made, and um, I intend to ask some questions in that area, but it doesn't make sense to ask questions if I haven't laid the predicate, particularly for uh, viewers who are um, <coughs> watching this. So um, I guess the reason that I want to do this is because people who are watching this um, need to understand that this small hearing room and the little TV box that you're looking at, um, the little screen that you're looking at, are a little bit like the uh, frame of a, of a puppet theater. And if you only look at what's going on in the puppet theater, you're not going to understand the whole story. You're not going to understand um, the real dynamic <clears throat> of what is going on here. Um, and you're certainly not going to understand forces outside of this room who are pulling strings and pushing sticks and causing uh, the puppet theater to react. So first, let me say, why do I think outside forces are here pulling strings? Well, part of it is behavior. We have uh, colleagues here who supported you, this nominee, <clears throat> before there was a nominee. That's a little unusual. Um, we have the political ram job that we have already complained of, driving this process through at breakneck speed in the middle of a pandemic while the Senate is closed for safety reasons and while we're doing nothing about the COVID epidemic around us. <clears throat> We have some very awkward 180s from colleagues. Mr. Chairman, you figure in this. Uh, our leader um, said back when it was Garland versus uh, Gorsuch that of course, of course, the American people should have a say in the court's direction. Of course, of course, said Mitch McConnell. That's long gone. Senator Grassley said the American people shouldn't be denied a voice. That's long gone. Senator Cruz said you don't do this in an election year. That's long gone. And our chairman made his famous hold the tape promise if an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's term, we'll wait till the next election. That's gone too. So there is a lot of hard to explain hypocrisy and rush taking place right now. And my experience around politics is that when you find hypocrisy in the daylight, look for power in the shadows. Now people may say, well, what does all this matter? This is a political parlor game, it's no big deal. Well, there's some pretty high stakes here that we've been talking about. Uh, here on the on our side, and I'll tell you three of them right here. Roe versus Wade, Obergefell, and the Obamacare cases. Here's the GOP platform, the Republican platform, the platform of my colleagues on the other side of this aisle say that a Republican president will appoint judges who will reverse Roe, Obergefell, and the Obamacare cases. So if you have a family member with an interest in some autonomy over their body under Roe versus Wade, the ability to have a marriage, to have friends marry, to have a niece or a daughter or a son marry, someone of their same sex, they have a, you've got a stake. And if you're one of the millions and millions of Americans who depend on 
the Affordable Care Act, you've got a stake. It's not just the platform over and over again. Let's start by talking about the Affordable Care Act. Here's the President <clears throat> talking about this litigation that we're gearing up this nominee for for November 10th. In this litigation, he said, we want to terminate health care under Obamacare. That is the President's statement. So when we react to that, don't act as if we're making this stuff up. This is what President Trump said. This is what your party platform says. Reverse the Obamacare cases. Senator after senator, including many in this committee, filed briefs saying that the Affordable Care Act should be thrown out by courts. Why is it surprising for us to be concerned that you want this nominee to do what you want nominees to do? One quick stop on NFIB v. Sebelius, because a lot of this has to do with money. This is an interesting comparison. National Federation of Independent Businesses, until it filed the NFIB v. Sebelius case, had its biggest donation ever of $21,000. In the year that it went to work on the Affordable Care Act, 10 wealthy donors gave $10 million. Somebody deserves a thank you. So let's go on to Roe v. Wade. <clears throat> Same thing. Same thing. The President has said that reversing Roe v. Wade will happen automatically because he's putting pro-life justices on the court. Why would we not take him at his word? The Republican Party platform says it will reverse Roe. Why would we not comment on that and take you at your word? Senators here, including Senator Hawley, have said, I will vote only for nominees who acknowledge that Roe v. Wade is wrongly decided and their pledge to vote for this nominee. Do the math. That's a really simple equation to run. The Republican brief in June Medical said Roe should be overruled. So don't act surprised when we ask questions about whether that's what you're up to here. And finally, out in the ad world that you have spared yourself wisely, Judge Barrett, uh, the Susan B. Anthony Foundation is running advertisements right now saying that you are set. You are set to give our pro-life country <clears throat> the court that it deserves. There's the ad with the voiceover. She's set. She's set. And then Roe, Obamacare cases, and Obergefell, gay marriage. National Organization for Marriage, the big group that opposes same-sex marriage, says, in this proceeding, all our issues are at stake. The Republican platform says it wants to reverse Obergefell. And the Republican brief filed in the case said, same-sex relationships don't fall within any constitutional protection. So when we say the stakes are high on this, it's because you've said the stakes are high on this. You have said that's what you want to do. So how are people going about doing it? What is the scheme here? Let me start with this one. In all cases, there's big anonymous money behind various lanes of activity. One lane of activity is through the conduit of the Federalist Society. It's managed by a guy, was managed by a guy named Leonard Leo, and it's taken over the selection of judicial nominees. How do we know that to be the case? Because Trump has said so over and over again. His White House counsel said so. So we have an anonymously funded group controlling judicial selection run by this guy, Leonard Leo. Then in another lane, we have, again, anonymous funders running through something called the Judicial Crisis Network, which is run by Carrie Severino, and it's doing PR and campaign ads <clears throat> for Republican judicial nominees. It got $17 million, single $17 million donation in the Garland Gorsuch contest. 
It got another single $17 million donation to support Kavanaugh. Somebody, perhaps the same person, spent $35 million to influence the makeup of the United States Supreme Court. Tell me that's good. And then over here, you have a whole array of legal groups, also funded by dark money, which have a different role. They bring cases to the court. They don't wind their way to the court, Your Honor. They get shoved to the court by these legal groups, many of which ask to lose below so they can get quickly to the court to get their business done there. And then they turn up in a chorus, an orchestrated chorus of amici. Now, I've had a chance to have a look at this. And I was in a case, actually, as an amicus myself, the Consumer Financial Protection Board case. And in that case, there were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 amicus briefs filed. And every single one of them was a group funded by something called Donors Trust. Donors Trust is a gigantic identity scrubbing device for the right wing so that it says Donors Trust is the donor without whoever the real donor is. It doesn't have a business. It doesn't have a business plan. It doesn't do anything. It's just an identity scrubber. And this group here, the Bradley Foundation, funded eight out of the 11 briefs. That seems weird to me when you have amicus briefs coming in little flotillas that are funded by the same groups but nominally separate in the court. So I actually attached this to my brief as an appendix. Center for, Center for Media and Democracy saw it, and they did better work. They went on to say which foundations funded the brief writers in that CFPB case. Here's the Bradley Foundation for 5.6 million to those groups. Here's Donors Trust, 23 million to those brief writing groups. The grand total across all the donor groups was $68 million to the groups that were filing amicus briefs, pretending that they were different groups. And it's not just in the Consumer Financial Protection Board case. You might say, well, that was just a one-off. Here's Janus, the anti-labor case <clears throat> that had a long trail through the court, through Friedrichs and through Knox and through other decisions. And SourceWatch and ProPublica did some work about this. Here's Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund. And here's the Bradley Foundation. And they totaled giving $45 million to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 groups that filed amicus briefs pretending to be different groups, and both of the lawyer groups in the case, funded by Donors Trust, funded by Bradley Foundation in Janus. This is happening over and over and over again, and it goes beyond just the briefs. It goes beyond just the amicus presentations. The Federalist Society, remember this group that is acting as the conduit and that Donald Trump has said is doing his judicial selection? They're getting money from the same foundations. From Donors Trust, $16.7 million. From the Bradley Foundation, $1.37 million. From the same group of foundations total, $33 million. So you can start to look at these, and you can start to tie them together. The legal groups, all the same funders over and over again, bringing the cases and providing this orchestrated, orchestrated chorus of amici. Then the same group also funds the Federalist Society over here. The Washington Post wrote a big expose about this, and that made Leonard Leo a little hot, a little bit like a burned agent. So he had to jump out, and he went off to go and do anonymously funded voter suppression work. Guess who jumped in to take over the selection process in this case? For Judge Barrett. Carrie Severino made the hop. So once again, ties right in together. So Center for Media and Democracy has done a little bit more research Here's a Bradley Foundation memo that they've published. The Bradley Foundation is reviewing a grant application asking for money for this orchestrated amicus process. And what do they say in the staff recommendation? It is important to orchestrate 
their word, not mine, important to orchestrate high caliber amicus efforts uh, before the court. They also note that Bradley has done previous philanthropic investments in the actual underlying legal actions. So Bradley is funding, what do they call, philanthropically investing in the underlying legal action and then giving money to groups to show up in the orchestrated chorus of amici. That can't be good. And it goes on because they also found this email. This email comes from an individual at the Bradley Foundation, and it asks our friend Leonard Leo, who used to run the selection process, is there a 501c3 nonprofit to which Bradley could direct any support of the two Supreme Court amicus projects other than Donors Trust? I don't know why they wanted to avoid the reliable identity scrubber Donors Trust, but for some reason they did. So Leonard Leo writes back, on Federalist Society address. They don't tell me that it isn't Federalist Society business. On Federalist Society, uh, on his address, he writes back, yes, send it to the Judicial Education Project, which could take and allocate the money. And guess who works for the Judicial Education Project? Carrie Severino, who also helped select this nominee running the Trump Federalist Society selection process. So the connections abound. In the Washington Post article, they point out that the Judicial Crisis Network's office is on the same hallway in the same building as the Federalist Society, and that when they sent their reporter to talk to somebody at the <clears throat> Judicial Crisis Network, somebody from the Federalist Society came down to let them up. This more and more looks like it's not three schemes, but it's one scheme with the same funders selecting judges, funding campaigns for the judges, and then showing up in court in these orchestrated amicus flotillas to tell the judges what to do. On the Judicial Crisis Network, you've got the Leonard Leo connection, obviously. She hopped in to take over for him with the Federalist Society. You've got the campaigns that I've talked about, where they take $17 million contributions. That's a big check to write, $17 million, to campaign for Supreme Court nominees. No idea who that is or what they got for it. You've got briefs that she wrote. The Republican senators filed briefs in that NFIB case signed by Ms. Severino. The woman who helped choose this nominee has written briefs for Republican senators attacking the ACA. Don't say the ACA is not an issue here. And by the way, the Judicial Crisis Network funds the Republican Attorneys General. It funds RAGA, the Republican Attorney General's Association, and it funds individual Republican Attorneys General. And guess who the plaintiffs are in the Affordable Care Act case? Republican attorneys general. Trump joined them because he didn't want to defend, so he's in with the Republican attorneys general. But here's the Judicial Crisis Network campaigning for Supreme Court nominees, writing briefs for senators against the Affordable Care Act, supporting the Republicans who are bringing this case, and leading the selection process for this nominee. Here's the page off the brief. Here's where they are. Mitch McConnell, and on through the list. Senator Collins, Senator Cornyn, Senator Hoven, Senator, who's still here? Marco Rubio. It's a huge assortment of Republican senators who Carrie Severino wrote a brief for against, against, against the Affordable Care Act. So, this is a, to me, pretty big deal. I've never seen this around any court that I've ever been involved with, where there's this much dark money and this much influence being used. Here's how the Washington Post summed it up. This is a conservative activist behind the scenes campaign to remake the nation's courts, and it's a $250 million dark money operation. $250 million is a lot of money to spend if you're not getting anything for it. 
So that raises the question, what are they getting for it? Well, I showed the slide earlier on the Affordable Care Act and on Obergefell and on Roe versus Wade. That's where they lost. But with another judge, that could change. That's where the contest is. That's where the Republican Party platform tells us to look at how they want judges to rule to reverse Roe, to reverse the Obamacare cases, and to reverse Obergefell and take away gay marriage. That is their stated objective and plan. Why not take them at their word? But there's another piece of it, and that is not what's ahead of us, but what's behind us. What's behind us is now 80 cases, Mr. Chairman, 80 cases under Chief Justice Roberts that have these characteristics. One, they were decided five to four by a bare majority. Two, the five to four majority was partisan in the sense that not one Democrat, Democratic appointee joined the five. I refer to that group as the Roberts Five. It changes a little bit as with Justice Scalia's death, for instance. But there's been a steady Roberts Five that has delivered now 80 of these decisions. And the last characteristic of them is that there is an identifiable Republican donor interest in those cases. And in every single case, that donor interest won. It was an 80 to zero, five to four partisan route ransacking. And it's important to look at where those cases went, because they're not about big public issues like getting rid of the Affordable Care Act, undoing Roe versus Wade, and undoing same-sex marriage. They're about power. And if you look at those 80 decisions, they fall into four categories over and over and over again. One, Unlimited and dark money in politics. Citizens United is the famous one, but it's continued since with McCutcheon, and we've got one coming up now. Always the five for unlimited money in politics, never protecting against dark money in politics, mm. despite the fact that they said it was going to be transparent. And who wins when you allow unlimited dark money in politics? A very small group the ones who have unlimited money to spend and a motive to spend it in politics. They win, everybody else loses. And if you're looking at who might be behind this, let's talk about people with unlimited money to spend and a motive to do it. We'll see how that goes. Next, knock the civil jury down. Whittle it down to a nub. The civil jury was in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in our darn Declaration of Independence. But it's annoying to big corporate powers because you can swagger your way as a big corporate power through Congress. You can go and tell the president you put money into to elect what to do. He'll put your stooges at the EPA. It's all great until you get to the civil jury because they have an obligation, as you know, Judge Barrett, they have an obligation under the law to be fair to both parties, irrespective of their size. You can't bribe them. You're not allowed to. It's a crime to tamper with the jury. It's standard practice to tamper with Congress. And they make decisions based on the law. If you're used to being the boss and swaggering your way around the political side, you don't want to be answerable before a jury. And so one after another, these 85 to 4 decisions have knocked down, whittled away at the civil jury, a great American institution. Third, First was unlimited dark money. Second was demean and diminish the civil jury. Third is weaken regulatory agencies. A lot of this money, I'm convinced, is polluter money. The Coke Industries is a polluter. The fossil fuel industry is a polluter. Who else would be putting buckets of money into this and wanting to hide who they are behind donors' trust or other schemes? And what if, if you're a big polluter, what do you want? You want weak regulatory agencies. You want ones that you can box up and run over to Congress and get your friends to fix things for you in Congress. Over and over and over again, these decisions are targeted at regulatory agencies to weaken their independence 
and weaken their strength. And if you're a big polluter, a weak regulatory agency is your idea of a good day. And the last thing is in politics, in voting. Why on earth the court made the decision a factual decision, not something appellate courts are ordinarily supposed to make, as I understand it, Judge Barrett, the factual decision that nobody needed to worry about minority voters in preclearance states being discriminated against or that legislators would try to knock back their ability to vote. These five made that finding in Shelby County against bipartisan legislation from both houses of Congress, hugely passed on no factual record. They just decided that that was a problem that was over on no record with no basis because it got them to the result that we then saw. What followed? State after state after state passed voter suppression laws. One so badly targeting African Americans that the two courts said it was surgically, surgically tailored to get after minority voters. And gerrymandering, the other great control. Bulk gerrymandering, where you go into a state like the Red Map Project did in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and you pack Democrats so tightly into a few districts that all the others become Republican majority districts. And in those states, you send a delegation to Congress that has a huge majority of Republican members, like 13 to 5, as I recall, in a state where the five, the, the party of the five, actually won the popular vote. You've sent a delegation to Congress that is out of step with the popular vote of that state. And court after court figured out how to solve that. And the Supreme Court said, nope, five to four again. Nope, we're not going to take an interest in that question. In all these areas where it's about political power for big special interests and people who want to fund campaigns and people who want to get their way through politics without actually showing up, doing it behind donors' trust and other groups, doing it through these schemes, over and over and over again, you see the same thing. 80 decisions, Judge Barrett. 80 decisions, an 80 to zero sweep. I don't, I don't think you've tried cases, but some cases, the issue is bias and discrimination. And if you're making a bias case as a trial lawyer, Lindsey Graham is a hell of a good trial lawyer. If he wanted to make a bias case, Dick Durbin's a hell of a good trial lawyer. If they wanted to make a bias case and they could show an 80 to 0 pattern, A, that's admissible, and B, I'd love to make that argument to the jury. I'd be really hard pressed to be the lawyer saying, no, 80 to 0 is just a bunch of flukes. All 5 4, all partisan, all this way. So something is not right around the court. And dark money has a lot to do with it. Special interests have a lot to do with it. Donors' trust and whoever's hiding behind donors' trust has a lot to do with it. And the Bradley Foundation orchestrating its Emmy key over at the court has a lot to do with it. So I thank you, Judge Barrett, for listening to me now a second time. And uh, I think this gives you a chance um, for you and I to tee up an interesting conversation tomorrow. And I thank my colleagues for hearing me out. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, Senator Cruz. Oh, Mr. Chairman, can I put three letters in unanimous consent? Uh, without objection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Barrett, welcome. Uh, congratulations on being nominated. Uh, congratulations on enduring uh, the confirmation proceedings. Uh, and I think it is a particularly good thing. We've made it through what I guess you would call the top of the lineup of the questioning. And some of the smartest and, and frankly, most effective questioners uh, on the Democratic side. And I think it speaks volumes that Collectively, they have had very few questions for you. And most effective. He's getting back. And virtually none uh, calling into no. question to your credentials, which cut. are impeccable. Didn't make the cuts. Uh, your record. Uh, and 
what I think is, has been an extraordinary life you've led. So that, uh, that should be the source of, of great satisfaction in terms of the scholarly record and judicial record that you've spent a lifetime building. I want to start by asking you a question. Why is the First Amendment's protection of religious liberty, why is that important? Well, I think it's broadly viewed that the framers uh, protected and ratifiers protected the free exercise of religion because, you know, for reasons that we all know from history of persecuted religious minorities fleeing to the United States, that enshrining that protection, um, you know, it was one of the Bill of Rights because it was considered so fundamental. And why, why does that matter to Americans? What difference does it, that make in, in anybody's life? Well, I think all of the Bill of Rights, each and every one of them, is important to Americans because we value the Constitution, um, including religious liberty. Well, how about the free speech protections of the First Amendment? Why, why are those important? Um, so that minority viewpoints can't be squashed, so that it's not just the majority that can speak popular views. You, you, know, I, you don't really need the First Amendment if what you're saying is something that everybody wants to hear. You need it when people are trying to silence you. And how about the Second Amendment? Why is the right to keep and bear arms important? Well, you know, we talked about Heller earlier this morning, and you know, what Heller tells us is that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms um, for self-defense. Well, I think all of those rights, and I agree with you, the entire Bill of Rights uh, is incredibly important to Americans. I also think what is really striking about this hearing today and also yesterday uh, is that Senate Democrats are not defending uh, what I think is really a, a radical agenda that they have when it comes to the Bill of Rights. And the topics they're discussing today have little bearing to the rights that are really at issue and in jeopardy at the Supreme Court. And so let's take a few minutes to, to, to go through them. Uh, first of all, we've had some discussion of Roe versus Wade. Um, you have declined to give an opinion on a matter that might be pending before the court. That is, of course, the same answer that every single sitting justice has given when he or she was sitting in the same chair you are. Uh, it is mandated by the judicial canons of ethics. Whether one is a nominee of a Democratic president or Republican president, that has been the answer that has been given to this committee for decades. But. I do think it is interesting that our Democratic colleagues, number one, don't discuss what would actually happen if there came a day in which Roe versus Wade were overruled, which is namely that it would not suddenly become the case that abortion was illegal, but rather it would revert to the status of the law as it's been for nearly 200 years of our nation's history, which is that the question uh, of the permissibility of abortion is a question for elected legislatures at the state levels and at the federal level. And it is difficult to dispute that there are a great many jurisdictions, including jurisdictions like California and New York, who even if Roe versus Wade were no longer the law of the land, their elected legislatures would almost certainly continue unrestricted access to abortion with virtually no limitations. <clears throat> what I find interesting, though, is that our Democratic colleagues do not discuss what is really, really the radical position of the most liberal justices on the Supreme Court, which is that no restrictions whatsoever are permissible when it comes to abortion. Yesterday, one of the Democratic senators made reference to the case Gonzalez versus Carhart. Um, I'm quite familiar with that case, and I represented Texas and a number of other states as amici in that case. That case concerned the constitutionality of the federal ban on partial birth abortion. That was legislation that passed Congress, was signed into law that made the really gruesome practice of partial birth abortion illegal. 
overwhelming majority of Americans believe partial birth abortion should be prohibited, even those who identify as pro-choice. A significant percentage of Americans don't want to see that gruesome practice allowed. Supreme Court, by a vote of five to four in Carhartt versus Gonzalez, upheld the federal ban on partial birth abortion. That means there were four justices ready to strike it down, ready to conclude that you can't ban partial birth abortion, that you can't ban late-term abortion. And by the way, other restrictions that are at question include parental consent laws, parental notification laws. None of our Democratic colleagues want to talk about the justices they want to see on the court would strike down every single reasonable restriction on unlimited abortion on demand that the vast majority of Americans support. How about free speech? Well, we've heard quite a bit about free speech. The senator from Rhode Island just gave a long presentation, complete with lots of charts. I'll say a couple of things on free speech. First of all, our Democratic colleagues, when they address the issue of so-called dark money and campaign finance contributions, are often deeply, deeply hypocritical and don't address the actual facts that exist. Here are some facts. Of the top 20 organizations spending money for political speech in the year 2016, 14 of them gave virtually all of their money to Democrats. And another three split their money evenly. So only three of the top 20 gave money to Republicans. What did that mean? In practice, that meant the top 20 super PAC donors contributed $422 million to Democrats and $189 million to Republicans. Those who give these impassioned speeches against dark money don't mention that their side is funded by dark money with a massive differential. The senator from Rhode Island talked about big corporate powers without acknowledging that the contributions from the Fortune 500 in this presidential election overwhelmingly favor Joe Biden and the Democrats, without acknowledging that the contributions from Wall Street in this election overwhelmingly favor Joe Biden and the Democrats. It's an awful lot of rhetoric about power. But it gets even more interesting when you look at Supreme Court nominations. We just heard an attack on the Federalist Society, a group that I've been a member of for over 25 years. I joined as a law student. It's a group that brings conservatives, libertarians, constitutionalists together to have robust discussions about the Constitution and about the law. What's interesting is nowhere in the Senator Rhode Island's remarks was any reference to a company called Arabella Advisors, which is a for-profit entity that manages nonprofits, including the 1630 Fund and the New Venture Fund. Now, what on earth are those? Those sound like awfully dark and confusing names. Well, according to the Wall Street Journal this Sunday, in the year 2017 and 2018, those entities reported $987.5 million in revenue. That's nearly a billion dollars. We heard a lot of thundering indignation at what was described as $250 million of expenditures. In this case, you've got a billion dollars. The senator of Rhode Island said that that much money, much of which is dark money that we don't know who contributed it, he asked, what are they getting for it? And by the way, one of the things they're getting for it is a group called Demand Justice, a project of those entities, spent $5 million opposing Justice Brett Kavanaugh and has just launched a seven-figure ad buy opposing your con confirmation. So all of the great umbrage about the corporate interest or spending dark money is wildly in conflict with the actual facts that the corporate interests that are spending dark money are funding the Democrats by a factor of three to one or greater. 
a fact that doesn't ever seem to be acknowledged. But not only that, what was Citizens United about? You know, it's interesting, most people at home, they've heard about Citizens United. They know it makes Democrats very, very upset. But they don't actually know what the case is about. Citizens United concerned whether or not it was legal to make a movie criticizing a politician. Specifically, Citizens United is a small nonprofit organization based here in DC that made a movie that was critical of Hillary Clinton. And the Obama Justice Department took the position that it could fine, it could punish Citizens United for daring to make a movie critical of a politician. The case went all the way to the US Supreme Court. At the oral argument, there was a moment that was truly chilling. Justice Sam Alito asked the Obama Justice Department, is it your position under your theory of the case that the federal government can ban books? And the Obama Justice Department responded, yes. Yes, it is our position that if the books criticize a political candidate, a politician, the federal government can ban books. As far as I'm concerned, that is a terrifying view of the First Amendment. Citizens United was decided five to four. By a narrow 5-4 majority, the Supreme Court concluded the First Amendment did not allow the federal government to punish you for making a movie critical of a politician. And likewise, that the federal government couldn't ban books. Four justices dissented. Four justices were willing to say the federal government can ban books and uh, can ban movies and presumably could ban books as well. When Hillary Clinton was running for president, she explicitly promised every justice she nominated to the court would pledge to overturn Citizens United. By the way, Hillary Clinton said she would demand of her nominee something you have rightly said that this administration has not demanded of you, which is a commitment on any case as to how you will rule. Democrats have shown no compunction in expecting their nominees to make a promise, here's how I'm going to vote on a pending case, judicial, judicial ethics be damned. Or how about the Second Amendment? We've heard some reference to the Heller decision. Senator from Connecticut yesterday talked about reasonable gun control and gun safety provisions. Well, that, of course, was not what was at stake in the Heller decision. Number one, majority decision in Heller, Justice Scalia's opinion, acknowledges reasonable provisions, things like prohibitions on felons in possession are permissible. Your opinion in the Cantor decision likewise acknowledged that restrictions preventing dangerous criminals from receiving firearms are entirely consistent and permissible under the Second Amendment. But the issue at Heller was much more fundamental. It was whether the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms at all. The vote in Heller was five to four. By a vote of five to four, the majority struck down the District of Columbia's total prohibitions on owning an operative firearm in the District of Columbia. The argument of the four dissenters was not what our Democratic colleagues talk about here. It wasn't some reasonable gun control provisions are OK. That was not the argument of the dissenters. That question, we can actually have a reasonable debate on. Reasonable minds can differ on what the appropriate line should be, what are reasonable laws there. But that was not what was at issue at Heller. The position of the four dissenters was the Second Amendment protects no individual right to keep and bear arms whatsoever, but merely a, quote, collective right of the militia, which is fancy lawyer talk for a non-existent right. Four justices would have ruled that way, one vote away. The consequences of the court concluding that there is no individual right under the First Amendment would mean you and I and every American watching this would lose your Second Amendment right. It would mean the federal government, the state government, the city, 
could ban guns entirely, could make it a criminal offense for any one of us to own a firearm, and no individual American would have any judicially cognizable right to challenge that. That is a radical reading of the Constitution. That is effectively erasing the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. And Hillary Clinton likewise promised in 2016 that every justice she nominated would commit to voting to overturn Heller. They were big on litmus tests. And Joe Biden, although he refuses to answer just about anything about whether or not he's going to pack the court, he did tell the American people the voters don't deserve to know whether he's going to pack the court. Truly a statement of disrespect and contempt for the voters, unusual in our political process. One vote away from the Second Amendment being erased from the Bill of Rights. None of our Democratic colleagues admit that that is their agenda, and yet those are the justices that Democratic presidential nominees are promising they will appoint. Justices who will take away your right to criticize politicians. Justices who will allow censorship. Justices who will allow movies and books to be banned. Justices who will erase the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. And how about religious liberty? Religious liberty is an issue near and dear to a great many of us. The right of every American to live according to your faith, according to your conscience, whatever that faith may, may be. Religious liberty is fundamentally about diversity. It's about respecting diversity that whatever your faith tradition might be, the government is not going to trample on it. Religious liberty cases over and over again have been decided 5-4. The case of Van Orden versus Perry, a case I litigated, dealt with the Ten Commandments monument that stands on the state capitol grounds. It's been there since 1961 in Texas. An individual plaintiff, an atheist, a homeless man, filed a lawsuit seeking to tear down the Ten Commandments. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was decided five to four. Four justices were willing to say, in effect, send in the bulldozers and tear down that monument because you can't gaze on the image of the Ten Commandments on public land. Another case, the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial. This is a memorial erected to the men and women who gave their lives in World War I. It's a lone wh white Latin cross, simple and bare in the middle of the desert. I've been there on Sunrise Rock where it stands. The ACLU filed a lawsuit saying you cannot gaze on the image of a cross on public land, and the ACLU won in the district court. They won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The federal courts ordered that veterans memorial to be covered up with a burlap sack with a chain on the bottom, and then a plywood box. When the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, I represented three million veterans pro bono for free defending that veterans memorial. We won 5-4, and there were four justices prepared to say, tear down the veterans memorial, and under the reasoning that they put forth, they were not far away from saying, bring out the chisels and remove the crosses and the stars of David on the tombstones of the men and women that gave their lives at Arlington Cemetery defending this nation. That is a radical view, and we're one vote away. That is utterly contrary to the text of the First Amendment to the understanding of the First Amendment. When we argued the Ten Commandments case in the U.S. Supreme Court, there was more than a little bit of irony in that, do you know how many times the image of the Ten Commandments appears in the courtroom of the Supreme Court? The answer to that is 43. There are two images of the Ten Commandments carved on the wooden doors as you walk out of the courtroom. You will soon be sitting looking at them. There are 40 images of the Ten Commandments 
on the bronze gates on the both sides of the courtroom. And then, Judge Barrett, when you're sitting at the bench above your left shoulder will be a frieze you know well, a frieze carved into the wall of great lawgivers, one of whom is Moses. He is standing there holding the Ten Commandments, the text of which is legible in Hebrew as he looks down upon the justices, and four justices will, were willing to say, in effect, bring out the sandblasters because we must remove God from the public square. That is a profound threat to our religious liberty, and I would note that it doesn't just extend to public acknowledgments. It also extends to religious liberty. The Little Sisters of the Poor, our Catholic convent of nuns who take oaths of poverty, who devote their lives to caring for the sick, caring for the needy, caring for the elderly. And the Obama administration litigate, litigated against the Little Sisters of the Poor seeking to find them in order to force them to pay for abortion-inducing drugs, among others. It's truly a stunning situation when you have the federal government litigating against nuns. The Supreme Court decided the Hobby Lobby case, another case routinely denounced by Senate Democrats, the Hobby Lobby case concluded that the federal government could not permissibly force a Christian business to violate their faith. It reflected the religious liberty traditions of our country, that you can live according to your faith without the government trampling on it. You know what this body did, I'm sorry to say? Senate Democrats introduced legislation to gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Religious Freedom Restoration Act, when it passed this body, passed with an overwhelming bipartisan majority. Senate Democrats, including Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden and Ted Kennedy, all voted for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Democratic President Bill Clinton signed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And yet, in the wake of the Hobby Lobby decision, this body voted on legislation to just gut the protections for religious liberty. And I'm sorry to say every single Senate Democrat voted to do so. Not a single one, zero, would defend religious liberty. Joe Biden has already pledged if he's elected, he plans to initiate again the attack on the Little Sisters of the Poor. You know, it's interesting, folks in the press like to talk about Pope Francis. And on some issues, Pope Francis has been vocal when it comes to the environment, when it comes to issues concerning immigration, the Pope has been vocal on issues that our Democratic colleagues like and agree with. The press is happy to amplify those views. Somehow missing from that amplification is acknowledgement that when the Pope came to the United States in Washington, he went and visited the Little Sisters of the Poor. Here in D.C., he went to their home here in D.C., and the Vatican explained he did so because he wanted to highlight their cause that the federal government shouldn't be persecuting nuns for living according to their faith. That's what's at stake in these nominations. And you won't hear any of that from the Senate Democrats on this committee. That's why their base is so angry at your nomination, Judge Barrett, because they don't believe you are going to join the radical efforts to erase those fundamental rights from the Bill of Rights. I believe that issue, preserving the Constitution, preserving the Bill of Rights, our fundamental liberties, I believe is the most important issue facing the country in the November elections. And I think for those of us who value those rights, we should take solace in the fact that not a single Democrat is willing even to acknowledge the radical sweep of their agenda, much less defend it. They know it's wildly unpopular. And look, right at the heart of this is a decision many Democrats have made to abandon democracy. You see, most policies, policies like Obamacare, policies like health care, most policies under our constitutional system are meant to be decided by democratically 
elected legislatures. Why? So they can be accountable to the people. So if the voter, voters disagree, they can throw the bums out. But too many Democrats have decided today that democracy is too complicated. It's too hard to actually convince your fellow Americans of the merits of your position. It's much easier just to give it to the courts, find five lawyers in black robes and let them decree the policy outcome you want, which makes your radical base happy, presumably makes the millions, if not billions, in dark money being spent for Democrats happy without actually having to justify it to the American people. Judge Barrett, I'm not going to ask you to respond to any of that. But I do want to shift to a different topic, which is a bit more about you personally, your background. Judge Barrett, do you speak any foreign languages? Once upon a time, I could speak French, but I have fallen woefully out of practice, so please don't ask me to do that right now. <laughs> uh, you can be assured of that, because uh, I had two years of high school French, and, and, and I suspect yours remains much better than mine. Um, how about music? Do you play any instruments? The piano. Do you? How long have you played the piano? Well, I played the piano growing up for 10 years, and now most of my piano playing consists of playing my children's songs for them and supervising their own piano practice. I look forward one day when I have more time to be able to choose some of my own music. Now, do the kids do piano lessons as well? Um, the kids do piano lessons. Some of the older ones who are in high school have gotten so busy with sports and those things that they've stopped, but the younger children do. Our girls are 9 and 12, and we have, they both do piano lessons, and I will say, at least in our household, it is uh, less than voluntary. <laughs> I, you know, one of the things Heidi and I found, particularly the last six months during COVID, which has been an extraordinary crisis, is just with two kids at home, that doing distance learning when schools were shut down was really hard for us with two children. Uh, for you and your husband, you've, you've got seven kids. How, how did, uh, how did y'all manage through the lockdowns and distance learning? What was that like in, in, in the Barrett household? Well, it was a challenging time as it was for every American. Um, our oldest daughter, Emma, who's in college, moved home at that point because uh, she's at Notre Dame. It closed. So Emma obviously could manage her own e-learning and our high school age uh, children, Tess and Vivian, could too. But Jesse and I just tried to take a divide and conquer approach for the younger four. And yeah, it, it was quite challenging, I assure you. One part of your story that I find particularly remarkable and um, that I admire uh, is the decision you made to adopt two children. You and your husband had five biological children and you adopted two more, uh, both uh, of your adopted children are from Haiti. Uh, Haiti is a country that has some of the most cr crushing poverty in the world. My brother-in-law uh, is a missionary in Haiti. And, and actually, Heidi and the girls just got back from Haiti a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was curious if you would share uh, with this committee and with the American people uh, what led you and your husband to make the decision to adopt? It's, it's I think, one of the most loving and, and compassionate decisions any family can make. When Jesse and I were engaged, we met another couple who had adopted, in this instance, it was a couple who had adopted a child with special needs. And then we also met another couple who had adopted a few children internationally. And we decided at that point, while we were engaged, that at some point in the future, we wanted to do that ourselves. Um, and I guess we had imagined initially that we would have whatever biological kids that we had decided to have and then adopt at the end. But after we had our first daughter, Emma, we thought, well, why wait? So I was expecting Tess um, when we went and got Vivian. So she and Tess function, we call them our fraternal twins. They're in the same grade. Um, and it really has enriched our family. Um, immeasurably. And, you know, once we had adopted Vivian at that point, then we made the decision that we definitely wanted to adopt again. And so several years later, John Peter entered our family. 
So your children have been wonderfully well behaved. Um, I think you're an amazing role model for little girls. What advice would you give little girls? Well, what I'm saying is not designed. My, my brother now has left. I was just thinking of what my dad told me before the spelling bee about anything boys can do, girls can do better. <laughs> and since um, my sons are sitting behind me, I'll also say, but boys are great too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome again, Judge. Um, since I have the draw to always follow Senator Cruz, I did want to make uh, one thing clear uh, after listening to that for a half hour, that Joe Biden is Catholic and he is a man of faith. And then I want to turn to something else, and that is that uh, we need a reset here, in my mind, for the people at home, a bit of a reality check. Uh, that this isn't normal right now. Uh, we have to understand that what people are dealing with, that 7.7 .7 million people have gotten this virus, that 214,000 Americans have died. And for people watching at home and wondering what we're all doing in this room right now, and maybe you're home because you lost your job, or maybe you got your kids crawling all over your couch right now, uh, maybe you're trying to teach your first grader how to do a mute button to go to school. Um, or maybe you've got a small business um, that you had to close down or that's struggling. We should be doing something else right now. We shouldn't be doing this. We should be passing coronavirus relief like the House just did, which was a significant bill that would have been a big help. And I think people have to know that right now. And whether you're Democrat, Independent, or Republican. And that's why I started out yesterday by telling people that they need to vote. Number two, some of my colleagues throughout this hearing on the other side have been kind of portraying the job uh, that the uh, judge is before us on as being some kind of ivory tower exercise. I think one of my uh, friends called it uh, related that you'd be dealing with the dormant commerce clause. Well, I'm sure that might be true, but we also know that this is the highest court in the land, that the decisions of this court have a real impact on people. And I appreciate a judge that you said that you didn't want to be a queen. I actually wouldn't mind being a queen around here, <laughs> if the truth be known. I, I wouldn't mind doing it and kind of a benevolent queen and making decisions so we could get things done. Um, but. Uh, you said you wouldn't let your views influence you and the like, but the truth is the Supreme Court rulings, they rule people's lives. They decide if people can get married. They decide what schools they can go to. They decide if they could even have access to contraception. All of these things matter. So I wanna make that clear. And the third reset here that I think we need to have is that this hearing is not normal, uh, it is a sham, it is a rush to put in a justice. The last time that we had a vacancy so close to an election was when Abraham Lincoln was president. And he made the wise decision to wait until after the election. The last time we lost a justice so close to an election. That's what he did. Today, we are 21 days from the election. People are voting. Millions of people have already cast their ballots. And I go uh, to the words of Senator McConnell. The last time we had a situation in election year, he said, the American people should have a voice in the selection of their next Supreme Court justice. Therefore, this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president. That set the precedent that so many of you have embraced or at least you did a few years ago, and that is that in an election year, the people choose the president, and then the president nominates the justice. So why is this happening? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, this guy, <laughs> our president, he is the one that decided to plop a Supreme Court nomination in the middle of an election when people's health care is on the line with a case before the court on November 10th. So let's see what he said about the Supreme Court. Well, one of President Trump's campaign promises in 2015 was that his judicial appointments 
will do the right thing on Obamacare. You can see it right here. And in fact, Judge, just one day after you were nominated, this is like a few weeks ago, he said also on Twitter that it would be a big win if the Supreme Court strikes down the health law. So, Judge, my first question, do you think we should take the president at his word when he says his nominee will do the right thing and overturn the Affordable Care Act? Senator Klobuchar, um, I can't really speak to what the president has said on Twitter. Um, he hasn't said any of that to me. And what I can tell you, um, as I have told your colleagues earlier today, is that no one has elicited from me any commitment in a case or even brought up a commitment in the case. I am 100% committed to judicial independence from political pressure. So whatever people's you know, party platforms may be or campaign promises may be, the reason why judges have life tenure is to insulate them from those pressures. Mm -hmm. So I take my oath seriously to follow the law. And you know, I, I have not pre-committed, nor would I pre-commit to decide a case any particular way. Okay. And I think this life tenure, this idea that you have just for everyone out there a job for life, makes this even more important uh, for us to consider where you might be. And I know you have not said how you would re rule on this case uh, that's coming up right after the election, uh, where the president had said it would be a big win if the Supreme Court strikes down the law. But you have directly criticized Justice Roberts in an article in my own state, in one of uh, the Minnesota Law School journals. It was in 2017. It was the same year you became a judge. And when Roberts writes the opinion to uphold the Affordable Care Act, you said he, quote, pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. Is that correct? Senator Klobuchar, I just want to clarify, is this the constitutional commentary publication that you and I discussed? Yes, it I is. The, if okay. that's, it is, but it's still a Minnesota, no, it, University of Minnesota law. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be sure because yep. I hadn't mm -hmm. published in the Minnesota I just, law. Review. Again, did you ask that question? Did you say that, that he pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. Um, one thing I want to clarify is you said that I criticized, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, and I don't attack people, just ideas. So okay. that was just designed to, to make a comment about his reasoning in that case, which, I've, as I've said before, is consistent with the way the majority opinion characterized it as the less plausible reading of the statute. Okay, so you didn't agree with his reasoning in the case that upheld the Affordable Care Act? What I said, and was this King versus Burwell or NFIB versus Sebelius? That was NFIB versus Sebelius. Sebelius. I'll get to King versus Burwell in a second. Okay. Um, what I said with respect to NFIB versus Sebelius is that the interpretation that the majority adopted, construing the mandate to be a tax rather than a penalty, was not the most natural reading of the statute. But it was no still the comment. reading that Justice Roberts got to. Now, you also criticized, as you pointed out by bringing up King v. Burwell, another case where the court ruled in favor of the health law. This was in a 2015 uh, National Public Radio interview. And you acknowledged that uh, the result of people being able to uh, keep uh, their subsidies under the Affordable Care Act uh, was a, would help millions of Americans, yet you praised the dissent by Justice Scalia, saying the dissent had, quote, the better of the legal argument. Is that correct? I did say that, yes. Okay, so then would you rule, have ruled the same way and voted with Justice Scalia? Well, Senator Klobuchar, um, one of the uh, plus sides or the upsides of being an academic is that you can speak for yourself, that a professor professes and can opine, but it's very different than the judicial decision-making process. So it's difficult for me to say how I would have decided that case if I had to go through the whole process of judicial decision-making that I was describing this morning. Now, having been a judge for three years, I can say I appreciate greatly the distinctions between academic writing or academic speaking and judicial decision making, um, such that a judge might look at an academic and say, easy for you to say, mm -hmm. because you're not on a multi-member court. 
you're not constrained by stare decisis. Um, you don't have real parties in front of you consulting with litigants, consulting with your clerks. Kind of Yes. It's just a different process. I'm just, I viewed this one so interestingly because you were commenting on the public policy result, which you and my colleagues on the Republican side have said this shouldn't be about public policy. And you said, okay, that's okay. But then you were really clear on your legal outcome in terms of your view of whose side you were on. You were on Scalia's side. And of course, that was a side uh, to not uphold the Affordable Care Act. Uh, which would have been um, uh, kicked millions of people off their health care in effect because they would have lost their subsidies. And I just see this as interesting because of this uh, kind of dichotomy they're trying to make between policy and legal. And my view is that legal decisions affect policy. I mean, I'm looking at people in my state uh, that will deal with this if the Affordable Care Act is struck down. Elijah from St. Paul, who was born with cerebral palsy, uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, he is now 16 and is a proud Boy Scout. Casey, whose brother lives in Alexandria, and he has chronic kidney failure, and he needs a transplant. Uh, without the ACA, um, that would be that. Or Burnett from the suburbs of St. Paul, whose daughter has multiple sclerosis, depends on benefits under the ACA. Liliana of Fridley, who has a 21-year-old son with autism, and needs her children to be able to stay on her insurance until she's 26. Melanie, a senior from Duluth who's being treated for ovarian cancer and needs access to the Affordable Care Act. So my point is that these are real world situations. And so I get that you're not saying how you'd rule on these cases. So what does that leave us with here to try to figure out what kind of judge you would be? And I was thinking last night of when I was growing up we would go up to northern Minnesota. And we uh, didn't have a cabin, but we had friends that did. And we would go on these walks in the woods uh, with my mom. And she loved to show all the tracks on that path, uh, whether they were uh, deer tracks, and she'd have us figure out what they were, or elk, or maybe even a bear. And we would follow these tracks down that path. And you'd always think, is there going to be a deer around the corner that we're going to see? And very rarely was there one but we would follow the tracks. And so when I look at your record, I just keep following the tracks. That's what I've got to do. And so when I follow the tracks, this is what I see. You consider Justice Scalia, one of the most conservative judges in the history of the Supreme Court, as your mentor. You criticize the decision written by Justice Roberts upholding the Affordable Care Act. That is, to me, one big track. Even if you didn't consider yourself criticizing him personally, you criticized uh, the reasoning. You then said in another case about the Affordable Care Act uh, that you would, uh, that you liked the legal reasoning, that he had the better legal argument, that Justice Scalia had the better legal argument. Uh, you have signed your name to a public statement featured in an ad, a paid ad, that called for an end to what it called, the ad called, the barbaric legacy of Roe v. Wade, which ran on the anniversary of the 1973 Supreme Court decision. You disagreed with longstanding precedent on gun safety, which said that felons shouldn't be able to get guns, something that was pretty important to me uh, when I had my old job in law enforcement. This is something that Senator Durbin asked you about. You suggested that you agree with the dissent in the marriage equality case, Obergefell, that it wasn't the role of the court to decide that same-sex couples had the right to be married. I think this was in a lecture you gave where you said uh, the dissent's view was that it wasn't for the court to decide. They could, people could lobby in state legislatures. And all this takes me to one point as I follow those tracks down that path. And it takes me to this point where I believe, and I think the American people have to understand, that you would be the polar opposite of Justice Ginsburg. She and Justice Scalia were friends, yes. But she never embraced his legal philosophy. Um, so that is what concerns me. And I want to turn to an area that, where I think Justice Ginsburg, whose seat we are considering you for, was truly a hero. And that was the area of voting rights. 
and that was the area of elections. Um, I think that, what did the president say here? He said, September 23rd, 2020, I think this, he means the election, will end up in the Supreme Court. And I think it's very important that we have nine justices. <laughs> I don't think how much clearer we can be. And as I said yesterday, I do not for a minute concede that this election is gonna end up in the Supreme Court because people are voting in droves as we speak. But that is what is on the mind of the man who nominated you for this job. Then he said on September 29th of 2020, I think I'm counting on them, he meant the court, to look at the ballots. Definitely. So, um, I know you said earlier in uh, questions from Senator Leahy that you are not gonna commit to whether or not you are going to recuse yourself uh, for any, any kind of an election case. But I do wanna point out uh, that as the president has said these things, and as he has nominated you, that people are voting right now. They are voting, as I said, in droves. Um, do you know how many states or people are voting right now, Judge? I think one of my colleagues know. said it. Earlier. I don't know. It's uh, more than 40 states. People are voting right now as we speak. I think something like nine million votes have been cast. Do you think it is faithful to our democratic principles to fill a Supreme Court vacancy this close to an election when people are still voting? Senator Klobuchar, I think that is a question for the political branches. Okay. Um, that's, that's your right to answer in that way. Um, beyond this immediate election, I want to turn to the Supreme Court's critical role uh, when it comes to the right to vote, this area where Justice Ginsburg was such a champion. Um, Senator Durbin went over your dissent at length in Cantor v. Barr, uh, where you drew a distinction between individual rights and civic rights. Uh, and you wrote that historically, uh, felons should be disqualified from exercising certain rights, like the right to vote and to serve on juries. Um, so my question is this, actually this next line where you said, these rights belonged only to virtuous citizens. Um, what does that mean? Senator, I would need to look at the article to clarify, but as I'm sitting here, I don't think I said felons should lose voting rights. I think what I was talking about is that Could. 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that. But it wasn't an article, just to be clear, right? This was, uh, this is your dissent. Oh, my, sorry, my dissent. Yeah, I think it's your dissent in, in Cantor. Cantor v. Yes, you're right. And it says felons could be disqualified from exercising certain rights, like the rights to vote and serve on juries. But apart from that clause, you said these rights belong only to virtuous citizens. That's um, what I'm trying to understand what that means. So the argument in the case, um, those who were challenging Heller and those who were arguing on the side of the government in the Cantor case is that the, seventh, the Second Amendment is a civic right. Um, and that is how the Supreme Court itself uh, framed the debate as a distinction between civic rights and individual rights, with voting being a civic right and in literature, you know, in the historical literature, that was, which was at play in that case. Okay, but how would you gone. define the word virtuous? Because it doesn't appear in the Constitution. Well, Senator, I'm just trying to know what that means because we're, uh, we're living at a time where a lot of people are having their voting rights taken away from them. So what's virtuous? Okay, well, Senator, I want to be clear that that is not in the opinion designed to denigrate the right to vote, which is fundamental. Mm -hmm. The distinction between civic and individual rights is one that's present in the court's decisions, and it has to do with a kind of a jurisprudential view of what rights are. And the virtuous citizenry idea is a historical and jurisprudential one. It certainly does not mean that I think that anybody gets a measure of virtue and whether they're good or not and whether they're allowed to vote. That's okay. not what I said. Okay, now let me ask you this in a different way because now let's go to the real world here. So in Justice Ginsburg's dissent in Shelby, 
uh, where a 5-4 court struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. She described the right to vote as a fundamental right in our democratic system. And I assume you agree with this, because you just said that not, that's not good to her dissent. You agree with the concept that it's a fundamental right, because you just As I just said, said yeah, the court has tr repeatedly, repeatedly said it was Okay, so she also wrote in her dissent that the Constitution uses the words right to vote in five separate places, the 14th, 15th, 19th, 24th, and 26th Amendments. Each of these amendments, this is still her talking, not me, each of these amendments contains the same broad empowerment of Congress to enact appropriate legislation to enforce the protected right. The implication is unmistakable. Under our constitutional structure, Congress holds the lead reign in making the right to vote equally real for all U.S. citizens. Do you agree with Justice Ginsburg's conclusion that the Constitution clearly empowers Congress to protect the right to vote? Well, Senator, that would be eliciting an opinion from me on whether the dissent or the majority was right in Shelby County, and I can't express a view on that, as I've said, because it would be inconsistent with the judicial rule. Okay, so here's my problem. So you go out of your way in the case that uh, Dick Durbin was discussing to make this distinction between voting rights and gun rights, but now you won't <laughs> say whether or not you agree with Ginsburg. And so my view is just based, again, following those tracks on this case, uh, that you are most likely with the majority, but I know you're not gonna answer this, but what I do want you to know is this, and this is where it gets interesting because of what Justice Ginsburg uh, predicted in that dissent. Um, according to the Brennan Center, over 20 states since that case came out um, that withdrew, that took away part of the protections from the Voting Rights Act over 20 states have now made more restrictive voting laws than they did before that case. Doesn't that suggest to you that Justice Ginsburg had the better of the argument uh, when she wrote that throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet? Do you think that that's true? And I mean, it seems to me that the proof is in the pudding. Like basically, this rainstorm that she said would come has come with all these states, including a number of them uh, that my colleagues over there represent have enacted stricter laws. Has it happened? Um, Senator Klobuchar, I want to clarify. You said I was answering Senator Durbin's questions about the Second Amendment, but refusing to answer yours. And so I just wanted to clarify that I have written Cantor versus Barr, and so that's why I was talking about it. But since I didn't write Shelby, I can't really talk about it. So anything that I've written about or talked about, I would be happy to answer your questions. Okay. All right. Um, but again, it just seems to me you are out of your way in that case. And this is a case that is so real for so many people right now. Um, and that while you can say it's a fundamental right, the issue is that this case and the Voting Rights Act are so key, and let me, let me just say why. We're talking about the entire foundation of our democracy here. For centuries, Americans have fought and died to protect the right to vote. And so what matters is not just what you say about it's being fundamental, it's what you do. States like South Carolina, Texas, North Carolina, Louisiana, Tennessee have policies that make it harder for people to vote. And it's a real world thing before the Supreme Court. In fact, back in May, when voters in Wisconsin were standing in line in the middle of a pandemic, in homemade masks, in garbage bags, in the middle of a rainstorm, just to exercise their right to vote, 70 of them got COVID, because we didn't know enough about it back then, because the president had told us what he knew, and we didn't know enough to protect those voters. So it ends up at the Supreme Court. What did Justice Ginsburg do? When the Republican appointed majority on the court ruled that voters in Wisconsin could not have more time to get their ballots in during the pandemic, she called them out in her dissent, in her blueprint for the future, and she said the majority opinion boggled the mind. So what boggles my mind? Well, two weeks ago, the US Supreme Court reinstated the South Carolina report requirement that mail-in ballots must have witness signatures. In the middle of a pandemic, you gotta go and get a witness. In Texas, Republicans have argued that the pandemic wasn't a good enough reason to let people under age 
65 vote by mail, despite the fact that over 42,000 Americans under 65 have died from COVID. And the governor is right now is forcing that state to have only one ballot box per county, including in Harris County, where there are 4.7 million people. And for those of you that thought a judge took care of it a few days ago, he did. But then yesterday, three Trump appointed judges came in and reversed that. So we're back to one ballot box for people to drop their ballots off in a county of 4.7 million people. In Tennessee, Republicans have tried to prevent ballot drop boxes. I know we had the Secretary of State as one of our witnesses at a rules committee hearing, and they have argued in court that COVID-19 is not a valid excuse to vote by mail. In North Carolina, the Supreme Court struck down a core component of the Voting Rights Act. What happened? Well, states like North Carolina passed laws that were so egregious to make it harder to vote that the Fourth Circuit struck down their law and noted that it targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. So that is what the stakes are. And that is why not having Justice Ginsburg on the court right now is so frightening to so many Americans out there. And that is why we are asking you these questions about voting. So let me just turn to another election question, gerrymandering. In 2015, Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion in Arizona State Legislature for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, holding that it was constitutional for the people of Arizona to amend the state constitution to establish an independent redistricting commission. Because of this case and Justice Ginsburg's opinion, many argue now that Arizona has fairer electoral maps. The decision was 5-4. Here's your example. And now Justice Ginsburg and Justice Kennedy are no longer on the court. My question is this, must state legislatures abide by their own state's constitution when exercising their authority under the elections clause? Senator Klobuchar, that would be eliciting an opinion from me about whether I agreed or disagreed with the result in that case. Okay, and is it constitutional opinion? for voters to amend a state constitution to establish specific processes for elections like the voters in Arizona did to stop gerrymandering? Again, you're asking me for a view on that particular case, and Justice Ginsburg herself gave the most famous articulation of the principle that constrains me from doing so, which is no hints, forecasts, or previews. So I can't express a view on precedent or on how I would decide any question that was provoked by the application of that precedent to a later case. Okay, last week a contractor from outside of my state of Minnesota started recruiting poll watchers with special forces experience. Mm -hmm. to protect polling locations in my state. This was clear voter intimidation. Similar efforts are going on around the country, uh, solicited by President Trump's false claims of massive voter fraud, something that, by the way, many Republican leaders, including Michael Steele, the former head of the Republican Party, including Tom Ridge, including Governor Kasich, including sitting Senator Romney, have made very clear is not true. So as a result of his claims, people are trying to get poll watchers, special forces people to go to the polls. Judge Barrett, under federal law, is it illegal to intimidate voters at the polls? Senator Klobuchar, I can't characterize the facts in a hypothetical situation, and I can't apply the law to a hypothetical set of facts. I can only decide cases as they come to me, litigated by parties on a full record after fully engaging precedent, talking to colleagues, writing an opinion. And so I can't answer questions like okay, that. Okay, well, I'll make, I'll make it easier. 18 U.S.C. 594 outlaws anyone who intimidates, threatens, coerces, or attempts to intimidate, threaten, or coerce any other person for the purpose of interfering with the right of such other person to vote. This is a law that has been on the books for decades. Do you think a reasonable person would feel intimidated by the president, presence of armed civilian groups at the polls? Senator Klobuchar, you know, that is eliciting, I'm not sure whether to say it's eliciting a legal opinion from me because the reasonable person standard, as you know, is one common in the law or just an opinion as a citizen, but it's not something really that's appropriate for me to comment on. Okay. 
Um, here's one that I think is a uh, selection of election uh, electoral college electors. Uh, you know that each state has laws uh, that dictate how electoral college electors are selected. Uh, Judge Barrett, in 1932, the Supreme Court in Smiley v. Home, a case involving my state, ruled that the Minnesota State Legislature could not change election rules unilaterally. Um, do you agree that the unanimous opinion in Smiley v. Home, which has never been questioned by any other Supreme Court case, is settled law? Um, well, I'll say two things about that. First of all, I was not aware of that case, so you've taught me okay. something. But secondly, I can't comment on the precedent, give thumbs up or thumbs down in Justice Kagan's words. Okay, well why don't we end there with precedent. I think that's a good way to end here. Um, so you wrote in your 2013 Texas Law Review article uh, that you tend to agree with the view that when a justice's best understanding of the Constitution conflicts with Supreme Court precedent or case law, it is, quote, more legitimate for her to follow her preferred view rather than apply the precedent. And I want to run through a few examples. So Brown v. Board of Education, as we know, that holds that the 14th Amendment prohibits states from segregating schools on the basis of race. So uh, is that precedent? Um, yes. That can't be overruled. Well, that is precedent. Um, mm -hmm. And as I think I said in that same article, it's super precedent. People consider it to be on that very small list of things that are so widely established and agreed upon by everyone, mm -hmm. calls for its overruling simply don't exist. Okay. Well, you also separately acknowledge that in uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the Supreme Court's controlling opinion talked about in the reliance interests on Roe v. Wade, which it treated in that case as super precedent. Is Roe a super precedent? How would you define super precedent? I, I, I actually, I might have thought someday I'd be sitting in that chair. I'm not. I'm up here, so I'm asking okay, you. Okay. Well, people so. use super precedent differently. Okay. The way that it's used in the scholarship and the way that I was using it in the article that you're reading from was to define cases that are so well settled that no political actors and no people seriously push for their overruling. And I'm answering a lot of questions about Roe, which I think indicates that Roe doesn't fall in that category. And scholars across the spectrum say that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. But descriptively, it does mean that it's a case, not a case that everyone has accepted and doesn't call for its overruling. I don't okay, think so I've here's, what's, here's what's interesting to me. You said that Brown is, and I know my time is running out, is a super precedent. That's something uh, the Supreme Court has not even said, but you have said that. So if you say that, why won't you say that about Roe v. Wade, a case that the court's controlling opinion in that Planned Parenthood v. Casey case has described as a super precedent. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, well, Senator, I can just give you the same answer that I just did. I'm using a term in that article that is from the scholarly literature. It's actually one that was developed by scholars who are, you know, certainly not conservative scholars who take a more progressive approach to the Constitution. And again, you know, as as Richard Fallon from Harvard said, Roe is not a super precedent because calls for its overruling have never ceased, but that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. It just means that it doesn't fall on the small handful of cases like Marbury versus Madison and Brown versus the board that no one questions anymore. Is United States for Virginia military, is that super precedent? Senator Klobuchar, if you continue to ask questions about super precedents that aren't on the list of the super precedents that I discussed in the article that are well acknowledged in the constitutional law literature, every time you ask the question, I will have to say that I can't grade it. Okay. Well, I am then left with looking at the tracks of your record and where it leads the American people. And I think it leads us to a place that's going to have severe repercussions for them. Thank you. Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, welcome back. I'm, I mean this as good news, but it might not feel like it after me. You're half done for today. <laughs> uh, I'm 11th of 22. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I begin my questioning, I'd like to ask unanimous qu consent to admit into the record a letter from Alan Gelzo, the historian at Princeton, uh, who has written a letter to the committee in response to some, some of Senator Harris's claims about uh, the history of uh, Supreme Court vacancies going back to the Civil War. Without objection. Thank you. 
Judge, um, you have said that the meaning of law doesn't change with time, um, and you've said that's very important. Can you unpack for us why it's so important that the meaning of a law doesn't change with time? Sure, because the law stays the same until it is lawfully changed. And if we're talking about a law that has been um, enacted by the people's representatives, you know, or gone through the process of constitutional amendment or constitutional ratification, it must go through the lawfully prescribed process before it's changed. So Article 5 in the context of the Constitution or bicameralism and presentment in the context of statutes. And it's not up to judges to short circuit that process by updating the law. That's, that's your job. But laws clearly are written in a context and then the things, the circumstances to which those laws have applied would change. Does the Fourth Amendment have nothing to say about cell phones? Unreasonable search and seizure was, was obviously not written at a time when they had imagined mobile technological devices that addicted our kids. Uh, does the Fourth right. Amendment have nothing to say about cell phones? No, the Fourth Amendment, so um, the Constitution, one reason why it's the longest lasting written Constitution in the world is because it's written at a level of generality that's specific enough to protect rights, but general enough to be lasting. So that, you know, when you're talking about the constable banging at your door in, you know, 1791 um, as a search or seizure, now we can apply it as the court did in Carpenter versus the United States to cell phones. So the Fourth Amendment is a principle. You know, it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, but it doesn't catalog the instances in which an unreasonable search or seizure could take place. So you take that principle and then you apply it to modern technology like cell phones or you know, what if technological advances enable someone with Superman x-ray vision to simply see in your house? You know, is that, so there's no need to knock on the door and go in. Well, I think that could still be analyzed under the Fourth Amendment. So I think this is a useful place to explain to the American people again what originalism is and why it's a mistake to view it as a Republican position. I think that originalism is a part of a jurisprudential debate. It's not a part of a policy continuum between Republicans and Democrats. I think it's something that is useful for everybody who believes that three branches of government have two that are political and one that is not. So maybe it's useful to just kind of back up and say, when you define yourself as an originalist, what does that mean? And then how is it going to relate to that distinction between the principles that are timeless but the applications that are clearly going to change by circumstance? Right. So originalism means that you treat the Constitution as law because it commits these texts to writing. And in interpreting that law, you interpret it in accord with the meaning that people would have understood it to have at the time that it was ratified. And the reason that you do that is because otherwise, well, as I said, the law stays the same until it's lawfully changed. Otherwise, judges would be in the constitutional convention business of updating the law rather than allowing the people to take control of that. Now, in the case of the Constitution, as I said with the Fourth Amendment, many of its principles are more general, unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, free speech, those are things that have to be identified or fleshed out or applied over time. So the fact that there wasn't, you know, the internet or computers or blogs um, in 1791 doesn't mean that the First Amendment's free speech clause couldn't apply to those things now. It enshrines a principle, and we understand the principle as it was at the time, but then it's capable of being applied to new circumstances. So when, when you um, define yourself as an originalist, what are the other schools of thought that are adjacent to it? And how do you think about the debates among those with other people that are now with you on the, the Seventh Circuit, for instance? Sure. Well, Senator Sass, I think one thing that it's worth pointing out is that in the academy, in any event where I've spent a large portion of my career, Originalism is not necessarily a conservative idea. There is a whole school of thought, and so originalists are now a very diverse lot. And there is a school of originalism that's more of a progressive originalism and is very committed to uh, keeping the Constitution's meaning, just interpreting text the way all originalists do to say that it was 
has the meaning that it had at the time that it was ratified, but they tend to read it at a higher level of generality. So all originalists don't necessarily agree. And in fact, there's an advocacy group called the Constitutional Constitution Accountability Center, which has routinely filed briefs in the Supreme Court that calls itself, you know, it, it, it writes briefs in support of originalism, but taking it from more progressive standpoint. So I don't think it's, I think probably people think, oh, it's only who are conservatives who are originalists, but actually it's a more widely accepted view than that. Um, I think that if you think about different strains of approaching constitutional text, Originalism is one. All judges and justices take account of history and the original meaning. It's just that some weight it differently, whereas originalists would give it dispositive weight when it's discernible. Other approaches to constitutional interpretation may take a more pragmatic view and say in some instances, well, that may have been the historical meaning, but that's an uncomfortable fit for current circumstances, so we will um, tweak it a little bit to adjust it to fit these circumstances, that situation. Sometimes it's called living constitutionalism, you know, that the Constitution can evolve and change over time. Sometimes it's called like a more pragmatic constitutionalism. So I just, I wanna make sure we, we establish this fact clearly together, because one of the things that I think is really unhelpful for the American people when they see hearings like this over the last 20 years is there is an assumption that those of us who've advocated for you over the course of the last three years must be doing it because we know something about your policy views, and we've seen the beautiful mind conspiracy theory charts, for instance, that this is about specific outcomes that people want. What I want is to have a judge who doesn't want to take away the job of a, legislator that's account a legislature that's accountable to the people. What I want is to be sure that the two political branches that are accountable to the people because they can hire and fire us are the places where policy decisions are made. So what you're saying is in the legal academy, there are people who agree with you on originalism as a broad philosophical school and yet would come out very different places on the outcomes of particular policy decisions. That is what I'm saying. So on the Notre Dame Law Faculty, uh, when you were up for the vacancy on the Seventh Circuit three years ago, the Notre Dame Law Faculty, as I understand, the letter that we got from them here, uh, had people unanimously recommend you across a faculty, and I would assume there's a pretty wide view of policy on, on the law, Notre Dame Law Faculty. There is. And so people can affirm that you know what the job of a judge is. You have the judicial temperament and modesty and humility about the calling, and they're comfortable with you, even though they don't think they might agree with every policy view that you have before you put on your robe. Um, I, I hope that is what people think of me, because that's what I've always striven to do, and certainly in my time as a judge. I, my job, my boss, is the rule of law, not imposing my policy preferences. So can you tell us what the black robe is about? Why do judges in our system wear robes? Well. Judges in our system wear black robes, and they started wearing black robes actually because Chief Justice John Marshall started the practice. In the beginning, justices used to wear colorful robes that identified them with the schools that they graduated from. And John Marshall, at his investiture, decided to wear, decided to wear a simple black robe. And pretty soon the other justices followed suit, and now all judges do it. And I think the black robe shows that justice is blind, we all dress the same, and I think it shows that once we put it on, we are standing united symbolically, speaking in the name of the law, not in speaking, of our, speaking for ourselves as individuals. Thank you. You, uh, in your questioning from Chairman Graham this morning, talked a little bit about the process of judicial decision making. And you started with four steps and then added a fifth and then I think added a <laughs> sixth. Um, because it turns out being a reactive branch is really reactive. Can you explain what it means that the judiciary, the Article III branch, is reactive? So Article III of the Constitution says that courts can hear cases or controversies. So a judge can't walk in one day and say, ah, I feel like you know, visiting the question of health care and telling people what I think. We can't even think about the law or how it would apply until litigants bring a real live case with real live parties and a real live dispute before us. And the material that we have to, to, de to de decide that dispute is what comes from you. It's the statutes that you pass. We don't get to come up with the policies and see our wishes become part of the United States Code. 
So we react to the litigants who bring cases before us, and we apply the laws that you make. And, and what are the steps inside those Article III courts before it would ever get to a situation where the Supreme Court hears cases? What, what, what is unique about the Supreme Court? So the Supreme Court obviously sits atop the federal um, hierarchy of the judiciary. And the Supreme Court, um, so my court now, the Seventh Circuit, every time someone loses in the district courts, which are the trial courts, they can appeal. And we take every single appeal that comes. The Supreme Court works differently. Um, the Supreme Court takes cases when it needs to. Most frequently, the reason it takes them is to resolve a division among the courts of appeal or the state Supreme Courts. The Supreme Court gets about 8,000 petitions a year, and they hear about 80 cases a year. So it's discretionary um, what cases to take. So it's reactive, it's a reactive branch, and it's after a process where there's a statute, it's been challenged, there are active cases, and then it works its way up to the court. But when the justices decline to take a case, what are they saying? What are they, they're saying you don't matter and you don't have a right to appeal? What, what, are they, what are they saying to the litigants in a case when they decline to grant cert? They're not expressing any view on the merits. They're simply saying, this isn't a case that we're going to put on our docket for certiorari because the court has obviously limited time and limited resources. And so it selects the cases where it's resolving a division, for example, in the courts or some other question on which of national importance on which the Supreme Court needs to step in. Um, there has been a lot of discussion uh, in some of the questioning earlier this morning implicitly about standing. Can you just e explain what standing is so that the American people understand it? Yes. So this dovetails with your question about the judiciary being a reactive branch. So as I said, um, the Constitution gives the courts, the federal courts, the power only to decide actual live cases and controversies. So not only can we wake up one morning and volunteer our views, um, because the Constitution prohibits us from giving what are called advisory opinions. We can't just dispense advice or give our views on the law, which is one reason why I'm not able to answer some of the questions being asked today. A litigant can't get us to give an advisory opinion or elicit a view unless the litigant actually has a real case. Um, so you, Senator Sass, couldn't walk into court and file a lawsuit and just ask me to give my advice on one's, whether some particular statute was constitutional. I can only decide that question if there is an actual dispute about it. You mentioned living constitutionalism a little bit ago. Um, I think Chief Justice Warren had a much broader view of standing than some of the folks that have influenced your thinking and writing. Can you walk us through a little bit of the history of the court's view of standing over the last few decades? Um, so are you thinking about how broadly, like when a plaintiff has suffered an injury or that's a concrete injury? Right. So, so Senator Sass, if, if you came into court and you were objecting um, to a particular statute and you didn't like a particular statute, you would have to actually suffer what's called a concrete injury. So. The Supreme Court a few terms ago in a case called Spokio said that a plaintiff lacks a concrete injury if the harm isn't, um, let's see, to use words the American people might understand, palpable. Like it can't just be a procedural injury or something that didn't actually have real consequence or real effect on the litigant. Um, I think that the dispute about standing, you know, or the difficult thing in deciding questions of standing and the Spokio opinion lays this out, is deciding when an injury is concrete and courts can hear it, or when that injury is more abstract and designed to elicit an advisory opinion from the court. You said in your opening comments yesterday that it is not the responsibility of the courts to right every wrong in society. I want to ask you a question about it, but first, can you just remind us what your view is there? Why did you say that? Um, so I think probably what I was getting at there, although I have to say, Senator Staff, so much has happened since I gave the opening statement yesterday. Um, courts, because they are reactive, can't reach out to right wrongs that don't come to them in the, case, in, in the situation of a case or controversy. And then even if they come to courts in the, in the situation of a case or controversy that a court can legitimately decide, we're not free to just resolve it like Solomon in the way that we think is wisest. Um, so we are only free to 
address wrongs and decide cases in accordance with democratically elected law. So the policy making is yours to do, and it is only if you have enacted policies that enable us to right a wrong that we can do so. So you still said, though, that you view it as some of your responsibility on the Seventh Circuit to write every opinion, every judgment, from the standpoint of the losing party. Explain to us why you take that perspective of wanting the losing party to understand the law and the argument. So I just write the opinion as I would write the opinion. Um, and then after I write the opinion, I read it from the perspective of the losing party because I want to make sure that like I said earlier, it, it's a check on me to make sure that if I try to put my emotions or my preferences on the other side, that I can see that it's been a balance just strictly driven by legal analysis. I also want to make sure that the language in it is very respectful to the party who will ultimately be disappointed. Um, I don't know if is that responsive to... Yeah, because I, why I want to ask this is because I'm, I'm in my fifth year here, or a little over five years, and I'm on my fourth year on this committee, and uh, pretty much you're, you're the third Supreme Court nominee to come before the committee during that time, and we've had uh, dozens of appellate court nominees, and I've been amazed how many times the argument is American people be really, really scared. The person sitting before us obviously hates people and wants them wants sick people to die and not have health care coverage. That's, that's sort of an argument that's routine around here. It's been focus grouped, obviously, um, as a good way to demonize uh, nominees to the court and hopefully drive outcomes in elections, I guess. I, I don't understand it. I think it's terribly destructive of the civic health. And yet, I think about it from the standpoint of thoughtful, well-meaning Nebraska Democrats who hear that, and they know I have a different policy view than they might on getting to portability and health care so people can keep their health insurance across job and geographic change, because that's actually what's driving uninsurance in America over the last few decades. It's not primarily uh, health status. It's not primarily uh, pre-existing conditions or socioeconomics. The number one driver of uninsurance in American public life uh, is that we change jobs a lot more frequently than we used to. And so I have a different policy solution of how we would get to portability and health care than a lot of my Democratic colleagues. But those are policy disputes about a modern economy where people move around a lot, both geographically and in terms of employer-sponsored uh, health insurance relationships. Those contracts are not really the things that a nominee coming before the court is supposed to opine on, because I don't have any idea what your views are on health care, but I know that it's not really the job of a judge to reflect on those things. And so I want to be sure that folks who hear this hearing, and at the end of the process, they can have trust that you're not a person who really wishes secretly um, you could be the queen of all health care and decide all these issues. And so when you write your opinion, it seems to me that one of the really humble things you're doing is you're saying, in every case that's come before me on the Seventh Circuit, I want to write this opinion from the standpoint of the losing party to understand what was the question before the court today and how did the court rule on that specific narrow thing. Because ultimately, I think you would believe, given uh, your jurisprudential tradition uh, and given your view of judicial modesty and humility and your Scalia mentorship, my guess is there are times when you rule in cases where you go home at night and you take off your robe and you think the outcome is not the outcome you wish had been the case, but it wasn't your job to ultimately decide all policy in American life. It was to decide the specific question before you. And it seems to me the humble, uh, empathetic way that you write those opinions is really important. It's also, it should be in the interest of public trust and American people uh, who might listen to a lot of the demagoguery that implies that really you're just secretly a policy actor. It should be pretty comforting to them that except for probably Justice Breyer, um, you've written more than, I think, than anybody who's currently on the court. So people can actually know your juris jurisprudential views and how you're going to approach cases uh, when you get on the court because you've written a ton. There's a reason why the Notre Dame faculty, regardless of their policy positions, wrote a letter to this committee universally recommending you. There's a reason why year after year on the Notre Dame law faculty, you were professor of the year because students, regardless of their policy views, thought you were really good at explaining what the job of a judge is and what the purpose of Article Three in our constitutional system is. And as somebody who worries a lot about institutional trust um, and a lot of the attacks that we see on the court, 
a lot of the attempts we see in this uh, language about potentially court packing, um, if, if we would go to 11 or 13 or 15 or you know, a Venezuelan style 47 person court over the next couple of election cycles, that undermining, that delegitimizing of the courts should have as its antidote the fact that you have written a ton about what you think the job of a judge is and people can actually understand it. And I would hope that that's some of what this hearing would try to unpack. Um, I am nearly out of time and I think the chairman is gonna, gonna take away my, my slot. So I wanna, I wanna ask one final thing. Um, tell us about the Scalia-Ginsburg friendship and the, uh, the impact that it made on you. So uh, Justice Scalia famously when the vacancy came up, I think it was Justice White's seat that Justice Ginsburg filled, but when the vacancy came open during the Clinton administration, Justice Scalia recommended her, um, even though they had been together on the DC circuit, that's where they got to know each other. And he knew that she had a different jurisprudential approach. And you know, a lot has been said in the weeks since Justice Ginsburg died about that friendship because I think it speaks so well to both of their characters that despite the fact that they had such great differences um, and they could fight with the pen, um, they, when they were socializing, when they were outside of the opinion writing world, they had respect, respect and affection for one another. And that's how I've tried to live my life with, you know, I have friends who disagree with me vehemently about all kinds of things. Um, but I, I think that it is dehumanizing if we reduce people to the political or policy differences that we might have with one another. Thank you, and congrats on being half done. Well, for the record, I really enjoy listening to you, Senator Sass. I think you make a lot of sense, and uh, you explain the system very well. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand what the law is all about. I think you get it very much so. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Judge Barrett. Uh, to you and your family, uh, welcome. I guess I'm on the downside if you're halfway through. <laughs> um, if I might, just uh, at my opening, Mr. Chairman, I'll um, submit two letters for the record, if I might. One from the SEIU on behalf of the two million members of the Service Employees International uh, Union and one on behalf of a national uh, constellation of disability rights groups Without both expressing uh, concerns. Um, so, Judge Barrett, if I might, um, the calendar behind me makes clear something about the context that we're in. Because I think folks watching this at home, uh, despite the wonderful efforts uh, that a number of my colleagues have made to make this accessible, may have difficulty understanding exactly why we're here and why under these circumstances and why um, we keep bringing up the Affordable Care Act. So um, let me try and walk that through. Um, these aren't normal times, as you well know. Um, most of us are wearing masks. There are a number of members of this committee and the Senate who've been infected by COVID as our president has, uh, and that's resulted in the Senate being closed this week and um, are not being able to proceed. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and we are just three weeks from an election, a presidential election in which uh, folks are voting in more than 40 states, millions of votes have already been cast, and just a week after that election, the Supreme Court's going to hear a case um, that could take away health care protections from more than half of all Americans. So this is not an abstract academic argument. It's one that will have real life consequences. Destroying the essential protections of the Affordable Care Act, which was enacted just more than a decade ago, uh, would have a real impact on a majority of all Americans. It prevents insurance companies from discriminating against the more than 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions like diabetes or heart disease. It dramatically expanded Medicaid and it provides coverage for kids on their parents' insurance up to the age of 26, I should say young adults. Um, and perhaps most importantly, since a lot of what we've been talking about is the legacy of Justice Ginsburg and her lifelong commitment to gender equity, um, it also prevents insurance companies, the Affordable Care Act does, from discriminating against women just for being women. It may be hard to imagine now, but more than a decade ago before the ACA, Pregnancy was treated as a pre-existing condition, and women were routinely charged more than men uh, just because insurance companies could. So President Trump, he said over and over again that he is determined to repeal the Affordable Care Act, that he is determined to overthrow it. And there's two things all of us are waiting for. One is his detailed health plan, the other is his taxes. And I don't expect either one of them in the next three weeks. 
The President tried to do it here in Congress. In fact, I think by one count, uh, my colleagues have voted 70 times to overturn the ACA. Um, and many uh, in this chamber, many members of this committee, um, members like Senators Cornyn and, and Lee and others, have filed amicus briefs before the Supreme Court asking for the law to be struck down. So now on the eve of the election, I believe President Trump is making a last gasp attempt to get the Supreme Court to do it for him. He can't do it through the democratic process. He can't do it administratively. He's gonna try and do it with one more challenge. And as you well know, Judge, it was upheld eight years ago in a five to four decision where Chief Justice Roberts wrote a critical, decisive piece of the majority opinion. But Justice Scalia, for whom you're clerked, your mentor, whose broad philosophy you embrace, dissented. He thought it was unconstitutional and voted to strike down the entirety of the law. Um, you wrote an article in uh, Constitutional Commentary in 2017 um, in which you were quite critical of Chief Justice Roberts' decision. And so I wanna ask you about that article, um, not as a matter of debating abstract uh, academic principles, but because I believe the outcome in this case a week after the election may hang in the balance. He wrote in that article, and I quote, in NFIB versus Sibelius, the case that upheld the ACA against a constitutional challenge, Chief Justice Roberts pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. I think those are fighting words as an originalist and a textualist. You were referring to Chief Justice Roberts' ruling that the individual mandate in the ACA is constitutional under Congress's taxing powers a ruling essential to upholding the law and protecting the health care of a majority of Americans. So just if you could, do you think the Chief Justice's ruling upholding the ACA was implausible and unsound? Well, Senator Coons, um, what I said in that article, which was a book review of someone else's book, was that the statutory interpretation as I said earlier, as Chief Justice Roberts' own opinion said, was the less natural reading of the mandate, construing it as a tax rather than a penalty, um, that the statutory interpretation seemed, as you said, stretched beyond its plausible meaning. But NFIB versus Sibelius turned on the constitutional question. That was the statutory interpretation was the threshold question. Right. And the constitutional question was not something that I ever opined on. And the case, Next week, um, or the case that's coming down the pike in a few weeks, California versus Texas, I'd, I wouldn't say they're fighting words from the article that you read, be, read from me, um, because the California versus Texas case envires, in, involves a very different issue, this issue of severability. And for those to be fighting words, I think you would have to assume that my you know, critique of the reasoning reflects a hostility to the act that would cause me to approach a case involving the ACA with hostility and looking for a way to take it down um, to deprive people of their coverage under the ACA because I didn't like it. But I can promise you that that is not my view. It's not my approach to the law. I have no hostility to the ACA or any other law and that I will faithfully apply the law, and nothing that I've said um, with respect to the ACA in print, in my law review articles, actually bears on the severability question, so it's not indicative of how I might approach that question. Let me go back to what I perhaps too jokingly referred to as fighting words. You're both textualists. You're both from the same general school of constitutional methodology, correct? You mean Justice Scalia and me? And Chief Justice Roberts. I'm not actually sure that Chief Justice Roberts has ever identified himself as a textualist. So to that point, um, in this article three years ago, you, you chastised Chief Justice Roberts for not being a textualist. You said he has not proven himself to be a textualist and has been willing to depart from ostensibly clear text. And so you said in this article, and I'm quoting you, it is illegitimate for the court to distort either the Constitution or a statute to achieve what it deems a preferable result. So this was the sort of outcomes-oriented um, judicial crafting that has often been sharply criticized by your mentor, Justice Scalia, when criticizing the sort of living constitutionalists. And as I read this, um, you are saying to Chief Justice Roberts, you're no textualist. You have overreached. You have delivered an implausible conclusion. Uh, and frankly, I disagree with your upholding the constitutionality of this statute. That seems to me 
again, as a textualist here, a plain reading of your own writing? Well, Senator Coons, I want to make very, very clear, I think maybe this is, came up with Senator Klobuchar, that I was not attacking or you know, chastising Chief Justice Roberts at all, for whom I have the greatest respect. Um, I think this passage that you're talking about in this book review and constitutional commentary was maybe a couple paragraphs, maybe even one paragraph at the end, because it was a comment on Randy Barnett's book, and, and a lot of his book dealt with the NFIB versus Sebelius as, as an example. So I was responding to that. And the sentence that you read me about it's illegitimate for a court to twist lang language in pursuit of a policy goal, that is what I think. That's what I was telling Senator Sass. I mean, I, I don't think it is the job of courts to pursue policy goals that the text that you enact doesn't support. So to be clear, you're, you're specifically accusing the Chief Justice, or you're chastising might be the better word, the Chief Justice of distorting the statute um, and of upholding it when it should have been struck down. No, I'm not, I was not. I said I was not chastising. All I was doing was expressing some, well, I mean, and as I've said several times, it's how the Chief Justice himself characterized it. It's not the most natural reason, reading of that language. And all I was well, doing if, was- If I might, Your Honor, I, I don't think the Chief Justice would agree with that characterization. He didn't describe his own opinion as not plausible. He said less natural, and, less and I natural. thought it was implausible. But not unsound. So Senator Coons, I certainly would not and did not criticize or chastise the Chief Justice or impugn his integrity. It is true that Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia took different approaches to the text in the Affordable Care Act case, which is something that's widely acknowledged. I'm simply trying to make clear that I think your writing here in 2017 in constitutional commentary um, yes, the majority of it is a book review um, about a book that centrally talks about NFIB versus Sibelius and methodological questions. But near the end, you are, I think, unmistakably clear in saying, I disagree with the Chief Justice's ruling upholding the Affordable Care Act, and I deem it unplausible and unsound. Senator, as an academic, I did express a critique, and I you know, you, you've quoted the language, you've pulled out those few sentences at the end. Um, I guess I'm a little uncertain what it indicates, um, because as I've said, I have no hostility to the ACA, and if a case came up before me presenting a different question of the ACA, I would approach it with no bias or hostility. I also have said um, at earlier points in this hearing that the exercise of being a commentator, an academic, is much different than the enterprise of judging. And I didn't have to sit in Chief Justice Roberts' seat or Justice Scalia's seat when NFIB versus Sebelius was decided. So but you will, if we follow the timeline laid out by my colleagues, you will sit in former Justice Ginsburg's seat. And you will sit as a member of the court deciding a case that is very similar to the previous one in which the central issue before the court, believe it or not, somehow will be the constitutionality of the mandate that's in some ways um, been the linchpin of its being upheld previously in NFIB versus Sebelius. That was the, the sort of key point, was that at the end of the day, there were five justices who for different reasons concluded that they could uphold it in the case of the Chief Justice as a legitimate exercise of the taxing power you wrote, and this is the next sentence, that Chief Justice Roberts, if he had treated the payment owed under the mandate as the statute did, as a penalty, he would have had to invalidate it. So I think you're unmistakably criticizing this decision to uphold the Affordable Care Act in a case that will be before you as a newly seated member of the Supreme Court if the majority continues with this race towards your confirmation. It is the nerve center of the case. It's it, it, the entire future of the Affordable Care Act, I think, hinges on this question of whether or not um, you share a view with the four who were in the minority at the time um, that this is something that cannot be upheld under any plausible reading of the statute. Let me move on, if I might, um, Judge Barrett. You're, you're not the only person who's criticized um, Chief Justice Roberts for his decision to uphold the ACA. Um, President Trump criticized him for it sharply and repeatedly. Um, soon after the NFIB decision first came out in 2012, 
he tweeted, um, that Justice Roberts turned on his principles with irrational reasoning in order to get loving press. And then later, congratulations to John Roberts for making Americans hate the Supreme Court because of his BS. A few years later, while running for president, then candidate Trump said on Twitter, and I believe my colleague put this up earlier, if I win the presidency, my judicial appointments will do the right thing, unlike Bush's appointee, John Roberts, on Obamacare. And as recently as just two months ago, Vice President Pence described Chief Justice Roberts as, and I'm quoting, a disappointment to conservatives because of the Obamacare decision. In upholding the ACA, the Chief Justice was the one justice appointed by a Republican president who went against the political wishes of the party that appointed him. Why did you choose to single him out for criticism in that constitutional commentary article? Um, well, Senator Coons, I was writing about the majority opinion, and Chief Justice Roberts was the author of the opinion. So I was simply discussing what the five justice majority adopted as its reasoning. And I'd like to emphasize again that I was not attacking Chief Justice Roberts or impugning his character or anything of that sort. It was an academic critique. And I, I want to emphasize, you know, just given these, this line of questions that you're asking that, you know, I am standing before the committee today saying that I have the integrity to act consistently with my oath and apply the law as the law, um, to approach the ACA and every other statute without bias, and I have not made any commitments or deals or anything like that. I'm, I'm not here on a mission to destroy the Affordable Care Act. I'm just here to apply the law and adhere to the rule of law. And I, look, I think it is important that folks um, watching understand that I believe your views are sincere and, and earnestly held, and I am not trying to suggest that there was some uh, secret deal between you and President Trump. When you told me that when we spoke a week ago, I've had no conversations about these cases with the president or his legal team. I believe you. Um, I think you are a person um, who earnestly means that. And, and I do think it's important um, that you keep repeating that. But we cannot ignore the larger context that sits outside um, your, your nomination and this rushed process. Um, I'm sure you have no ill will towards the Chief Justice and meant no disrespect to him as an individual. We've talked repeatedly about the friendship between um, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg. Um, you know, I was long inspired by the friendship between Senators Biden and Senator McCain, and they fought hammer and tongs, tooth and nail, disagreed with each other on foreign policy day in and day out but then could still also spend time together with each other's families and respect each other afterwards. And to the point my colleague from Nebraska has made about civics versus politics, it is important for us to try and sustain these institutions that hold us together. And you and Senator Flake, I think, are another good example of that. Indeed. Um, as you well know, we came to Notre Dame Law School just over a year ago to talk about um, working together even across significant differences. Um, but the, the, the broader context that Senator Whitehouse um, went through in detail was as you are expressing opinions in an academic journal, there is literally an army of lobbyists and lawyers and people, um, donors um, and activists who are funneling new judges into our courts. And I have sat here for four years and watched a whole procession of judges um, where without going on about this too much, you know, a dozen have been deemed unqualified to serve. This is not a comment on you. But the speed and the process and the disrespect for some of the critical traditions of this body in terms of the blue slip and who gets nominated and why um, has made it harder and harder to see the independence of the judicial branch. And in this piece that you wrote in 2017, you made, I think, your position with regards to the Chief Justice and his opinion clear. Let me, if I could, put up another poster that may make this a little um, sharper in a way that is the political branch is not the judicial branch. Um, the Supreme Court's going to hear arguments, as I've said, in this case, a week after the election. And most Americans are probably surprised to even hear about it. When I, when I talk to a constituent, Carrie, um, who has a pre-existing condition, um, she was surprised this was even in front of the court. She said, I thought that was settled. 
Um, Carrie owns a small business. She has a daughter she's raising, and before the ACA, she had to spend $800 a month for insurance that she described as junk. Um, left her afraid of even going to the doctor's office or needing drugs, and because of the ACA, she's been able to get better quality insurance than she can afford, um, and she's got both type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, but the ACA guarantees she can't be denied insurance or made to pay higher premiums either because of her gender or because of these pre-existing conditions. Um, she expressed to me astonishment Many of us are engaged and interested in this because we care about the Constitution, we care about constitutional law, and the ways in which it impacts a majority of all Americans, frankly, all Americans. Help me explain to her, how is it that the Affordable Care Act settled eight years ago is back in front of the Supreme Court? Well, Senator, I spent some time with Senator Sass talking about how a case winds its way up, and it's because litigants chose to challenge the law again. And, you know, it went through the district court and the Fifth Circuit, and, and now the Supreme Court has granted certiorari on it and is answering the question. But as to the broader question, which I think is a political one, which is why are people fighting the Affordable Care Act, you have to ask the litigants. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know why they're fighting the Affordable Care Act. Well, uh, two things on that. Um, yes, there are no advisory opinions, as you said in your exchange with Senator Sass, and you have to have standing. The courts are reactive. But as Senator Whitehouse laid out, there's a whole network of groups that fund and develop and present test cases over and over and over. And this is an issue that will be before the court just a week after the election that is really not distinguishable from NFIB versus Sebelius. I mean, they are centrally about the constitutionality of the mandate, whether it's a legitimate exercise of the taxing power. You don't get to the question of severability if you haven't already determined the question of constitutionality. But I think that the question of severability, even if the now zeroed out mandate provision is a penalty, it doesn't affect the act at all if that position, if that provision can be severed out, then the whole rest of the act would stand. And so I actually think that severability is sort of the, you know, I think severability is one of the most important issues in the case. I don't think the question of characterizing it as a tax versus a penalty, you know, NFIB versus Sebelius also was interpreting a different provision. It was one that wasn't zeroed out, that actually had uh, money attached to it. But if I could, um, this is um, the filing of the Department of Justice in the Supreme Court. As you well know, um, the Justice Department is supposed to defend the constitutionality of federal laws if any reasonable defense can be made. And the Trump Justice Department has sided with those advocates who are trying once again to strike the law down now in the courts when they couldn't accomplish that uh, here, in fact, I'd, I'd argue that they're denying the will of the voters that clearly in 2018 in deciding uh, control of the House on health care um, want this to stay. And the administration's arguing that this now toothless mandate, which imposes no, pa no payment on anyone, is unconstitutional, and they're arguing the entire act must be struck down as a result. I, I frankly think the DOJ is embarrassed by this brief. They rarely even talk about it, but it's in black and white in the quotes over my shoulder that the mandate is unconstitutional and must go, and so the parts of the law that prevent insurance companies from discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions that prevent discrimination against women, all of it must fall as a result. Um, it seems to me that uh, Americans who are watching deserve to understand that this is somehow back up in front of the court, the posture the administration is taking, the ways in which it really does follow some of the contours of NFIB versus Sebelius, uh, and the ways in which, uh, bluntly, um, well, I know you won't talk about this pending case, what you said in that 2017 article, what you wrote, is highly relevant. Um, just as a preliminary point, the vote to uphold the ACA in NFIB versus Sebelius was five to four, correct? Yes. And Justice Ginsburg was in the majority and Justice Scalia in the minority? Yes. So if you were to replace Justice Ginsburg with someone who followed precisely Justice Scalia's analysis on the linchpin question of constitutionality, one could expect it would be overturned. Um, no, Senator Coons, because if there were a direct challenge to NFIB versus Sebelius, there would be precedent on point. And the law of stare decisis is a whole body of doctrine that binds judges itself. So. Um, 
No, I don't think one could assume that in a separate point in time that even Justice Scalia would necessarily decide the case the same way once there was precedent on the books. Um, I agree, and I look forward to discussing that in some more detail tomorrow. I have just, I think, six minutes. Your views of precedent, Justice Scalia's views of precedent, and the ways in which they may diverge, um, I think are important and important for us to spend some time on. Um, let me just recap this point. Um, for President Trump, for Republican politicians, um, the argument about tax and about whether or not the mandate is a tax is the gateway to knocking down the entire Affordable Care Act. And that's also the line of attack being taken by the Department of Justice. You've already said it's not plausible to interpret the mandate as a tax. If you didn't think it was a tax when it was raising billions of dollars in revenue, you certainly, I think, are unlikely to believe it's a tax when it raises no revenue. And the thing that might distinguish it from NFIB versus Sebelius is reliance interests and precedent. And when I have more time tomorrow, um, we'll go through that. But I just wanted to connect some dots. That Trump has repeatedly vowed to get rid of the ACA, has campaigned on it, has criticized the Chief Justice, has said his nominees would do the right thing. His administration is, is in court right now, arguing in a case to be heard in just four weeks that it should be invalidated. And a person you've criticized, Chief Roberts, a person whose opinion, whose decision you have criticized, Justice Roberts, um, means in many ways that you've signaled. I think. You were added to the Supreme Court shortlist after you wrote that article. And today, my Republican colleagues, who themselves have promised to repeal the ACA, are rushing through your nominations so you can be seated in time to hear this case. It, it concerns me gravely that that's the circumstances we're in. Let me ask one last line of questioning, if I might, in the five minutes I have left. There's another subject on which President Trump has been I think, unfortunately, very, very clear about what he hopes for from a Supreme Court nominee. Just days after Justice Ginsburg passed, the president was asked why there was such a rush to fill her seat before the election. And he responded, and I quote, we need nine justices. You need that. With the millions of ballots that they, and he meant the Democrats, are sending, it's a scam, it's a hoax, you're going to need nine justices. The next day, he told reporters, again, he doubled down, I think this and he means the election from the context, will end up in the Supreme Court. It's very important. We must have nine justices. Our president has also been asked whether he'll commit to a peaceful transition if he loses the election. He's been asked directly and repeatedly. And instead of responding in the way we'd expect of any leader of the free world with a clear and simple yes, he's tried to sow confusion and distrust in the potential results. So, Your Honor, I'm concerned that what President Trump wants here couldn't be clear, that he's trying to rush this nomination ahead so you might cast a decision, a vote, in his favor in the event of a disputed election, and he's doing his level best to cast doubt on the legitimacy of an election in which literally millions of votes have already been cast, most of them by mail. I was very encouraged, again, to hear from you specifically you have not had any conversation with him about this topic, and that's not what I'm suggesting. In fact, you repeated promptly, 28 U.S.C. 455, you're quite familiar with the recusal statute and its considerations. But I think the gravamen, the core, the, the core issue in recusal is that any judge or justice should recuse themselves from a case in which their impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Given what President Trump said, Given the rushed context of this confirmation, will you commit to recusing yourself from any case arising from a dispute in the presidential election results three weeks from now? Senator Coons, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify this, because I want to be very clear for the record and to all members of this committee that no matter what anyone else may think or expect, I have not committed to anyone or so much as signaled. I've never even written. I've been in a couple of opinions in the Seventh Circuit that have been around the edges of election law. But I haven't even written anything that I would think anybody could reasonably say, oh, this is how she might resolve an election dispute. And I would consider it, let's see, I certainly hope that all members of the committee have more confidence in my integrity 
than to think that I would allow myself to be used as a pawn to decide this election for the American people. So that would be on the question of actual bias. And you asked about the appearance of bias. Correct. And you're right that the statute does require a justice or judge to recuse when there's an appearance of bias. And what I will commit to every member of this committee, to the rest of the Senate, and to the American people, is that I will consider all factors that are relevant to that question, um, relevant to that question that requires recusal when there's an appearance of bias. And there is case law under the statute. And as I referenced earlier, in describing the recusal process at the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg said that it is always done with consultation of the other justices. And so I promise you that if I were confirmed and if an election dispute arises, you know, both of which are ifs, um, that I would very seriously undertake that process and I would consider every relevant factor. I can't commit to you right now for the reasons that we've talked about before, but I do assure you of my integrity and I do assure you that I would take that question very seriously. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just on the question of consultation, um, the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, because this question came up in 2004, wrote a letter actually to members uh, of this committee that there's no formal procedure for court review of a decision by a justice in individual cases. It's just something, Justice Ginsburg did say that there was a practice of consultation. I, I do think at the end of the day, what matters is removing any potential um, conflict here. Um, ensuring that there is confidence um, in our election, in the Supreme Court, and in its role is critical. Um, I have reached out to a number of my colleagues to implore them to step back from the timing of this confirmation, to consider the possible confluence of three different factors here, an election, an ACA case, and um, a rush timing in the middle of a pandemic. And I would just urge them one more time to think seriously about stepping back from this timing of this confirmation. That's not meant to impugn you or suggest that in some way you've engaged in some inappropriate conversation. That's just the confluence of these events at this time in this place. This election will have enormous consequences. Um, I am troubled by what you've written about the Affordable Care Act. Um, I am more concerned that the President has tried over and over and over to get rid of the ACA and that the American people have consistently said no, and that the consequences for a majority of Americans who rely on the ACA in the middle of a pandemic um, would be significant, um, and that the President has refused to embrace the American people's wishes and deliver um, some compelling alternative plan, and instead has taken the battle back to the Supreme Court where it will be heard in just a month. I think to reach out and to strike this critical statute down now would be the worst example of judicial activism, uh, which my colleagues say they don't want, and which I hope will not happen, but I am gravely concerned by what I see. Your Honor, I believe your views are sincere, um, but I also think you genuinely think the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. That's my reading. Um, and you are entitled to that view. But this body and the American people, we shouldn't kid ourselves. Uh, bluntly, if, if our president and the majority are able to swing the court out of balance um, by replacing Justice Ginsburg by someone whose views may be significantly to the right, the health of a majority of Americans may well be in peril. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks, Senator Coons. Uh, Judge, if it's okay, we'll do Senator Hawley's 30 minutes and take a break. Is sure. that okay with you? Yep. Um, so, uh, Senator Hawley, you'll, you're on deck. We'll uh, try to take a 15-minute break. And uh, just one observation. Really a lot of good questions, good interchange. Not one time has a senator and the judge talked over each other. I hope the American people understand that this is the way that it should be. Senator Hawley. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to begin by asking consent to enter two letters into the record supporting the judge's nomination, the first from the Family Research Council and the second from a group of state attorneys general, including the state attorney general of my home state of Missouri. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, judge, it's good to see you again. Uh, I, I've, I've been so impressed uh, with uh, your answers today. Um, it, it's really quite extraordinary. I look forward to visiting with you a little bit here. Can we just start on the topic of independence, picking up where Senator Coons just was questioning you? I, I've heard my Democrat colleagues over and over again suggest that because I guess you clerked for Justice Scalia that you'll automatically vote however he did. They attribute his opinions to you, his decisions to you, his method to you. Um, 
does Justice Scalia tell you what to do in your career? I mean, have you been in the habit your life of, of doing exactly what Justice Scalia told you to do in your professional career? Well, Senator Hawley, as I said earlier, if you confirm me, you're getting Justice Barrett, not Justice Scalia. You know, I share his method of interpreting the text, but you know, I didn't agree with him in every case, even when I was clerking. I mean, then he could tell me what to do, and even if I disagreed, I had to go his way. But the fact that we share the same approach does not mean that we would always reach the same result. And you make up your own mind, don't you? I do make up my own mind. And you have your own views, I think it's fair to say. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Indeed, I do. And you're a very accomplished jurist in your own right. Is that fair to say? Well, it feels a little immodest to opine on that Well, question. I'll say it is. You're very accomplished. So I, I think this, this one-way attribution that everything that you must just be a... Whatever Justice Scalia did, you would automatically do, I have to say, frankly, I think is a little bit demeaning. L let me uh, ask you about some other attacks that you've endured today. Now, I noticed yesterday we were assured that you would not be attacked on the basis of your faith. I noticed that didn't last 24 hours. But I'm not surprised because for three and a half years we have heard consistent attacks from the Democrat side on, nom on nominees on the basis of their faith, including, of course, you, Judge Barrett, and we talked about this some yesterday. Today, the second Democrat senator to speak questioned, criticized you for speaking to a Christian legal group that has a program, a summer program for Christian law students, where you gave, I think, a lecture once or twice um, on constitutional and statutory interpretation. So let me just ask you about that. You've talked about your faith. This has been well established. You accepted an invitation to speak to a group of Christian law students on the topic of, of your specialty. Uh, tell us why you accepted the invitation. I had several other colleagues who had participated in the Blackstone program um, lecturing, and I heard great things about it from them. We had a contingent of students from Notre Dame regularly attend this program and they were among our most engaged and smartest students. And I went and did it the first time I did it. I really enjoyed it. The students were very, very engaged. So I did it, I don't know, I might have done it four or five times. Each summer I would go and just give a lecture on originalism. That was one hour of the, you know, Blackstone is a summer long program. So I went and gave my one hour lecture at the beginning of it. And I really thought it was, it was a fun to talk about the Constitution to an engaged group of students is fun for someone who's a law professor. Are you aware of anything in the Constitution or our laws that say that it is a, a disqualification for office for a believer of religious faith to, to go and lecture to law students of a similar faith in her area of expertise? Um, I certainly, let me see, I want to be careful that I'm not uh, veering into answering hypothetical questions. but. I, I certainly didn't think there was anything wrong with my going to speak to a group of Christian law students about my expertise. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, Senator Leahy also raised a, a, a pledge, a statement that you signed uh, regarding abortion. You told us, uh, you told the committee in response to his question, you and your husband both signed it. I'm looking at the advertisement in question right here, the portion that you signed. You said that you signed it on your way out of church, if I remember correctly. I did. Um, that was almost 15 years ago. At the back of church, there was a table set up for people on their way out of mass to sign a statement, um, you know, validating their commitment to the position of the Catholic Church on life issues. Um, the ad that was next to it, I don't recall seeing the ad at the time, and in context looking at it, it looks to me like that was an ad by the St. Joseph County Right to Life group. Um, the statement that I signed, you know, it, it was, you know, affirming the um, protection of life from conception to natural death. Oh. And you just, you, you, you just made reference to the fact, again, that it was, it was in church. Can you just, why would it have been in, in the, the back of church? I mean, why would, would the signatures, why would this have been available to sign or not, as you so chose, in, in the back of church? Well, because that is the position of the Catholic Church, you know, on, on abortion. Though I, I feel like I should emphasize here, as I emphasize to others asking me the question, that I do see as distinct my personal, moral, religious views and my task of applying the law as a judge. Is it safe to say, following that distinction you just made, though, that the, the, the signature that you lent your husband also reflects your understanding of your church's teaching and, and your own personal views? I mean, that's what this says that you signed. So, 
What I would like to say about that is I signed that almost 15 years ago in my personal capacity when I was still a private citizen. And now I'm a public official. And so while I was free to express my private views at that time, I don't feel like it is appropriate for me anymore because of the canons of conduct to express an affirmative view at this point in time. But what that statement plainly says is that when I signed that statement, that is what I was doing at that point as a private citizen. And I'm not aware of, of any law or provision of the Constitution that says that uh, if you are a member of the Catholic Church and adhere to the teachings of the Catholic Church or you have religious convictions in line with those of your church teaching that you're therefore barred from office. Are you aware of any constitutional provision to that effect? I would think that the religious test clause would make it unconstitutional. Well, let me just ask you about the test clause since you bring it up. Article 6 says, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Can you just give us your sense, as a constitutional expert, scholar, and judge now, of, of the significance of, of Article 6 for our constitutional scheme? So the religious test clause prohibits this body, prohibits the, the government generally from disqualifying people from office because of their religious beliefs. And it, it guarantees, does it not, uh, the freedom of uh, religion? I mean, it is a uh, Article 1, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Amendment 1, the First Amendment, will go on to talk explicitly, and I want to ask you about that in a second, about religious liberty. But Article 6 is significant in that it sets out that one cannot be, no American citizen can be kept out of office based on his or her belief. You don't have to go and get someone's approval, certainly not somebody in government, their approval over what you believe, uh, does it meet this test or not, uh, do they like it or not. You don't have to get any sign-off. In fact, any kind of sign-offs are explicitly ruled out by the Constitution. Is that a fair characterization? The religious test clause makes plain that denomination or belief can't be a reason to disqualify someone. And that is why I continue to say it is, it is vital that we underline in the Constitution that this, this test clause and that we insist that it be applied in the context of your confirmation judge and every nominee for every high office who comes before this committee. There are no religious tests for office and the attempt to smuggle them in, even in the midst of this committee's hearings to date, uh, it, has to, it must be resisted on the basis of the Constitution itself. Let me ask you about the First Amendment, about the free exercise of religion. Uh, that's, of course, how the First Amendment begins. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, tell me what you think this says about the, the place of religious observance in American life and its significance. Why is it, why is it protected like this in, in the First Amendment? What do you draw from that? I mean, I think its presence in the, in, in the Bill of Rights, you know, like all of our rights, shows that it was one that the people for generations beginning in 1791 considered central to being a free people. And there's no indication from the Constitution that religious believers are second-class citizens in any way, is there? Um, well, the free exercise certainly suggests to the contrary. That and in fact, uh, the free exercise clause and the First Amendment suggests that, that the exercise of religion, worship, religious belief gets special protection. I mean, it's single out here for, for protection along with immediately after speech, the press, right of the people peacefully to assemble. Religion is given a special place which the United States Supreme Court has recognized. Let me just ask you about attempts to disfavor religious believers on the basis of faith. Is it your understanding, can a, a government at, at any level, federal government, state government, municipality, whatever, can they treat religious believers differently? Can they single them out for disfavor versus a non-religious group? Is that permissible in our constitutional order? Well, Senator Holly, that's a complicated question because, you know, there's a lot of doctrine surrounding that and there aren't bright line rules. And so that question would come up in a case with facts and, you know, it would require the whole judicial decision making process. So it's not a hypothetical that I can answer. Let me ask you about the, the, the court's decision, unanimous decision in the Hosanna Tabor case, which touches some of these questions in which the court there is a question about church's ability, uh, any house of worship, to hire and fire their ministers or those who perform religious functions, religious services. And in that unanimous decision, the court says that, that houses of worship are, are different, that they are unique, that they are, that they are given special protection under the First Amendment, and uh, that therefore they must be accorded 
special status. They, they have to have the ability, for instance, to hire and, and fire ministers, uh, those who are going to perform religious functions. The state, the government cannot interfere with that. Do you, do you think, do you agree uh, with the, the teaching of that case? I mean, do you, do you think that that, uh, that that case remains good law and is a significant decision? Well, Senator Holly, I think the way to that answer that question is, again, as I've said, I can't grade precedent, but I can talk about a precedent from my court. Um, so I was on a panel that decided a case called Gruscott, which applied Hosanna to board to the situation of a Jewish school which had fired a teacher, and the teacher sued, and the question was whether following Hosanna to board that school was entitled to treat her as a minister under the ministerial exemption recognized in Hosanna Tabor. And my court, um, the panel that I was on, said that she was a minister and we you know, took the factors in Hosanna Tabor and said nothing was a bright line test. You look at the cluster because Hosanna Tabor was designed to give religious institutions um, the freedom to hire and fire their ministers, you know, in this case, one of the Jewish faith, um, as consistent with their practice of their faith. And that view of ours in Gruscott was embraced by the Supreme Court last term in Our Lady of Guadalupe. I think it's, it's vital in this, in this time, in this season, Judge, where we're seeing many challenges to religious independence, many challenges to the ability of churches to conduct worship on equal terms with secular organizations, that the Supreme Court's unanimous decisions in this area, Hosanna Tabor and others, uh, the Trinity Lutheran case, which was not unanimous, but is a recent very important case as well, uh, I, I will just say for myself that I think that the lines that the Supreme Court has drawn regarding the First Amendment, regarding the status of houses of worship, uh, regarding the rights of religious believers, that now more than ever, it is vital that those be respected and that the Constitution be fully enforced and that the, the line of cases that is now multi-years old that the Supreme Court has set out be followed. And um, I, I, I certainly hope that, uh, that you will uh, respect and apply that precedent going forward. I don't have any reason to think that you won't. Let me um, shift gears and ask about another attack uh, that uh, uh, has been made on you today, having to do with the Cantor case. The Cantor case, we've heard about, um, Senator Durbin asked you about it at some length, Senator Klobuchar asked you about it as well. Uh, the Cantor case, first of all, is, is a case about the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, is that right? That is right. And it's about whether or not someone who had been charged with and convicted of or pled guilty to a felony uh, could keep and bear arms under certain circumstances. Is that a fair yeah. summary? Now. It is, I've heard repeatedly from my Democrat colleagues that you write in your dissent, you dissented in this case, you write in your dissent that the right to keep and bear arms is an individual right, but the right to vote is not an individual right. But maybe I'm reading a different opinion. That's not what you say in the opinion that I see. Page 50 of your opinion, or of the, of the joint opinion, your dissent, you refer to civic rights, voting rights as civic rights, and you say civic rights, you define them. Civic rights are individual rights. A moment later, you say, for example, the right to vote is held by individuals. So let's just set the record straight here. In this case, you say that the right to vote is an individual right, is that correct? That is correct. And the distinction between a civic right and the Second Amendment has to do with the purposes of that right. First of all, that's not a distinction you invented. Is that correct? That is correct. You were replying to a, 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 both a chain of cases and also scholarship on this issue. Is that correct? That is correct, and also the arguments the litigants made in the Cantor case itself. And, and this designation of a civic right talks about what the right to vote, what its civic purposes are. In other words, it gives us a stake in our democracy. Is that fair to say? Yes. So you never at any point say that the right to vote is somehow secondary or less than less fundamental than any other right. Is that fair to say? Yes, that is fair to say. I never said that. In fact, your whole point in this case, which is a fundamental rights case, doesn't have anything to do with voting rights. This is not a voting rights case, is it? The Cantor it case? Not. It has nothing to do with voting rights. Your whole point in this case, a fundamental rights case, is that you think that your colleagues on the Seventh Circuit actually constricted fundamental rights too narrowly. That is, the Supreme Court of the United States has said in Heller that the right to keep and bear arms 
is a fundamental right. That's the Heller decision. You think in this case that, that your colleagues actually were constraining that fundamental right a little too narrowly and were shutting some people out of it. Is that fair to say? We did disagree about the scope of the right. So just to make the record perfectly clear here, the Supreme Court has said, the United States Supreme Court has said over and over that, that voting, the right to vote is a fundamental right. And, and I think you've, you have affirmed that and recognized today, you've said you, that that is Supreme Court precedent. Am I right about that? Yes. And the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that they adhere to the one person, one vote standard, the sort of baseline, the touchstone, the keystone to, to that entire doctrine. Do I have that correct? Indeed, that is correct. And nothing in your opinion challenges that or changes that or calls into question, critiques, nothing, right? Not one iota. Okay. I'm glad that we're clear on that. Now, Senator Durbin said, in, in, as part of his line of questioning on this, uh, he suggested that, um, I don't know, perhaps that this, your, your opinion in this case somehow, which has nothing to do with voting rights, makes you friendly to what he characterized as attempts to deny people the right to vote on racial grounds. He went on to say that um, we all come to, everybody, every judge, all of us who come to the law, every judge who comes to the bench comes to the bench into cases with their own individual experience and viewpoints. So let's just talk about that for just a second, if we could, when it comes to the, to the fraught but vital issue of race and your own experience with that. You and your husband are the parents of a multiracial family. We are. Can you give us some sense just in your personal experience what that has been like for you, what, what that means to you, what, your, what experience you bring to the bench uh, because of uh, your experience as a parent in this unique context? Well, I think I could say how it has shaped me as a person. Um, it has certainly, you know, whenever you have a life experience, it makes you acutely aware in your interactions with other people. You know, um, it gives you empathy for them. I mean, the same is true of our having a son with a disability. Um, but I'm, I want to make very clear, Senator Hawley, that while my life experiences, I think, you know, I hope have given me wisdom and compassion, they don't dictate how I decide cases. Um, because, you know, as we discussed before and have discussed a couple of times, sometimes you have to decide cases in ways where you don't like the result. So while I hope that my family has made me a better person and my children definitely have given me new perspectives on life, I still, in, a, in applying the law and deciding cases, you know, don't let those experiences dictate the outcome. You'll follow the law wherever the law leads. Yes. Which I think is a good way to bring us back full circle to where we started about your own independence. You've cultivated, I think it's fair to say, over the course of your very distinguished career, you've cultivated a reputation for original thinking, for independence, uh, for... Uh, uh, I would say, um, for courage and for toughness. And um, you've never, I, I see no evidence in your record that you've ever compromised, kowtowed, or bent your position to the whims of other people, especially people in power, based on what they wanted you to do or expected you to do or told you to do. Is that fair to say? I mean, have I missed something in your record? No, I think that is fair to say. Um, I admire the way in which you've answered these questions, Judge, and uh, your forthrightness on these issues. And I look forward to talking with you more tomorrow. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, we'll reconvene uh, in 20 minutes. And we will go to about 6.30 and take a 30-minute break uh, to have some dinner and come back and finish out round one today. So 20-minute break.
I was just doing some of the math. It's gonna be after seven, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because we're taking another break. Another yeah. break. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So it'll be 715, 720, yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, no, my cell phone. Yeah, that's a good that's a good distinction to make though. No, no, no. Yeah, oh definitely. Definitely. And I mean I think he's probably okay on the things too. But it'd be it'd at least be good for us to shoot him something. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Why, why is Susan? She's recording the thing she already sent yesterday. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, same. All right. Yep. See ya. Bye.
it's like right around 3.30. Or 3.40, yeah, so I think we're going to start around 4, yeah. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being back, Your Honor, and thank you to your family as well. Uh, I want to just begin by saying, uh, perhaps not surprisingly to you, that I was uh, really disappointed by your responses to a number of my colleagues, most recently to Senator Coons, on the issue of whether you would participate in the decision involving the upcoming election if you are confirmed. I continue to believe that if you were to participate in a decision involving that election, it would do enduring explosive damage to the court. I think you know it would be wrong, not because of anything you've done. In fact, I'm not raising the issue of whether you've done any sort of deal or commitment because of what Donald Trump has done and my Republican colleagues. Because they have indelibly put at issue your integrity through their statements. The president has said that he's putting you on the court as a ninth justice so you can decide the election. It's been very clear and transparent. And the American people are not dumb. They're watching and they're listening. And if you were to sit on this case, if it goes to the Supreme Court, uh, the American people would lose faith and trust in the court itself. It would be a dagger at the heart of the court and our democracy if this election is decided by the court rather than the American voters. So I wanted to begin by making that point and then go to, uh, again, the real people who are really in this room with us and who will be affected by you as a justice. Yesterday I introduced you to Connor Curran, mm -hmm. you may recall. He's 10 years old. I was with him on his 10th birthday, September 27. It's a remarkable champion. He was diagnosed, as you may remember, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy at age four. His parents were told to take him home and give him a good life because he would soon lose his ability to walk, told 
his muscles would get so weak that he'd eventually lose his ability to smile and still smiling. What lies behind that smile is untold pain, physical pain, the anguish of going through the needles and the prodding and the treatments. But for his family, it's also the anguish of wondering whether they'll be able to pay for treatment that has kept him alive and whether he will be with them for all of life's milestones. They sent me a letter that they asked me to share with you, saying to you, Judge Barrett, please protect Connor. And they wrote also for millions of other Americans, 135 million Americans, many of them children, just like Connor, but also Christine Miller from Bloomfield, Connecticut. She was diagnosed with a thyroid condition. Her condition was only discovered because of the ACA, which gave her affordable coverage for the first time in a long time using Connecticut's exchange, healthcare exchange. And they wrote for people like Julia Lanzano in Cheshire, Connecticut. She suffered from headaches for years, and she put off going to a doctor because she lacked insurance. So typical and common for people. Put it off. When Julia finally saw a doctor without, still without insurance, she learned she had a brain tumor, and she was eligible for coverage under Connecticut's Medicaid expansion program, which was created by the Affordable Care Act. In her words, it was a godsend. I raise these stories in part because, as you know, I'm sure, protection for people who suffer from pre-existing conditions is, in fact, on the line in this case that will come to the Supreme Court only a week after the election. Uh, I want to be crystal clear because you stated to Senator Feinstein that, and I'm going to quote, uh, so far as I know, the case next week doesn't present that issue. It's not a challenge to pre-existing pre -existing conditions coverage or to the extreme lifetime maximum relief from a cap. And technically, you're right, but, it's a big but, if the trial court is upheld and there's no severability, the entire act goes down. That is what the Trump administration is asking the court to do. That's what the plaintiffs want done. Correct? Um, I gather that's... Senator Coons had shown the brief with the litigating position right. of the Department of Justice. I want to move on uh, to another uh, health care case. Um, and uh, this one involves uh, some of the letters that Senator Hawley was mentioning, and I feel I need to raise them because Senator Hawley asked about them, so did Senator Leahy, and I want to just clarify what they mean. And I want to make absolutely clear, uh, I detest and oppose any religious test. I am not asking you any questions about your religious beliefs. I'm going to be asking some questions about your legal position. So in case I'm unclear in any of my questions, I want you to tell me. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you signed onto this uh, two, 2006 open letter sponsored by an organization then known as the St. Joseph's County Right to Life, which was published in the South Bend Tribune. Is that the letter that Senator Hawley was mentioning? 
I believe he, the statement that's on the left, I think Senator Hawley had read the language. I can't remember it verbatim, but it was something like, you know, we support the right to life from fertilization to natural death, yes. The letter and ad referred to Roe v. Wade's legacy as quote unquote barbaric, correct? I don't think that that's part of the statement. I think that's part of the ad that appeared on the page next to it. They appeared side by side, correct? I believe that it ran that way in the newspaper. I'm not sure that I ever saw it in the newspaper, but yes, that, that is my understanding. That's how it appeared, so they were side by side. That's based, yes, based on since, yeah. And uh, the St. Joseph's County Right to Life sponsored the letter that you signed? Um, I think the St. Joseph County Right to Life organization was the one who presented the statement that I signed at the back of church. I want to give you an opportunity uh, to clarify. You didn't disclose that letter when you were nominated to the Seventh Circuit in 2017, did you? Um, I did not, Senator Blumenthal, and I'm actually very glad that you brought that up because I just want to clarify for the record, um, number one, that I didn't have any recollection of that letter. I signed it almost, or the statement. I signed it almost 15 years ago, quickly on my way out of church. And, you know, this questionnaire asks me for 30 years worth of material, and I've produced more than 1,800 pages. And so I didn't recall it. After it came to my attention, I did go back and look at the questionnaire, and I actually don't think that particular statement is responsive to question 12 which is, I think, the closest that it would come. I don't think it's responsive. But in any event, it is part of the public you know, record, and I'm very happy to discuss it's, it. But it's I wasn't It's part of the public the ball. record now, and it's a letter. The questionnaire asked for letters. Have you disclosed it now? Have you provided it officially? Um, so, Senator, as I said, I, I've supplemented my questionnaire um, with other material that came to light that I do think was responsive. That one, and I would be happy to answer questions if you wanted questions for the record with more specific detail, but I did not understand that to be responsive to uh, question 12, I think it is. Well, in fact, we know about it only because The Guardian made it public, I believe. Let me ask you about another letter, 2013 letter. Mm -hmm. You signed on to this letter regarding Roe v. Wade. Uh, it was sponsored by the University Faculty for Life at Notre Dame. You're a member of that organization, correct? I do. And the letter described Roe v. Wade as, uh, it's behind me, infamous. And uh, it stated that the signatories, quote, renew our call for the unborn to be protected in law. Correct? Um. Yes, I believe the full statement says, I'm testing my eyesight here, our full support for our university's commitment to the right to life because, you know, Notre Dame is a Catholic university and embraces the teachings of the Catholic Church on abortion. And so as a faculty member and member of the University Faculty for Life, I signed that statement. But you didn't disclose that letter. Again, Senator, I produced 1,800 pages of material, and all six prior nominees have had to supplement because they've overlooked things. 30 years' worth of material is a lot to try to find and remember. You disclosed it, in fact, just about three days ago, I believe, right? Because that's when it was brought to my attention. I had no recollection of it, and it surfaced in the press, and so it came to my attention, and then I supplemented. And I did think it was responsive because it was a statement of an organization of which I was part, and I belonged to the University Faculty for Life at the time. If this process maybe had been a little less rushed, you might have had more time to go back and recall some of these documents? Well, Senator, as I said, all six prior nominees, or the most recent six, have had to supplement too. So I don't think it really had anything to do with time. I think it has to do with the volume of material. And when you and I spoke, when you appeared before this committee in connection with your 2017 nomination, I didn't have the benefit of any of these documents, although I asked you about right of privacy and the validity of Roe v. Wade, Senator, correct? Senator, I said on my SJQ 
when I was nominated to the Seventh Circuit, and I said again now, I produced all the material that I could find, and I conducted searches to try to find things that I forgot, and I didn't find that. I understand that someone had to manually go to Notre Dame and look through back archives. I, I didn't remember it, and I couldn't find it. I assure you I was not trying to hide it from you. So, Judge, and I apologize for interrupting you. I no, no, pressed for ahead. time. Uh, sure. Respectfully, I want to share another healthcare story with you. Uh, this is about Samantha. One night in January 2017, Samantha went out with a few friends and coworkers. She woke up the next morning in a coworker's home, confused, scared, covered in blood. She'd been raped. After she was raped, Samantha was, in her words, a zombie. She couldn't change clothes, she couldn't shower, she couldn't drink or think. She wanted this event to be erased from her memory. Samantha's attacker also began stalking her, and she was struggling with depression and PTSD. In March, Samantha took a pregnancy test, and then another, then another. They kept coming back with the same result, pregnant. After the horrible violence she faced, she simply couldn't process that she was now pregnant. When Samantha shared her story with me, she said, I knew if I couldn't end this pregnancy, it would end me. So she decided to get an abortion. Now, as you know, Judge, uh, the landmark Roe v. Wade decision gave her that option. It gave women the right to decide for themselves whether and when to have a child. Roe didn't compel Samantha to get an abortion. It didn't tell her what she had to do, but it gave her that choice. The question that I would like to ask you concerns your legal position. Does the Constitution protect S Samantha's right to have an abortion? Roe versus Wade clearly held that the Constitution protected a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. Casey upheld that central holding and spelled out in greater detail the tests that the court uses to um, consider the legality of abortion regulations. Now, I'm asking you this question because the group that sponsored the first letter, St. Joseph's County Right to Life, as it was then known, states, quote, abortion is never the right answer, even in cases of sexual assault or where the pregnant woman's life is in danger. And the purpose of the letters that you signed seem to be a statement of legal position, but you're saying that there is a constitutional right to an abortion. Senator, the statement that I signed from the St. Joseph County Right to Life didn't say anything about rape or incest or any of those things. It simply validated the teaching of my church on the sacredness of life from conception to natural death. What I hear you saying is, in the Constitution, there is that right. I, you mean when I was talking about Roe and Casey a moment ago? Well, yeah. Roe was correctly decided. You're agreeing that? What I said was that Roe held that the Constitution protects a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy, that Casey reaffirmed that holding, and indeed, many cases after Casey have uh, affirmed that holding again, whole women's health, for example. Um, so I, I think we might be talking past each other because the statements that I signed were statements of my personal beliefs and not... Not your personal belief, Your Honor, your legal position. Are you willing to say that Roe was correctly decided? Because that's really the essence of the question here. Um, well, Senator, as I've said you know, to others of your colleagues in response to questioning, that it's inconsistent with the duties of a sitting judge 
and therefore has been the practice of every nominee that sat in the seat before me to take positions on cases that the court has decided in the past. Well, I think Samantha and a lot of rape survivors would be really deeply fearful about that answer because it provides no reassurance that you believe that Roe was correctly decided. Let me talk about Tracy. I want to tell you about her because she, again, came to me, told me she was diagnosed with stage four endometriosis and that it had caused an ongoing inability to have a healthy pregnancy. But as she said, she was one of the, quote, lucky ones. She had access to care and was able to receive treatment to assist in getting and staying pregnant. And I have encountered, maybe you have, many members of the military, veterans, who have sought similar kinds of treatment, some of them because they've suffered wounds of war. Tracy was scared when she saw the executive director of the St. Joseph County Right to Life recently stated, and I quote, we would be supportive of criminalizing the discarding of frozen embryos or selective reduction through the IVF process. So Tracy wanted me to ask you, in fact, she asked me to pose this question, is it your legal position that making IVF a crime would be constitutional? Well, Senator, the statement that I signed, as we discussed, you know, affirmed the belief of my church with respect to matters of life. I'm, I'm not asking about what you signed. I'm asking about your present legal position. But what, what is, I was- Is making IVF a crime Senator, constitutional? You're, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to answer. You're, but you're quoting positions from the St. Joseph County Right to Life. I'm not a member of that organization, and so, I'm not responsible for statements that they make. The statement that I signed said what you and I have discussed, and it said nothing further than that. And as for you know what policy position someone might take, you know, as I've said to your colleagues, I just it's not up to me to be in the business of expressing views, and I am happy to talk about views that I expressed when I was a private citizen, but now I'm a judge, and so I cannot publicly express views. Just to be absolutely clear, I'm not asking about the St. Joseph County right to life or their positions. And I understand you may or may not disagree or agree with them. But your legal position, IVF treatment, and I'm not going to ask again, just this last time, criminalizing it, well, would it be constitutional? I think there's a clear answer. But, Senator, I've repeatedly said, as has every other nominee who sat in this seat, that we can't answer questions in the abstract. That would have to be decided in the course of the judicial process. With a case, some legislature would actually have to do that, and then litigants would have to come to court. There would have to be briefs and arguments and consultation with colleagues and opinion writing and consideration of precedent. So, an off the cuff reaction to that would just circumvent the judicial process. Well, uh, again, I'm disappointed. I think Tracy would find that response somewhat chilling because she and thousands, maybe millions of women, potential parents, would be horrified to think that IVF treatment could be made criminal. and. I understand you're not answering the question, but I think um, she would be deeply fearful. Do you think that it would be constitutional to make it a crime for doctors or healthcare providers to provide that care or abortion care? Well, Senator, again, that's a hypothetical question. And so, as I've said, to give off-the-cuff responses about abstract issues, and, and I should clarify to say it really doesn't matter if they're hard questions or easy questions. 
It's just any questions that call for an abstract legal opinion are not ones that are appropriate for me to give either as a sitting judge or as a nominee. Um, those questions in my judicial role can be answered only through the judicial process. Just to be absolutely clear, there are millions of women like Samantha and Tracy and the veterans I mentioned who are terrified to think that their doctors and health care providers would be potentially in jail at risk of prosecution. Doctors who are exercising currently protected rights that Samantha says saved her life. And I believe our healthcare providers are heroes, particularly during the pandemic. But I want to ask you one, one more question about these documents. In the 2013 letter that you signed, uh, there is the following statement. Uh, we renew our call for the unborn to be protected in law, in law, and welcomed in life. What does it mean for, quote, the unborn to be protected in law? Does that statement mean there is no valid constitutional protection for an abortion and therefore Roe v. Wade should be overturned? Um, you know, I think that statement is an affirmation of life. You know, it points out that we express our love and support for the mothers who bear them. Again, it was a statement validating the position of the Catholic University at which I worked in support for life and to you know, support women in crisis pregnancies, to support babies. So it's, it's really no more than the expression of a pro-life view. I expect we'll be talking more about this issue tomorrow. I want to move now to a, another topic. Uh, you and Senator Durbin and others talked about your dissent in Cantor v. Barr, and I think your approach here, in effect, usurps the legislature's appropriate role in making policy judgments. In the case of Cantor, which, by the way, you put first on the list of decisions that you thought were most important that you have written, is that correct? I don't remember the order in which I listed them. It was first. I, I accept that. I, I just don't remember the order. Okay. I did list it. I remember listing it. But. Okay. Um, but that decision seems to usurp the legislature's role in deciding who should be permitted to have firearms and who should not. Because you decided the legislature was wrong to classify felons as not deserving of firearms, you decided as a matter of policy that when they were not dangerous, they should have that right. That's a policy or legislative judgment. And I think it has huge ramifications for real people across the country. And I want to tell you about one of them from Sandy Hook, Connecticut, Natalie. who is shown here with her brother Daniel. Daniel was killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut on December 14th, 2012. Dan Daniel was seven. I was there that day. I saw the parents after they'd learned that they had lost 20 beautiful children. And six great educators died as well. In the firehouse that day, there was unspeakable grief. And eight years later, Natalie says that grief remains with her. But Natalie, like Newtown, is resilient and strong, and her grief and trauma have spurred hope and action. She and Many young people across the country are leading a movement to deal with the epidemic and scourge of gun violence in this country. What happened at Sandy Hook was not an isolated instance. There have been 236 other mass shootings 
in the last decade, in the last 10 years, gun violence has taken more than 354,000 lives in rural communities and urban communities all around the country, and I'm sure in Indiana and South Bend as well. Your opinion in Cantor goes farther than Justice Scalia in Heller. In fact, you characterized it as kind of radical. It is, in effect, an outlier. And it is, in fact, radical. Did I say it was radical in the opinion? I think you said, quote, it sounds kind of radical to say felons can have firearms. That's a direct quote. Oh, I didn't remember that particular language. You can. I, I'm, not, I'm not, I'll, I just don't recall it, but I'm not nitpicking about it. We can look it up. That, that, oh, that's fine, Senator. I, I, I don't think you're making it up, yeah. trust me. No, I, I, I'll check it and look it up. But I know that's not the thrust of your question. It sounds any. kind of radical because it is radical. In fact, uh, no courts of appeals, except maybe the Seventh Circuit, has adopted this reasoning. The Third Circuit, I think, has a rule that's. The Third Circuit. Any others? I don't know that it's I come think, up. I knew others. there was the one third... circuit that did. I wasn't sure which one. But we thank were, you. My position was consistent with a Third Circuit en banc decision that had already been decided. And cutting through all of the legalese, and we've had quite a bit of it going back and forth, what this approach does potentially is mean that Connecticut's gun safety provision that the people of Newtown, Kristen and Michael Song, on behalf of their son Ethan, who perished because of a gun that was unsafely stored, they championed a measure called Ethan's Law. common sense measures that might have prevented the death of Shane Oliver, Janet Rice's son who died on October 20th, 2012. Shane was killed when he was 20 years old in Hartford. He died fighting for his life in Hartford Hospital. And measures like the emergency risk protection order that Connecticut now has. 19 states have these laws. They've saved lives. And extreme risk protection order laws, which help minimize risk, might well be struck down under the reasoning of your, your dissent. Respectfully, Senator, my dissent would not reach even those issues. My dissent was about the narrow question about whether a felon who had um, sold fraudulent foot inserts um, could automatically be disqualified from his Second Amendment rights simply on that basis. It said that guns can be kept out of the hands of the dangerous, and it didn't say anything about other gun safety or background check. Those are all issues that are being litigated across the country and were not at issue in Cantor. But supplanting the legislator's judgment about when dangerous people should be protected from themselves if they are potential suicides, as Vic Ben Como, a veteran in Iraq, found when his friend was going to take his life, the emergency risk protection order would have been available deciding what is dangerous, who is dangerous, when weapons should be taken away from them, if the courts are going to supplant the judgments of legislatures, if judges are going to legislate from the bench, that's the import of your reasoning in that dissent. It may not have dealt precisely with any of these particular laws, but the reasoning throws into doubt. It raises the risk to many of them. And folks who live in Connecticut 
are terrified of that prospect, at least well, many Sandy who've Hook talked to me. Sandy was a tragedy. Um, so I, I express the deepest sympathy for those who experienced that loss there and elsewhere. But Cantor, you know, I, I hope you take some comfort from Cantor being a much narrower decision that doesn't have any effect on those sorts of loss. Thank you, Senator. Thank Blumenthal. you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Judge Barrett. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I get started, I'd like uh, unanimous consent to submit a letter from my primary care physician indicating that I've fully complied with CDC guidelines and been without cleared like 2,000 other North Carolinians yesterday, and I'm glad that they're healing. Without objection. I'd also like to uh, put forth three letters uh, in support of uh, Judge Barrett, including one from Devin Patel, a former uh, student who speaks very highly of your academic prowess, but also your compassion. Without objection. I'd uh, also like to cover what uh, Senator Blumenthal just did. I think we should go back. I believe you alluded to it, Judge Barrett, but question 12A of the committee questionnaire asks for books, articles, reports, letters to the editor, editorial pieces, or other published material you have written or edited. Is it fair to say that if you signed a petition, you did not write or edit any of the petition you signed? I did not write yeah. or edit that. It also uh, needs to be restated. I think you alluded to it. But over the last six justices confirmed by this committee, all of them pro provided supplemental information, and in some cases, after the actual hearing. Um, so I appreciate your uh, being forthcoming that you've submitted 1,800 pages of documents. Um, Mr. Chairman, just going back, uh, I also wanted to mention that as a part of my journey through uh, my time in quarantine, I have enrolled in uh, two studies so far. I'll be giving blood on uh, Friday to enroll in another program at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm scheduled to donate convalescent plasma. Because this is being aired, I hope that anyone who's recovered from COVID will do their part to try and uh, heal this country from the health challenges that COVID has presented us with. I intend to do my part. Uh, I also would like to say, uh, I like to consider the Senate an essential business. And I believe that the architect of the Capitol and our attending physicians here have taken great measures to make sure that we can safely come to work. And I would encourage anybody who works in the Senate to come to work. Um, I want to also go back to something that uh, Senator Feinstein said earlier, and you're not going to have to answer this question. Um, Senator Feinstein mentioned earlier that we've had a surge in uh, applications for guns or purchases of guns. Um, I wonder if a part of that is where we find our society right now. We're seeing great cities burned and looted. And my highway patrol in North Carolina, 75% fewer applications to go into the Troopers Academy and record high requests for retirement. We see that in New York. We see it across this country. I think people are afraid because many people, including people on this committee, are unwilling to condemn the acts of violence and public safety out there and condemn violence against law enforcement, which is rampant. I lost a, a, a sheriff's deputy just about a month ago uh, who was shot protecting a family. Uh, so yes, uh, Senator Feinstein, I suspect that gun purchases are up, but I suspect the root cause behind a lot of them have to do with people's personal safety. Um, to your family. Uh, I, I would encourage all your family members and your students who mercifully are your, your, your children who are your students too, who are mercifully taking a break to uh, treat social media like roadkill. Just don't look at it because if you do, you're going to regret it. I, I am going to also ask unanimous consent to put forth um, uh, some articles or tweets from prominent people that I think kind of give you an idea of the guerrilla tactics that are being used right now. And the committee, this has sounded a whole lot like a lobbying session. It's almost as if you're being interviewed to become a U.S. Senator so that you can decide policy on the, on the Affordable Care Act and a number of other things that I'll get to. But behind the curtains, we're seeing people say all kinds of things about you. Uh, one, one called you a white colonizer for actually adopting two Haitian children. We have another one calling you a handmaid and a clown, in a clown car, and I'm not gonna, I'm not, it will be submitted for the record, but the profanity used in there. Uh, another one uh, that, uh, that says that, yeah, you're a good mom, but that doesn't qualify you as a judge. What qualifies you as a judge is being an extraordinary professor, an extraordinary student, and an extraordinary jurist. 
And I think that these people need to recognize doing the bidding of this committee by attacking you outside of the committee is as bad as them being in this chamber. Um, now, I also want to talk about uh, the discussion on Roe v. Wade and the Affordable Care Act. The, um, Senator Feinstein, in I think the same two or three minutes, said that she wanted you to protect Roe v. Wade but overturn Heller. Those seem to be incongruent, but I'll just leave that out there. They're asking you to basically legislate. I don't want you to do that. But when we talk about Roe v. Wade, the one thing that's conveniently missed about this discussion is something that I think that most of the American people are at odds with the position that every member of the Democratic Conference supports. My, um, my granddaughter went to her two-month uh, uh, health checkup today. She weighed in at 10.1 uh, 10 pounds. And you can't see this picture, but I'm telling you, from this granddaddy's eyes, she's gorgeous. But she was born three weeks premature, and she only weighed a little over six pounds. She was discharged from the hospital within 36 hours. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to talk about the broad strokes of Roe v. Wade. They don't want to talk about their radical policy that would allow the right to take that child away that I just held in my arm two or three weeks ago. And eight weeks ago when she was uh, three, weeks, uh, three weeks premature. Um, Judge Barrett, I believe uh, I have complete confidence in your integrity. Uh, I have complete confidence that you're going to go and you're going to be a great justice. But I do want to ask a little bit about uh, maybe your experience when you were uh, working for, actually, I want to start when you were in, um, in school. Did you have, when you came in, you were obviously a brilliant student. You did your homework. We've heard professors attest to your um, your intelligence and your performance in school. Did you ever go into a classroom where the professor was espousing one position and you were espousing in another one and you ended up coming out with a different perspective? Sure. Yeah. Uh, did you ever change your professor's perspective? Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of an unfair balance. Okay, now fast forward to when you were a clerk for Justice Scalia. I just saw an interview last week when I was in quarantine of Justice Breyer talking about these mounds of uh, of uh, documents that his clerks would provide him. He'd quickly go through them. He said it, it's actually a fairly quick process to winnow out the ones where there's no dispute among, there's no split circuits, so you move through it pretty quickly. Um, I understand that Justice Scalia, uh, at least in some sessions, would have a mix of clerks. They would be across the ideological spectrum. Was that the case when you were clerking for him? I would say that not all four of us, he had four clerks, and we were not, we were not all of the same mind. There was a mix. When you, were there ever cases when you went before Justice Scalia and you, you, you thought that maybe he was leaning one way where he actually listened to the arguments from the clerk and modified his position? Or was it like the professor discussion? Uh, no, I think he definitely listened. I mean, we would go in before an argument when he was preparing and he would pepper us with questions and go back and forth. He wanted to hear it from all sides. And so, no, he definitely, it was part of the give and take, though, to be clear, he was the one with the commission, and he was the one who made the decisions. Thank you. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say, because I want to yield back more time than most other members, um, is, uh, Mr. Chairman, you opened up this morning talking about the Affordable Care Act. I don't think there's anybody in the U.S. Senate that doesn't want to make sure that every single picture that we've seen here, that those folks have affordable health care and that they can be cared for. But what we have here and the Affordable Care Act is something that is so flawed that the majority of the Democratic candidates for, pre uh, for president all raised their hand and said it needed to be replaced with something they call Medicare for all, which could be Medicare for none. We know the broken promises of if you like your doctor, you could keep it. If you like your health care, you could keep it. What we're not talking about are the thousands of people who were already forced off of their job health care because employers changed hours, and now instead of working one full-time job, you've got to work two full-time jobs because the businesses can't afford it. We've got a fundamental problem here. We need to protect every one of them, but we also need to make sure that people who have a health plan under the Affordable Care Act can actually afford to use it. In the catastrophic situations, it's life-changing, and thank God that it's there for them. But what about so many other people that only have it and will only use it if they have a catastrophic situation? Because they can't afford the co-pays, they can't afford the underlying cost. We need to fix that. We shouldn't expect the justice or the Supreme Court to fix it. That is our job. We should all show up here for work, and we should get that done. 
and we should also work on all the other things that this country is suffering from as a result of COVID. Thank you, Judge Barrett. I look forward to supporting your nomination. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Thank you, uh, Senator Hirano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to reiterate my objections to holding this nomination hearing instead of working to provide relief for the millions of Americans who are suffering during this pandemic. And three weeks ago, our country crossed a tragic milestone. We lost more than 200,000 Americans to COVID-19. That is more than the entire population of the Big Island in Hawaii, more than the population of Tempe, Arizona, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Wilmington, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, Waco, Texas. I could go on. 200,000 American lives plus. This is a photo of a memorial outside the White House where President Trump held a reckless super spreader event two weeks ago to announce the Supreme Court nomination. The memorial shows 20,000 empty chairs, one chair representing 10 American lives lost to COVID-19. And one of those chairs represents Veronica Guevara's grandfather, who is pictured, who is pictured here with Veronica. Veronica, who is from Iowa, has experienced the painful impact of the Trump administration's failure to address the pandemic. Her family is composed of essential workers who are working on the front lines of this pandemic. Her mother, who worked at a fast food processing facility, caught COVID-19 at work and was eventually hospitalized for seven days. Thankfully, her mother recovered, but then her grandparents got COVID-19 and were admitted to the hospital. And although her grandmother recovered, sadly, her grandfather didn't make it. After experiencing all of this tragedy, Veronica shared, quote, it is even more so insulting to see a Senate that is more concerned with rushing through a Supreme Court nominee rather than focusing on providing relief to all the hardworking people that gave them their current leadership positions, end quote. Many Americans agree with Veronica. They are sitting at their kitchen tables wondering how they're going to buy food, how they're going to pay rent. Millions of them are out of, they, they don't have jobs. They're going to food banks for the first time in their lives. So rather than coming up with a bill that meets the needs of the urgency of this moment, Republicans are just come, uh, coming up with peace meal bills. That's because we know that within your own caucus, you can't agree on one bill that fit, fits the critical needs of this country. In fact, there are at least 20 Republicans we heard who have said, we're done, we're not doing any more to help the Americans who are suffering with COVID. So here we are racing forward with this nomination while the rest of the country is wondering, what the heck is the Senate doing, particularly the Senate Republicans? So I agree with all the people in our country who are asking, what the heck? This is hypocritical. This hearing shows the American public exactly what my Republican colleagues' priorities are, ramming through another ideologically driven justice to the Supreme Court instead of helping the people in our country suffering during this pandemic. Mr. Chairman, I have some letters of opposition to Judge Barrett's nomination to enter into the record. These are letters from Lambda Legal, the Japanese American Citizens League, and the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, which was joined by 55 reproductive justice groups. I ask unanimous consent to enter these letters into the record. Without objection. Judge Barrett, Chief Justice John Roberts has recognized that, and I quote him, the judicial branch is not immune, end quote, from the widespread problem of sexual harassment and assault and has taken steps to address this issue within the judiciary. As part of my responsibility as a member of this committee and indeed all of the committees on which I sit, uh, to ensure the fitness of nominees for a lifetime appointment to the federal bench or to any of the other uh, positions uh, for any of the committees on which they appear, uh, I ask each nominee these two questions and I will ask them of you. 
Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, Senator Hirono. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, Senator. Judge Barrett, do you think it is appropriate for justices to consider real world impacts in their decision making as Justice Ginsburg noted in a number of her dissents? Well, Senator, the doctrine of stare decisis is a good example of that because the factor reliance interests takes into account um, the real world impact, the way that people have ordered their affairs and relied on decisions. So there are contexts, yes, in which considering the impact is expressly part of the doctrine. So you would say then that you've been listening to all of us here yesterday as well as today talk about the real world impact of the striking down of the Affordable Care Act, and would all of those impacts be factors that would be important for you to consider should you be uh, a justice? Um, Senator, to be clear, I have the utmost empathy. The stories you know that you have told, including the story of Veronica's family, are very moving. If I were a justice, the commitment that I would make to you and all people affected by the laws is that I would follow the law as you enacted it and I have no agenda. I would not be coming in with any agenda. I would do equal justice under the law for all and not try to thwart or, or disrupt in any way the policy choices that you and your colleagues have adopted. So are you saying that the impact of the Affordable Care Act on the millions of people who rely upon it that those who you would deem to be co policy considerations that um, we should address? Senator, I think that you choose the law and you've structured the Affordable Care Act. It's a complex, long statute. I think you set the policy. And then I think when a court um, has to interpret the statute or decide how it applies in a certain circumstance, the court looks to tradi traditional legal materials, looks to the briefs, it listens to the real world impact on the litigants who are before the court arguing the case because every case affects real litigants. Mm -hmm. Every case affects real people. I said in my opening statement yesterday that, you know, when you pass statutes, they're often named for the co sponsors of the bill. But cases decided by all courts are typically named after the parties, they affect real people. Judge Barrett, so are you saying that all of the stories that we brought forth yesterday and the millions of people who are relying on the Affordable Care Act can rely upon you that th those impacts would be considered by you, that you would consider those to be legal arguments that you would consider? Because when you say that you're going to make a decision based on the law, the real life stories that we've been talking about you would consider those to be part of the law? Senator Hirono, every case that becomes before a court, because as I was saying earlier, no case comes before a court unless it involves real live people who've had a real live dispute. And it is the job of a judge deciding every case to take into account the real world, real world consequences of the parties before it. So does that mean that you would agree with uh, Justice Ginsburg that the court should be taking into consideration the real life effect of the decisions that they make? Because she wrote a number of dissents saying that the majority did not consider the real world impacts of their decisions. So are you aligning yourself with Justice Ginsburg in terms of what you would consider real life impacts and the effect it would have on your decision regarding the law? Well, Senator, I don't know what context, this, the particular context in which Justice Ginsburg was describing that. Um, I think what I'm trying to align myself with is the law and that I will take into account all factors, including real world impact when the law mm -hmm. makes them relevant, as it clearly does, for example, in the doctrine of stare decisis. I'll get to your views of precedent in a moment. I'll give you a real life example of uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg. 
In Ledbetter v. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, Lily Ledbetter worked at a Goodyear plant for 19 years. As an area manager, a position held mostly by men, Lily was paid less than all of her male counterparts. When she eventually realized this stark inequality, she sued for pay discrimination and a jury agreed. But the Supreme Court kicked Lily's claim out of the court for being too late. The conservative majority, including your mentor, Justice Scalia, interpreted Title VII's 180-day limit, time limit to mean that Lily had to have filed her claim within 180 days of when her salary was decided, instead of accepting the common sense approach of viewing her paychecks as an ongoing part of pay discrimination. Justice Ginsburg strongly disagreed with her conservative colleagues' approach to the case. In her dissent, she pointed out the many challenges women face in discovering pay disparities, including how many companies keep salaries confidential. In a stinging rebuke, she said, quote, the court does not comprehend or is indifferent to the insidious way in which women can be victims of pay discrimination, end quote. In another case, in 2018, in Epic Systems Corp v. Lewis, employees who have been illegally underpaid joined together to, see, uh, to seek back pay in court. To block this effort, their employers forced them to sign an arbitration agreement prohibiting collective actions. They actually had to sign these uh, arbitration agreements in order to even have a job or keep their job. So the Supreme Court's conservative majority, including Justice Scalia, sided with the company. They interpreted a general federal arbitration law to override two worker protections laws instead of recognizing that the worker protection laws fall sensibly within the exceptions in the arbitration law, meaning that the worker protections laws should prevail. Again, Justice Ginsburg strongly disagreed with the majority's approach to the case. In her dissent, she pointed out that blocking joint lawsuits would deter most workers from seeking individuals unpaid individual unpaid wage claims because of the cost of lawsuits and fear of retaliation. She warned the majority's decision would result in hurting vulnerable, low-wage workers. Now, those are the kinds of real-life impacts. The reality of women who are uh, not paid the same as their male counterparts because of uh, sex discrimination happening that she has no way of finding out about, or of workers who are forced to sign an arbitration clause that overrides worker protection, other worker protection laws. Those are the kind of real world impacts. So do you think Justice Ginsburg was wrong to consider real world impacts in her decision making? Well, Senator, you know, both the case, you know, you're talking about Lily Ledbetter, both that case and Epic Systems are precedents of the court. And as I've said a number of times during the hearing, I can't really comment or grade thumbs up or thumbs down, as Justice Kagan well, put it, prior precedents or say how I would have decided them. They are, Judge Barrett, they are precedents of the court that do not take into consideration the real world factors at play here. And in fact, in the case of Epic Systems, the court sided with the corporation as opposed to the workers who are trying to remedy a wrong. And in Lily Ledbetter, she was uh, totally out in the cold. So again, the court did not. So they established precedent, all right. But it was a precedent that was not based on real life impacts. So much as you sit here telling me that you would follow the law, after all, the law, for example, the Affordable Care Act, that law embodies a policy that says we want as many people as possible to be covered under insurance, and if the Affordable Care Act is struck down, that policy, that law, would be struck down. So I know that there was some discussion about some distinction that you make about policy uh, versus the law, and I find that distinction to be a fiction, because every law, or most laws we pass, are supposed to have real world impacts. Otherwise, why should we pass a law? So the fact that you're not able to, I think it's pretty clear, let me rephrase that. Uh, you do consider Justice Scalia to be your mentor, that your judicial philosophy is in alignment with him, and I think we all acknowledge that Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were, were at pretty much opposite ends of the spectrum. So since 
Justice Ginsburg made it a policy. Her approach was to look at the real world impact. Justice Scalia's was not. So I'd say that uh, when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, the real world policy considerations that um, will not be taken into consideration by the conservative ju judges would mean that 23 million people could lose their health care, that 133 million Americans with pre-existing conditions could lose crit critical protections for their health care, and more than 7 million Americans who have tested positive for COVID-19 would probably be added to the group of people with pre-existing conditions, and millions of Americans would once again face lifetime limits on coverage for essential services. That 8.7 million women would lose coverage for critical maternity care services. And uh, we know that black and native women are two to three times more likely to die than white women from pregnancy-related cases. That Americans could lose coverage for essential health benefits like prescription drugs and mental health care. That young adults would no longer be able to stay on their parents' health insurance plan until age 26 at a time uh, when our country is dealing with massive job losses. So in my view, there, uh, you, you have posed an artificial dis distinction between policy considerations that's left up to us and following the law because if your criticism of uh, Justice Roberts' decision in upholding the Affordable Care Act, if, if that was something that he followed he would have struck down the Affordable Care Act. That is, that is your, if you followed your criticism of him in sustaining the Affordable Care Act, he would have struck it down. So I would conclude that your approach is in fact not like that of Justice Ginsburg who did care about what would happen. And let me just uh, tell you one story of a person who will be impacted in the real world if the Affordable Care Act is struck down. And I know that so many of my colleagues have already established that the president expects you to strike down the Affordable Care Act and you've already established that you made no such commitments. But clearly that is why this whole process is occurring, occurring so that you can be sitting on that court in time to hear the Affordable Care Act by the Supreme Court on November 10th. So, one of the people who will be impacted is Elizabeth from Texas. She moved to Texas for a job and thought that she would have a stable income and health care coverage. And all that changed when her hours decreased and she lost her health insurance. Because she couldn't afford health insurance, she couldn't get proper treatment for her asthma. She had to resort to using friends expired inhalers and over-the-counter remedies. The ACA allowed her to get health insurance again. The ACA also protects people with pre-existing conditions like Jordan, who I talked about yesterday, and she has a very rare illness that would require 500,000 per year just for her medication. And were it not for the Affordable Care Act, she wouldn't uh, be able to afford it. I mean, who can afford 500,000 a year to keep her going? And also people like Kimberly, I talked about her yesterday. The ACA enabled her to get a mammogram, which she wouldn't have been able to get, and that mammogram revealed that she had um, breast cancer and she got a mastectomy. So, you know, this is, the, this, the real life impacts on people like Elizabeth Jordan and Kimberly, where you say you will follow the law, it really leaves me wondering whether all of these real life impacts uh, are what you would call within the scope of the law that you would Decide, should you be confirmed? November 10th, you'll hear the case. You will be deciding on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And by the way, you noted that the issue in the Affordable Care Act was one of, what, what was it that you said? Severability. Severability. But the other issue in the Affordable Care Act is the entire constitutionality of the law. Because the, the district court, the issue was whether the district court in Texas was correct in deeming the entire law unconstitutional. So in fact, we are facing the entire law falling by the wayside. Let me move on. So you've been also asked a lot of questions about whether or not you would overturn Roe v. Wade. 
I mean, clearly President Trump expects that you would do so because as he said, if we put another two or perhaps three justices uh, on the court, that'll happen, meaning the, the reversal of Roe v. Wade will happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. And a number of us have mentioned that Senator, as far as Senator Hawley is concerned, where he said, I will only vote for those Supreme Court nominees who have explicitly acknowledged that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. And uh, there's a whole quote I have from him, but after you were nominated, Senator Hawley made clear that you passed his litmus test. And he said, I think her record is awfully clear. I think that's one where she meets my standard of having evidence in the record. And by the way, he had noted that he expected this evidence in the record, not from your post-nomination assurances to him. So all your prior record, he said, you met his standards. So we, we usually expect justices to uphold and apply long-standing precedent. So uh, was the president wrong in concluding that you would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade? Well, Senator, again, I can't make any statements, mm -hmm. no hints, forecasts, or previews, as Justice Ginsburg put it, about any case or any precedent. But I will repeat what I've said you know, throughout this hearing, that I made no promises to anyone. I have no agenda. There are 598 volumes of the United States reports. That's something that judges build on. Justices don't go to the court to start having a book burning. I know that you have reiterated that time and again, but you know what we are left with are the positions that you have already taken. So the 2006 newspaper ad you signed that said you, quote, oppose uh, abortion on demand and defend the right to life from fertilization to natural death. It's not just the fact that this newspaper ad you joined um, said what I just read, but it also said, quote, it's time to put an end to the barbaric legacy of Roe v. Wade. Uh, in a 2013 speech you gave where you said the Roe decision, quote, permitted abortion on demand, end quote, after you said you opposed abortion on demand in 2006. So what underscores my concern about your willingness to overturn Roe v. Wade, which is really the expectation that the president has and which uh, Senator Hawley fully expects you to do because you have met his litmus test. But uh, you noted stare decisis, which is precedent. And you have argued that a justice's duty to follow the Constitution, which you explain, means that she should, this is regarding your view on precedent, that uh, she should, quote, enforce her best understanding of the Constitution rather than a precedent she thinks clearly in conflict with it, end quote. So in, in, in fact, you say constitutional cases are the easiest to overrule because you bring your own assessment of what the Constitution requires. And as you said, if the precedent is clearly in conflict with your view of uh, the Constitution, then uh, the precedent falls by the wayside. So you did indicate that there are a few cases that are um, immunized from overturning because uh, they, are, they wouldn't be challenged in the first place, i.e. Brown v. Board of, Board of Education. But Roe isn't one of those cases because we know that there are all kinds of challenges to uh, Roe, basically because the states are very busy passing all these these laws that limit a woman's right to an abortion. So you also said in that speech that even if Roe is not overturned, you said without overturning Roe, you explained, quote, the question is how much freedom the court is willing to let states have in regulating abortion. And so there are 14 cases right now relating to state abortion restrictions making its way through the circuit court, and some of these are gonna land in the Supreme Court. And these 14 cases include the following restrictions. Six cases involve bans on abortion starting at gestational ages ranging from six to 24 weeks. Two cases involving bans on a particular type of procedure, dilation and evacuation, that accounts for nearly all second trimester 
abortions, one case involving a requirement that fetal remains be buried or cremated, four cases involve laws imposing unnecessary requirements on abortion providers like transfer agreements with local hospitals, four cases involve so-called reason bans, two cases related to parental notification and consent. There are real reasons why the American public is concerned that you will overturn Roe or basically strip it of all meaning so that it becomes a nullity because you will have these cases that, as you say, you know, the, the open question is how far the Supreme Court will go in letting states put limits on abortion. So that is why a lot of people are very concerned about your views as articulated pre-nomination, which convinced Senator Hawley you met his test. This morning, Senator Feinstein asked you a question about the Supreme Court's 2015 decision in Obergefell v. Hodges, a case in which the court recognized the constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And I was disappointed that you wouldn't give a direct answer on whether you agreed with the majority in that case or if you instead agree with your mentor, Justice Scalia, that no such right exists in the Constitution. So even though you didn't give a direct answer, I think your response did uh, speak volumes, not once, but twice. You used the term sexual preference to describe those in the LGBTQ community. And let me make clear, sexual preference is an offensive and outdated term. It is used by anti-LGBTQ activists to suggest that sexual orientation is a choice. It is not. Sexual orientation is a key part of a person's identity. That sexual orientation is both a normal expression of human sexuality and immutable was a key part of the majority's opinion in Obergefell, which, by the way, Scalia did not agree with. So if it is your view that sexual orientation is merely a preference, as you noted, then the LGBTQ community should be rightly concerned whether you would uphold their constitutional right to marry. I don't think that you use the term sexual pre preference as just, a, I don't think it was an accident. And one of the legacies of Justice Scalia and his particular brand of originalism is a resistance to recognizing those in the LGBTQ community as having equal rights under our Constitution. In 1996, Justice Scalia wrote a dissenting opinion in Romer v. Evans defending a state's ability to openly discriminate against the LGBTQ community. In 2003, Justice Scalia wrote a dissenting opinion in Lawrence v. Texas defending a state's right to criminally prosecute someone for same-sex sexual activity. Ten years later, in U.S. v. Windsor, Justice Scalia wrote another dissenting opinion, this time defending the federal government's right to deny federal recognition of same-sex marriages. And of course, two years after that, in Obergefell, Justice Scalia wrote yet another dissent, and this time he argued that there was no constitutional right to same-sex marriage. So under Justice Scalia's judicial philosophy, which you have told us is your own, States could openly discriminate against the LGBTQ community. Same-sex couples could be denied the right to get married, and they could actually be thrown in jail if they engaged in sexual intercourse. There are an estimated 11 million adults who are identified as LGBTQ living in this country since Obergefell was decided in 2013, 2015. Approximately 293,000 same-sex couples have gotten married. And many of these people are rightly afraid that if you are confirmed, you will join with other conservative members of the court to roll back everything the LGBTQ community has gained over the past two decades and push them back into the closet. Now, two sitting justices are already calling for Obergefell to be narrowed, if not outright overturned. Just last week, Justices Thomas and Alito issued a statement concerning concurring with the court's decision to deny cert in Davis v. Irmo, a case involving a former Kentucky County Court who refused to issue marriage certificates to same-sex couples. They accused the court of, and this is Justices Alito and Thomas, they accused the court of, quote, reading a right to same-sex marriage into the 14th Amendment even though that right is found nowhere in the text. And these two justices signaled that Oberg Obergefell is a problem that only the court 
can fix. So coupled with your use of the term sexual pre preference, coupled with your view on precedence and that a justice's view or her own analysis of the constitutionality uh, should overtake or overcome um, precedence if it's in conflict. So this is why so many people in the LGBTQ community are so concerned that you would in fact join the signaling that these two justices have already put out there that Obergefell will fall by the wayside. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Judge Barrett, thank you so much um, for being here today with your beautiful family. Yet once again, we appreciate the support that you are showing to Judge Barrett by being here today. And Judge, I just want to offer you the opportunity at this point. Is there anything from earlier today that you feel you need more time to respond to? Um, thank you, Senator Ernst. I, I would like to just make a quick follow on to some of Senator Hirono's comments. Um, one, you know, I've said a number of times during the hearing that I can't comment or grade existing precedent, and I want to be clear that the point of doing that is not to say whether I agree or disagree with it. It's not to implicitly signal that I do disagree with it. It's designed to be neutral. So in saying that I couldn't opine on whether Obergefell was rightly decided or not, I was certainly not indicating disagreement with it. The point of not answering was to simply say it's inappropriate for me to say a response. And the second point was to say that I certainly didn't mean and you know would never mean to use a term that would cause any offense in the LGBTQ community. So if I did, I greatly apologize for that. I simply meant to be referring to Obergefell's holding with respect to same-sex marriage. Thank you for that. I appreciate the clarification. And it goes back to the discussion that you had with Senator Sass on the black robes. Um, when you put that robe on, you are neutral, correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. So I did want to go back because um, the issue of coronavirus has come up yet once again in the committee room. And I just wanted to, to make a point and clarify that uh, the Senate GOP did bring up a relief bill a number of weeks ago. And in that bill, there was a, a $300 boost in weekly unemployment insurance benefits. There was a, a second pass at Paycheck Protection Program for our small businesses. Um, there was additional $105 billion for K through 12 schools and colleges um, with new scholarship programs and uh, $15 billion to help working parents find accessible childcare options. There were supports for farmers and ranchers impacted by the pandemic. Uh, there was $31 billion for development and distribution of vaccines, drugs, and other medical supplies, uh, $16 billion for testing and contract contact tracing, there was loan forgiveness for the Postal Service, liability protections for our schools and health care providers, and an expanded charitable deduction for contributions um, made during this pandemic, and many, many other things. It, it was a very, very good bill. It was what we could agree upon, but um, I would note that Senate Democrats did block those provisions that would have gone to help families like Veronica and others in Iowa that are suffering from the pandemic and our, of course, our greatest sympathies to those that have been impacted all across the United States. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record. There's three letters here uh, for the committee, committee and an op-ed, a letter of support from uh, 48 Christian Women Scholars, uh, the second is a letter from a group of governors all across the country, including our own Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds, um, strongly supporting the nomination of Judge Barrett. The third is a record um, a letter for, from Tracy Lovett, uh, who was with Judge Barrett while they both served on the SCOTUS clerk class of 1998. And then there's also an editorial by Derek Moeller, a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law that appeared in the Gazette of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And uh, this professor 
had Judge Barrett as his evidence professor at Notre Dame Law School, and he does say she treated all law students from all backgrounds with dignity and respect. If I could have those entered into the record. Without please. objection. Thank you. And Judge Barrett, I am pro-life. I am pro-life. And I see that judged by your faith, and as has been aptly pointed out many times over um, by our colleagues across the aisle, that, that you are pro-life. But once again, can we reiterate um, your stance as a judge? Um, so as a judge, my personal moral beliefs, which I have not, that I can think of, I am not expressing them publicly right now because now that I am a judge, I can't sign statements like that one that I did 15 years ago. Um, but my policy views, my moral convictions, my religious beliefs do not bear on how I decide cases, nor should they, it would be, you know, an, mm -hmm. it would be in conflict with my judicial oath. And I, I know that you consider yourself to be an originalist, as you discussed earlier uh, with Senator Sass. And it seems that adhering to the originals, originalist view would naturally lead a judge to carry out her constitutional duty of impartiality when applying the law. And adhering to this philosophy as a judge takes real courage. And the courage you have displayed thus far as a federal judge prompted a coalition of groups to send me a letter supporting your nomination. Susan B. Anthony List led this coalition letter that I would like to submit to the committee for the record. And I know this is going to make a number of uh, members on the committee just very squeamish uh, because they are a pro-life organization. Uh, but with this in mind, I want to take a moment to read part of this letter. Quote, Judge Barrett has proven herself to handle disputes impartially, approaching cases as a textualist and originalist who loves the Constitution. She is a jurist who rightly leaves politics to politicians and legislating to legislators. And I'll quote further. Quite apart from whatever policy views she may have on the matter, Judge Barrett reasons to a proper result in each case before her. As a federal appellate judge appropriately following controlling precedent, in February 2019, she joined a panel decision upholding a law creating a buffer zone around abortion facilities. This buffer or bubble zone case being referred to is Price versus City of Chicago. Judge Barrett, could you please give us an overview of the city ordinance that was challenged here and explain how precedent established by the Supreme Court's Hill decision influenced your reasoning of the case? Yes, I was on a panel. There was a challenge to a bubble zone ordinance, which essentially means um, it, it was, how to describe it, it limited where abortion protesters could go to do sidewalk counseling or leafleting were the things that they identified as um, the, the activities they desired to undertake in the expression of speech outside of the abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. um, the Supreme Court has a case called Hill versus Colorado, and that case said that such bubble zones, especially because this one in Chicago was nearly identical, as I recall, with the one that was at stake in Hill, um, said that they did not violate the First Amendment. And so our panel, you know, at, we're bound by that precedent. Our panel applied that precedent. And so as you say, that was a case involving abortion, but my duty as a judge was to follow the governing law, and that governing law in that case was Hill. Absolutely, and thank you for that clarification. And I think it was important to point that out because in that case, using precedent, it did favor um, that abortion clinic. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to uh, submit this for the record. Thank you. Um, now turning to a topic of agency rulemaking, really sexy topic, not something that we have, not something that we have talked about um, as of yet. But as I mentioned yesterday, when Congress makes laws that overstep the Constitution, 
it can be felt all across the state of Iowa, whether it's in the streets of Council Bluffs, Iowa, or in the farm fields over in Clinton County. But Congress isn't the only body capable of overstep. Executive agencies can be just as guilty as the, of this as we've seen in Iowa. In 2018, as a judge on the Seventh Circuit, you helped decide a Clean Water Act case, specifically Orchard Hill Building Company versus Army Corps of Engineers. The decision found that the federal government did not provide enough evidence to justify its decision to deem 13 acres of Illinois wetlands as a water of the U.S. I'm very supportive of a less expansive definition of WOTUS and am encouraged by how you approach this decision. Farmers in Iowa are also encouraged by this development. I believe then, as I do now, that the Obama administration's clean water rule or the WOTUS rule was unconstitutional. But I also want to talk to you about agency rulemaking that I believe was constitutional, which is illustrated in a, a case that uh, the Tenth Circuit Court has recently ruled on, specifically Renewable Fuels Association versus EPA. At issue in this case were three exemptions the EPA granted to oil companies, allowing them to avoid their obligations to blend renewable fuel under the Clean Air Act's renewable fuel standard. These oil refinery exemptions, which were not disclosed to the public, were challenged by renewable fuel producers who said that they only found out about the waivers because of investigative news reports. The Tenth Circuit concluded in this case that the renewable fuels producers were injured by the EPA's exemptions and thus had standing to sue. The court also found that the EPA exceeded its statutory authority in granting those petitions because the agency may only extend previously existing waivers. In the case of these three refiners, there was nothing to extend because they had let their exemptions lapse. In other words, the three refineries had not received continuously extended extended exemptions in the years preceding their petitions as required by the statute. However, in the wake of this Tenth Circuit decision, small refineries flooded the EPA with 67 petitions for retroactive waivers, some dating back as far as 2011, in an attempt to go back in time and establish a chain of continuously extended exemptions. These oil companies have also appealed to the Tenth Circuit decision to, or the Tenth Circuit decision to the Supreme Court. So while I'm not going to ask you to speak on all of this <laughs> and what is going on, um, the, the problem here, bottom line, is that the EPA wasn't following the law. They took the law that Congress passed, they twisted it and interpreted it for the benefit of oil producers and that harmed our Iowa farmers. Um, I know, again, you can't speak on how you would rule, rule on these cases, especially those that could be pending before the Supreme Court. But tell me, how do agencies, how should they interpret the laws that are passed by Congress? Well, I think that the court's role in reviewing the lawfulness of agency action, it's largely governed by the Administrative Procedure Act, mm -hmm. um, which governs the way that agencies can do their business and, and outlines what their authority can be. There's also a doctrine called Chevron, which is named after mm -hmm. a case. Right. And many times, if we're talking about a Chevron issue, we're talking about an issue of statutory interpretation. It sounds like that's mostly mm -hmm. what you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. And an agency, you know, when, when a court reviews whether an agency has exceeded its lawful authority, it goes to the statute that you and Congress enact and interprets that statute, looks at the text, and tries to tell whether you've given, given the agency, given the EPA in your example, um, leeway to adopt policies. And that leeway would be present if you had ambiguity in the statute that left the decision to the agency. But if the agency goes farther than the text of the statute permits, then it is the role of a court to say that that action you know, was in conflict with the statute and mm -hmm. therefore illegal. 
And what happens then if there is an actual question on the intent of the law? Um, well, a statute in this context, in a context of a Chevron type challenge to agencies and agencies' interpretation of it, you would interpret the statute in the same way that you would interpret any other statute. So as I was talking with Senator Sass about earlier, um, my own approach to it would be textualism. And so in my approach to language, the intent of the statute is best expressed through the words. So looking at what the words would communicate to a skilled user of the language. Very good. Well, I appreciate it. We do have a little bit of time remaining. So again, I just want to thank you. I want to thank your family very much for lending their support to you through this process. It can be a bit grueling. Um, but I do have to say, though, your uh, temperament throughout the entire hearing has been truly commendable. So thank you so much. Um, I look forward to working with you further. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will uh, reserve my time. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Uh, Judge, are you okay to do two more? Sure. So, Senator Booker, Senator Crapo, then we'll take a 20 minute so break to grab a bite to eat and finish up. Senator Booker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor. Hi, Senator. Uh, so, I uh, spoke yesterday and I appreciate the attention which you gave me talking about how this is not a normal time. And I want to reiterate that uh, one more time as cogently as I can because this is. Um, something like we've just never seen before in the history of the United States. Uh, we're not just uh, days away from Election Day, but people are actually voting right now. Uh, close to a million people in my state have already voted, and about 10 million people uh, voted nationally. The only other time a Supreme Court nomination hearing happened this close to an election was, as you probably know, was under President Lincoln, uh, who declined to offer a, a nomination before the election, but we are in the midst of an ongoing election right now at a very contentious time in our democracy. It's probably not normal also because uh, people are already speaking in this election and it seems like we are rushing through this process when many of my colleagues on this committee said just four years ago uh, that we should not proceed to fill a vacancy that opened 269 days before an election. And the words of some of my colleagues, including uh, the chairman, was to use our words against us, we would not do exactly what we're doing right now. It's also not normal, clearly, uh, because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And we have tens of thousands of new COVID infections every single day, widespread food insecurity, like we haven't seen these kind of food lines in my lifetime, I don't think. People across our country are struggling, and unfortunately, we see that we are right now not dealing with this crisis. We are instead uh, literally having closed the Senate virtually and the only proceedings that are being allowed to go forward are not the issues of helping people who are struggling, but dealing with this. And it's not normal that we have a president who has repeatedly attacked the legitimacy of our institutions. So much so, and I've never seen something like this in my lifetime, that his former cabinet members, his former chief of staff, all talk about the danger he represents to uh, the country we all love. In fact, probably one of the most respected person on both sides of the aisle General Mattis, who served as our Secretary of Defense, went as far as to say, a man who has been very reserved in his comments, that Donald Trump is a danger to our democracy. We are at a time that the legitimacy of our institutions are at stake. And it's not normal that the President would further cast a shadow over your nomination, as well as the independence of the court, by saying he would only nominate justices who would tear down Roe v. Wade, who would overturn ACA. And it's not normal amidst this all, and, and again, something that I find hard to believe that we're talking about, is that we have a president who cannot commit himself to the peaceful transfer of power. Now, in the light of this abnormality, most Americans think we should wait on your nomination. Uh, it's an illegitimate process. Most Americans think that we should wait. Today, and I, and I appreciate uh, you not following the news, but 90 of your fellow faculty members from Notre Dame wrote an open letter calling on you for the sake of our democracy. They didn't speak to whether you're right or left or your judicial philosophy or qualifications. They wrote an impassioned letter for the sake of our democracy. They publicly issued a statement asking that your nomination, that you pull yourself, withdraw from this nomination process and have it be halted until after the November election. This is not normal. And again, 
The overwhelming majority of Americans want to wait, but my colleagues here are not listening. And so I'm going to ask you some questions that if you had told me five years ago that would be questions asked at a Supreme Court nomination hearing, I would have thought they wouldn't be possible. But unfortunately, I think they're necessary to ask you. And I hope that you'll give me direct answers. The first one, um, you've already spoken towards issues of racism and how you deplore it. But I, I want to just ask you very simply, and I, I imagine you'll give me a very short, resolute answer. Um, but you condemn white supremacy, correct? Yes. Thank you. I'm glad to see that you said that. I wish our president uh, would say that so resolutely and unequivocally as well. But we are at a time that Americans are literally fearful because their president cannot do that in the resolute manner in which you did. I'm, I'm sorry that that question had to even be asked at this time. Here's another one. Do you believe that every president should make a commitment unequivocally and resolutely to the peaceful transfer of power? Well, Senator, that seems to me to be pulling me in a little bit into this question of whether the president has said that he would not peacefully leave office. And so to the extent that this is a political controversy right now, as a judge, I want to stay out of it, and I don't want to express a view on. So Judge, I, I appreciate you what you've said about respecting our founding fathers, about the originalism. It's remarkable that we're at a place right now that this is becoming a question and a topic, but I'm asking you, in light of our founding fathers, in light of our traditions, in light that everyone who serves in that office has sworn an oath where they, quote, swear to preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, I'm just asking you, should a president commit themselves, like our, our founding fathers, I think, had a clear intention, like the grace that George Washington showed, to the peaceful transfer of power. Is that something that presidents should be able to do? Well, one of the beauties of America from the beginning of the Republic is that we have had peaceful transfers of power and that disappointed voters have accepted the new leaders that come into office. And that's not true in every country. And I think it is part of the genius of our Constitution and the good faith and goodwill of the American people that we haven't had the situations that have arisen in so many other countries where there have been, um, where those issues have been present. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you think that the president has the power to pardon himself for any past or future crimes he, have me, me, he may have committed against the United States of America? Well, Senator Booker, that would be a legal question. That would be a constitutional question. And so in keeping with my obligation not to give hints, previews, or forecasts of how I would resolve the case, that's not one that I can answer. Well, I, I think I agree with you that it is an issue right now, something I never thought would be an issue before. But it is an issue that our president may intend to pardon himself for future crimes or past crimes. If a president is personally responsible for several hundred million dollars in debt while he's in office, potentially to foreign entities, do you think he has a responsibility to disclose who his lenders are, especially given the emoluments clause? Well, Senator, there's litigation about the Emoluments Clause. I think it was in the Fourth Circuit. I don't know where it stands, but that clearly is an issue that's being litigated, and, and one present in courts is not one on which I can offer an opinion. Thank you. I think it's disturbing that we're having this conversation. I think it's disturbing that we have a president that has brought what should be settled in the minds of most Americans. Presidents should reveal what their debts are especially if they're two foreign nations. Uh, presidents should not be able to pardon themselves for future crimes. Presidents should condemn white supremacy. Presidents should commit themselves to the peaceful transfer of power. Judge Barrett, you, you've seen uh, a lot of my colleagues and I put up pictures of, of people in this room and the stories we've told, and I've appreciated the, the way you've listened. Uh, it's not a stretch to understand why a lot of Americans are afraid right now. All we have to do is look at the statements uh, and actions of my Republican colleagues, the Republican Party platform, and the president who nominated you. And even some of your own words, which have been read by my previous colleagues around the Affordable Care Act. President Trump, who nominated you for this vacancy, has not only explicitly stated 
that the Supreme Court should overturn the Affordable Care Act, but he promised that he would nominate a judge who would, quote, do the right thing, unlike Bush's appointee, John Roberts, on Obamacare. The president has tried to do this legislatively. He's tried to do it administratively. He's failed time and time again, but he's promised over and over again to tear down the Affordable Care Act. Meanwhile, all of my Republican colleagues on this committee, except for one, has voted to overturn the Affordable Care Act because House and Senate Republicans have tried to do it 70 times. The one Republican who did not was an attorney general who joined 20 state attorney generals who sued to overturn the Affordable Care Act. You yourself said, and now I will quote you, that Justice, Chief Justice Roberts pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. The same Chief Justice Roberts that Trump implied didn't do the right thing. And so Judge Barrett, you, you have said that if you were on the court, you will hear and consider the arguments from both sides. I was actually very interested when you said that you would put your family members in the shoes of litigants on both sides. Given all that you've heard said over and over again about the intentions to tear away the Affordable Care Act, to end the Affordable Care Act, given what you've heard about the people who rely on it, given the commitment you know that President Trump's to said explicitly to only appoint judges who would overturn the ACA, is it unreasonable for people to fear, putting yourself in the shoes of, of people, is it unreasonable for the people that have been up here as in their pictures, is it unreasonable for them to fear that the ACA would be overturned if you were confirmed to the court? Well, Senator, I want to stress to you, Senator Booker, as I've stressed to some of your colleagues today, that I am my own person. I, I'm I, independent under Article 3, and you know I don't take orders from the executive branch or the legislative branch. I, I understand that. I guess, I mean, can I restate my question? Because I don't think you are understanding it. Sure. I'm just asking you as an act of empathy, can you understand the fears that are exhibited by the people we put up? I, I don't, the two people I put up, Michelle and Merritt, I don't know what their political party is. I don't know if they're going to vote for me. I'm on the ballot. I don't know. I just know that they were people that wanted their voices to be heard because they are afraid right now and what your nomination represents. All I'm asking is can you empathize with that? Can you understand that? Senator, I can certainly empathize with people who are struggling. I can empathize with people who lack health care. You know, one of the things that was so striking to me when we went to get our daughter Vivian from the orphanage in Haiti was the lack of access to basic things like antibiotics. And it just made me appreciate the fact that we had access to health care. So I can certainly empathize with all of that. And with respect to the ACA, you know, should I be confirmed? And, and as I've said, I would consider the issue of recusal a threshold question of law and whether to hear that case. But should I be confirmed and should I sit and hear the case? As I assured you, I would consider all the arguments on both sides. And one of the important issues in that case is whether, even if the mandate has become unconstitutional since it was zeroed out, whether it would be consistent with the will of Congress for the whole act to fall. It's a statutory question, not a constitutional one. Or whether the mandate could be severed out and the rest of the act stand. And so the task of every justice who hears this case will be to look at the structure of the statute and look at its text to determine whether it was the will of Congress and, when and, they passed the ACA. And Judge, I apologize, especially after the good behavior that was noted that we shouldn't be talking over each other. My no, time that's is, okay, Senator. My, my time is, is, is running quickly. Sure. Um, I, I guess I just, as a guy who um, looks at justices, uh, I was just asking you to, to express that you understand the fear that's in America right now because you heard story after story of people who don't know if they are going to be able to afford their health care, who don't know if they will be denied insurance coverage. And I'm going to move on because of the short time, but I was just asking you is can you understand the fear giving a president that has said that if they will put justice on there that will tear down the Affordable Care Act, thus taking away health care for millions of Americans. There is fear in our country right now. But I want to move now to earlier what Senator Durbin and you discussed. They asked about your views on racism and the role of courts in, assess in addressing racial justice. 
I was troubled that you said that racial justice and equality, and I'll quote you, um, or how to tackle the issue of making it better, those things are policy questions. I think that that's the quote. Um, how to tackle the issue or of making it better, the racial injustice, um, those things are policy questions and not for the court. Um, the federal government's own data, and, and this is, I think you and I referenced this in our, in our private conversation, which I appreciate. Um, you, you said you were familiar with a lot of the data about the, the uh, discrimination within our criminal justice system. For example, the U.S. Sentencing Commission shows that prosecutors are more, this is a, the U.S. Sentencing Commission said that prosecutors are more likely to charge black defendants with offenses that carry harsh mandatory minimum sentences than similarly situated white or whites. Are you familiar with that, the U.S. Sentencing Commission? I'm not familiar with that particular sentence. Does that surprise you? Um. I, I mean, I, I don't know, Senator Booker, that seems an odd thing for me to express an opinion out. As, as you I'm not asking I, you, these are facts. These are just facts. And as you and I, I'm not familiar with that study. As you and I discussed, I am aware that there is evidence and that there have been studies of systemic racism or implicit bias in the justice system. So I am aware of that issue. I, I was not aware. You, of you're aware of evidence that there is implicit racial bias? I am aware that there have been studies showing that implicit bias is present in many contexts, including in the criminal justice system. Okay. I, I'm just going to read some of these other uh, statistics because I think they're really important, and this is independent data from the U.S. Sentencing Commission that black defendants, again, are compared with similarly situated white defendants who are subject to three-strike sentencing enhancements at a significant higher rate, which on average added 10 years to sentences. You, you're not familiar with that study? I'm not familiar with that study. Do, do, do such cases come before the Seventh Circuit? The, the three strikes cases? Yes. The, um, are you talking about the three strikes, the Prison Litigation Reform Act cases where they're struck out, or are you talking about? I'm asking cases in the criminal justice system that relate to racial bias, do they come before the court? So certainly we have discrimination cases. Certainly there are 1983 cases or Title VII cases. I would imagine so. And, 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 and in, those, in your research for those cases, you familiarize yourself with a lot of the data on the discrimination within the system? That, you know, we familiarize ourselves with the arguments the parties make and the information that they put in the record. And in some cases, uh, I have had parties submit, or it's submitted in the district court technically and then made part of the record. And, and so I just want to be clear, do you believe that there is, in fact, implicit racial bias in the criminal justice system? Well, Which is just a yes or no question. Do you believe, in fact, that there is implicit racial bias in the criminal justice system? Senator, it would be hard to imagine a system, a criminal justice system as big as ours, not having any implicit bias in it. So is that a yes? Senator, yes, I think that in our large criminal justice system, it would be inconceivable that there wasn't some implicit bias. Okay. Uh, over the last two years, about 121 of President Trump's judicial nominees to the federal court have said unequivocally that there is implicit racial bias within the justice system, um, quite clearly. Um, I'd like to turn to an opinion you wrote last year about race discrimination, Smith versus Illinois Department of Transportation. The case involved an African-American uh, traffic patrol officer who had been fired from the Illinois Department of Transportation. This employee claimed that he had been subjected to hostile work environment uh, and that the supervisor called him the N-word. Uh, but you ruled that the employee had failed to make the case that he had been fired in retaliation for his complaints about race discrimination. And now you acknowledged that, quote, and I'm, I'm, you, and I'm going to quote you now, the N-word is an egregious racial epithet, but you went on to insist that the employee couldn't, quote, win simply by proving that the N-word was uttered at them and that he failed to show that, the, that his supervisor's use of the N-word against him, quote, altered the conditions of his employment and created a hostile or abusive working environment. And you said that even based on his own subjective experience, this black employee had, quote, no evidence that his supervisors were lashing out at him because he was black. I'm very surprised to, to have to make this point at all, but even a staunch conservative like Justice Kavanaugh, in my questioning of him, spoke to the obvious harm here in a way that you don't seem to. He wrote in a court of appeals case that, quote, being called the N-word by a supervisor suffices by itself to establish a racially hostile work environment. And you disagreed with that. 
Why do you believe that the law recognizes the harm that is afflicted on a black person in this country when they are called that word by their work supervisor, or by anyone really for that matter, and, the, and all the history dredged up in that word, centuries of harm, why, why do you believe differently than Justice Kavanaugh? Well, Senator Booker, that opinion does not take a position different than Justice Kavanaugh. It expressly and wrote, was written very carefully to leave open the possibility that one use of that word would be sufficient to make out a hostile work environment claim. The problem was that in that case, the evidence that the plaintiff had relied on to establish the hostile work environment involved other, you know, he was driving the wrong way down a ramp and then expletives were used, not the N-word. Um, and the N-word was used after his termination had already begun. And he didn't argue under clear Supreme Court precedent, I didn't make up the objective subject development. Under clear Supreme Court precedent, both are required. And he didn't say that it altered the terms of, that's not how he pled or made his case. And it was a unanimous panel decision. And, and forgive me if I'm reading your, this case wrong, but you're saying to me he was not claiming that he had a hostile work environment he, and, and, that, and that it is in the fact pattern that this supervisor called him the N-word, um, and, and, and that does not constitute a hostile work environment in the way that Justice Kavanaugh said clearly that it does? No, Senator, I think you're mischaracterizing what I said with all respect. In that opinion, the evidence that he introduced to show the hostile work environment was the use of expletives when he drove the wrong way down. He was, he was hired to be a safety driver for the Illinois Department of Transportation. And he based his hostile work environment claim on the use of expletives at him based on poor work performance. That was what he relied upon. And then his termination proceedings had begun. He didn't tie the use of the N-word into the evidence that he introduced for his hostile work environment claim. And so as a panel, we were constrained to decide based on the case the plaintiff had presented before us. So the panel very carefully wrote the opinion to make clear that it was possible for one use of the N-word to be enough to establish a hostile work environment claim if it were pled that way. I'm going to turn to the AutoZone case you discussed earlier with Senator Feinstein. The initial panel of three judges that examined the case ruled against Kevin Stuckey. You were not a part of that initial panel. But you did have an opportunity to vote on whether to hear the case before the entire court. You had an opportunity to affirm the bedrock principle enshrined in Brown versus Board of Education uh, about separate but equal, really to say that separate is inherently unequal. But you voted no. You didn't think the full court needed to examine this deliberate segregation of employees by race. Uh, but the judges on the court disagreed with you. In fact, three judges explained, uh, we know that, quote, deliberate racial segregation by its very nature has an adverse effect on the people subjected to it on one of the essential teachings of, of Brown versus Board of Education, which I know you're familiar with, is, is that idea of separate being inherently unequal. Um, what, why did you think that these separate but equal facilities were lawful, or why didn't you see this as a practice that was worthy of, worthy of closer scrutiny? Um, Senator, as I said earlier to Senator, Senator Feinstein, I did not make a merits decision on that case, and I wasn't on the initial panel. The calculation of whether to take a case on banc is different than a merits determination. So I wasn't reaching any decision about whether Title VII applied to that situation or not. Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure, I think it's 35 that governs on banc proceedings, sets out standards. And this case didn't create an intra-circuit conflict or an inter-circuit conflict. And so I didn't think it met Federal Rule of, all my vote means is that I didn't feel like it satisfied the elevated high standard for on banc review, not that I thought it was correct. There's a lot of deference to panels in my court. Right, but I mean, three judges disagreed with you, and these were judges appointed by Republican and Democrat presidents. They saw the case about separate and equal really compelling. They thought the issue deserved closer scrutiny, and you had an opportunity to join them, but you didn't. You referred earlier to the problem of implicit racial bias in our system, this idea that despite the color of our skin, people can get a hearing, people can get justice. And this denial um, uh, seems to me that you disagree with the, the, the prioritization, at least, of your uh, three colleagues. Um, Senator, eight of my colleagues chose not to take the case on banc. And the on banc 
process is a different one than the merits decision-making process. To decide that case on the merits and know whether I would come out the same way, I would have had to participate in it and read the briefs and hear the arguments. And so and the three justices were wrong, then you disagree with your colleagues? The three judges who dissented, my three colleagues whom I respect very much, thought that it met the standard for en banc review. That's a different question than the merits, and so I did disagree with them about whether to take it en banc. So I was within the group of eight colleagues that decided that maybe that would be an issue we could take up in the future, but not to disturb the panel decision then. So Thank that's you. not a merits determination. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, moving quickly, um, Judge Barrett, uh, five years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution protects the rights of same-sex couples to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, a Burgerfell case, which has been discussed today. The court declared the Constitution grants LGBTQ Americans equal dignity in the eyes of the law. Hundreds of thousands of couples have built their lives on this decision. I've married some of them myself. On that day five years ago, the court fulfilled really that ideal of equal justice under law. Um, and yet now, the same-sex marriage is legal. We've seen efforts to try to undermine that decision. Justice Ginsburg wrote about legal rules that would, quote, create two kinds of marriage, full marriage and skim milk marriage. I firmly believe that our laws shouldn't allow discrimination against people on the basis of who they are. I have a number of questions on this topic, if I can get through them, but I wanted to offer you a, a further opportunity to address the issue that I don't think you got to fully address that my colleague brought up. When you did use the term sexual preference earlier today, rather than sexual orientation, is there a difference and what is it? Senator, I really, in using that word, did not mean to imply that I think that, you know, um, that it's a matter, not a matter of, that it's not an immutable characteristic or that it's solely a matter of preference. I honestly did not mean any offense or to make any statement by that. But by what you just said, you understand about that immutable characteristic. In other words, that one's uh, sexuality is not a preference, it is who they are. Is that what you're saying? Senator, I'm saying I was not trying to make any comment on it. I fully respect all the rights of the LGBT community. Obergefell is an important precedent of the court. I reject any kind of discrimination on any sort of basis. So you, you, you say Obergefell is a decision. Well, what about your two colleagues? Excuse me, forgive me. What about uh, Alito and Thomas who have said uh, that the court has created a problem that only it can fix they, they clearly don't see that as a precedent worth following. You, you just said Obergefell is a precedent. I said Obergefell, of course, Obergefell is, an, is a precedent. It is an important precedent. As you pointed out, there are reliance interests now on Obergefell as to why Justices Alito and Thomas have called for its overruling in, in the, the recent opinion that they issued. I can't really speak to They call it a thing. problem. Do you know what they're referring to? Well, Senator Booker, I, I don't know what Justices Thomas and Alito were thinking that you'd have to ask them. So we're now seeing cases where gay and lesbian Americans are being denied equal access to Social Security survivor's benefits. One same-sex couple in Arizona was together for 43 years, got married, but one of them died six months later, and now the surviving spouse is being denied benefits uh, because they weren't married long enough after 43 years uh, together in love. Does this violate the, uh, the rule of equal treatment that the Supreme Court has laid down? Well, in Obergefell, could you repeat the, the facts of this? They were, they, were, they were together for 43 years. The law changed and allowed them to marry. They married, one died soon after, and they're being denied survivor benefits because they weren't married long enough because the law wrongfully denied them that equality. Um, so that would be a legal question that would have to come up and be decided in the context of a real case. I mean, it's plain that Obergefell recognizes the full right of same-sex couples to marry, but the question of what are the implications of that for benefits would be something that would come up with the, before so, a court later. But so. there are some precedents. Maybe I can ask a different sure. question. Can a hairdresser refuse to serve an interracial couple's wedding because they disapprove of racial, interracial marriages? Well, Loving versus Virginia follows directly from Brown, and it makes unconstitutional any attempt to prohibit or for, forbid interracial marriage. Um, could they refuse to serve a black couple's wedding? Could a baker or a florist refuse to, uh, Title VII prohibits any sort of discrimination on the basis of race by places of public accommodation. How, how about an interfaith wedding? Um, well, Senator, I feel like you're taking me down a road of hypotheticals that 
is going to get me into trouble here because, as you know, I can't opine on how cases would be resolved. And I've said that whether they're easy questions or hard questions, I can't do that. So I'm not the lawyer that you are, but you seem to honor the precedents that are enough to protect discrimination against African Americans, interracial couples, but you stop on saying that unequivocally about um, people stopping on religious discrimination or the, uh, against a Muslim couple's wedding or an interfaith wedding? Well, Senator, I think you know what Title VII says, as I'm sure you know, is Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, on the basis of sex. Um, I, I, all I can do is say refer to the statute. But of course, as to whether there would be evidence to show or whether any particular encounter between a customer and a florist or a baker violated Title VII, that would be a case that would have to come up, you know, as I discussed with Senator Sass, with real litigants litigated on a full record. So I, you're asking a series of hypotheticals. And, and so I'm assuming that you will not respond, uh, or, or for the same reasons you've uttered before, you will not respond about whether a florist can refuse to serve a same-sex couple. Well, I, it sounds like you're on your way to talking about Masterpiece Cake Shop and some of the cases that are very hotly contested and winding their way through the courts. And so I want to make sure that I'm not in a position where I'm eliciting any views that would bear on litigation that's very active. Well, and, and I guess you maybe can understand if we go back to um, the, the question that both I and, and Senator Hirono asked you about um, what, what you said you, you didn't mean to offend about whether it's a choice or not. These are about are they immutable characteristics of an individual, like their race. Um, um, I just uh, want to just close by saying the, the story of um, some folks in my home community of New Jersey, Emily, Sonessa, and Jan Moore. They've been together for 51 years. They've raised three children. At last count, and I think that that's a good way of putting it, uh, they have 18 grandchildren and 20 great-grandchildren. And you know how families are. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a long time, they had to keep their relationship and their love a secret. Finally, one same-sex marriage, when, once same-sex marriage became legal, they got married. And thanks to the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell, they can now enjoy their full rights. Judge Barrett, uh, you're asking the United States Senate to agree to have you replace Justice Ginsburg, which would tilt the balance of the court further to the right. Remember that it was Justice Ginsburg who warned against full marriage for some couples and skim milk marriage for others. Like so many couples in my state of New Jersey and around the country, Emily Jan are worried about what might happen if the Supreme Court starts to peel back some of their hard fought rights. They believe that their love should be valued by their government and equally as a love of any other people. And they believe a lot of the rights that they now enjoy, which were denied in the past, to African Americans even, to interracial couples. They believe that they should be able to preserve them. And so I, my time's expired. You've been very generous, and the, as has the chairman, in allowing me to go over. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you more tomorrow. Thank you, Senator Booker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, Senator Crapo, then we'll take a, a break uh, for supper. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, we're four away from, from the finish today. <laughs> uh, before I begin, I do have a couple of letters I'd like to submit for the record. One from the Speaker of the Idaho House, Scott Bedke, in support of Judge Barrett's nomination, and the other from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, also in support of the nomination, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you. And uh, Judge Barrett, I am going to, uh, well, I'll get to some new material, but a lot of what I do at the beginning uh, will be going over things you've already said, and you must think you've said them way too much, had to say them way too many times. <clears throat> I'm going to just be sure that we get some things nailed down once more. Uh, before I do that, though, there's been a lot said today that really needs to be responded to. Uh, this won't be a question to you, these first two. I'm just going to quickly respond to a couple of them. Uh, the first was one of my colleagues, uh, Senator Whitehouse, uh, spent a very long presentation trying to make the case that there is a lot of dark money out there. Uh, trying to control the Supreme Court nominations and this whole process and, and the situation that we face today. Um, I just want to set the records right. These are actually records straight. These are actually some statistics that Senator Cruz quickly went through when he spoke. 
But yeah, there is dark money in politics, and I think that we should get it out. What this means is that money that where you don't know who the real donors are behind the entity that's making the expenditure. Uh, fortunately, we're getting a lot of that out, but there's still a lot there. Uh, the impression, though, that was left was that uh, this dark money is all on one side. Uh, the reality is, uh, if you look at opensecrets.org, th this data is from 2016, but I've seen data even later into 2018. And it's, it's the same kind of statistics. And that is uh, that really the, the significant majority of the dark money is being spent in favor of the Democratic side rather than the Republican side. Of the top 20 organizations and individuals um, that they identified who contribute to super PACs who then utilize the money in the way that was talked about, um, 14 of them give exclusively to Democrats. Of the top 10 on that list, only two give to Republicans. So, and the totals, by the way, were $422 million in this report going to Democrats and $189 million going to Republicans. So yeah, there is money in the system which we can't identify. A lot of this money, by the way, is going into ads against you, Judge Barrett. But uh, we, can't, we can't get it all out yet. I think we ought to get it out, but let's not try to create the impression that this is just some one-sided circumstance that's happening in the country. The other thing I want to go over first before I get into my questions is the same thing I went over yesterday uh, <clears throat> because the allegations have been made again and again and again that somehow we are rushing this case and somehow we are violating the history and the precedent of the way the Senate operates and the way the presidency operates when there is a vacancy in an election year. Uh, some people count these things differently. There are, uh, there's a statistic that I will use that will count all, pres all vacancies that have happened, uh, whether the vacancy occurred in the election year or whether it just didn't get resolved until the election year. And, but it doesn't matter whether you just take the ones that arose in the election year or if you take all of them that were resolved in the election year. The precedent is the same. It's overwhelming. In every single case, the sitting president made a nomination, every case. In those cases in which the Senate was of the same party as the president, I'm going to use the one for all of the nominations that actually were dealt with in an election year. There were 29. 19 of them were when the party was the same as the president. 17 of those 19, the party moved ahead with the president's nomination and the nomination was confirmed. Ten of those times, it was when the party was not the party of the president. In nine of those cases, the party that was not the party of the president declined to move forward until the next president was elected. Now, that's the precedent of the Senate. That's what happened in 2016 when the Senate was of a different party than the president, and it's what's happening now when the Senate is the party of the president. And those are the facts, and that's the precedent. In terms of the timing, I, I went through the timing then as well. I think your hearing started, Judge Barrett, on the 16th day from the day you were nominated. Uh, there's a bunch of members of the Supreme Court whose nomination hearings started sooner than that, including Ruth Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so the fact is that uh, normal procedures, appropriate timing, and appropriate policy and precedent is being followed here as we move forward. Now, having made those points once again, uh, I will, like I said, I will get into some new questions for you, but uh, I'm gonna go over a lot of things that you've already talked about because I really think it's important that we just make it as clear as possible. You've talked about originalism and textualism. Is there a difference between those two things? They are the same basic approach, but we use originalism mostly to refer to interpreting the constitutional text, and textualism we use to refer to interpreting statutory text. But they both involve the same principle, which is that one comes to the law and interprets it as it would have been understood by those at the time, if it's either its ratification in the case of the Constitution or its enactment in the case of a statute, and that the law remains the law until it's lawfully changed through democratic processes. All right, thank you. And I assume you would consider yourself both an originalist and a textualist. I do, Senator Crapo. And you've written a, a quite a bit about precedent and stare decisis. Could you just once again tell us what that is 
uh, and uh, maybe you could make a distinction between what it means at the appellate level and at the Supreme Court level. Sure. So there are two kinds of stare decisis. There's horizontal stare decisis, which is, say, the Supreme Court's obligation to follow its own precedent. And then there's vertical stare decisis, which is my obligation right now on the Seventh Circuit to follow Supreme Court precedent because it sits above me in the federal judicial hierarchy. Um, precedent, it, for vertical precedent, there's no question. I mean, I can't buck what the Supreme Court does. It, it you know, sets the precedent and all lower courts must follow it. Right. For horizontal precedent, for example, on my own court right now on the Seventh Circuit, the court that renders a precedent does have the ability to reconsider it under certain circumstances. Otherwise, and errors don't get fixed, and Plessy versus Ferguson would still be the law of the land. So, and you will, I'm sure, tell me, what are those circum what are the rules there when you do horizontal reevaluation? Sure. So when a court decides whether or not to overrule a precedent, it considers, first of all, is it wrong? And how egregiously wrong is it? You know, that we can see in the Brown versus Board of Education decision how that factor played. You also consider reliance interests because, as I said before, stare decisis is short for stand by the thing decided and don't disturb the calm. So courts don't recklessly get in the business of just stirring up, you know, disrupting people's lives, um, you know, unless it's, it's the other factors counsel in favor of doing it. You consider whether the law has developed since the precedent in a way that undercuts the foundations of the precedent itself, precedent itself. Same for the facts. You also consider whether the precedent that you set has proved to be workable for the courts below you that must follow it. So in my case on the Seventh Circuit, that would mean the district courts. Have we set out a, a, an articulation of the law in a case that lower courts can actually use? And so uh, if I, to paraphrase here, if, if a judge in a horizontal situation, either a Supreme Court justice evaluating Supreme Court precedent mm -hmm. or a circuit court judge evaluating the circuit court's precedent, if they felt the precedent was wrong, that's not enough. That is not enough. And you have to have then the reliance and the other factors uh, all falling into the right circumstance uh, before a decision to actually overrule or overturn a precedent is made. That's true, and this might be a good time, Senator Crapo, for me to make one other point about horizontal stare decisis doctrine. Um, earlier, and I, I can't remember which interchange it was, um, someone was pointing out you know, that I said stare decisis should have weaker effect in constitutional cases. That's actually what the Supreme Court has said. That's a well-established principle of stare decisis doctrine itself. The court has said that it gives super strong effect to precedent in statutory cases, because you all can always step in and fix any errors of statutory interpretation the court might make. But the court itself has expressly said that it gives weaker stare decisis effect in constitutional cases because the only way to remedy an error is by constitutional amendment. So I just want to be clear that that is simply a restatement of the court's own doctrine. That wasn't something I invented. All right, I appreciate that. And you also mentioned earlier that there are some, I think you said six super precedents? Um, let's see, I can't remember how many are on the list, but as I said, it's in constitutional law scholarship. There are some precedents that scholars have identified as utterly beyond question that no serious person ever calls for their overruling. Could you, t I think Brown versus Board of Education would be one of those? Marbury versus Madison, which establishes the power of judicial review. Um, let's see, the cases, it's probably easier for me to just identify what the precedents stand for. So sure. the power of ju judicial review. Um, the power of the Supreme Court to review judgments from state courts, um, the proposition that the 14th Amendment applies only to state action, um, the incorporation of the Fourth Amendment and by implication the other bills of right, Bill of Rights, other rights in the Bill of Rights against the states. So they are, they are mostly structural kind of foundational principles, you know, and, and they're just so settled no one seriously challenges them All right. anymore. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think that that's very helpful. And in this hearing, you've been asked about at least three very uh, significant Supreme Court precedents, and you've been asked whether you were asked to commit to overturn them 
or uh, whether you've even had conversations with the president or his staff about them. One, and I just want you to, again, give your answer on that sure. because I want this to be very clear. Uh, Roe v. Wade, have you had any conversations with the president or with the White House staff, White House counsel, anyone, and have you made any commitments about how you would rule on any case dealing with that? I have not, Senator Crapo. Thank you. And the same set of questions with regard to Oger Obergefell. I've had no conversations with anyone in the White House staff about that case, my views of it, how I would rule. All right. And then finally, uh, the current case, uh, California v. Texas. No conversations at all. All right. Thank you. Now, you also earlier testified that there's a, dis a difference between uh, judicial decision making and the process of making a judicial decision versus, say, the process you would make as a professor when writing an article or what have you. Could you just quickly get into that with me? Sure. So a professor, um, when writing law review articles or doing academic critique, is kind of at a 10,000-foot level. You know, you're, you're not in the trenches like a judge is because you are not um, deciding it in the context of a real case with real litigants in front of you, the adversarial process where you have people on either side, where you hear arguments and you consult with your colleagues and you write your opinion. And I think one thing it's worth pointing out about the judicial process is that I have had the experience of changing my mind at various points along the way. I've gone into oral argument more than once thinking, you know, I was going to rule one way and then oral arguments changed my mind. Or mm -hmm. I've gone into conference and my colleagues have changed my mind. I've even changed my mind, and this is not uncommon on the court, once I started writing an opinion. Judges say, it won't write, you know, which means what you thought was right when you started writing it, you realize actually didn't really work out. So I think that process and the fact that judges keep an open mind all the way through is evidence of how the judicial process really is unique in our system, and it is a different enterprise than academic critique. Thank you. I, I've been able to observe that a little bit. I clerked on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. That's right. You told me that. And uh, so I've been able to observe that exact process in each of those steps that you talked about taking place. And, and you're right. That's how it happens when it's done properly. Um, next, I want to go to one, one more uh, specific kind of process type thing to make sure we all understand it right, and that's the recusal. Uh, interestingly, you've been asked by uh, my colleagues on the other side to assure that you have made no commitments about case law, but that to give a commitment on recusal. Uh, you have said that there is a process for recusal as well and that you would follow that, but could you please lay that out again once again for us? Yes, recusal is a question of law because 28 U.S.C. 455, the recusal statute, actually obligates a judge to recuse in certain cases of either actual bias or apparent bias. And there are Supreme Court precedents interpreting the range of a judge's obligations under that statute. There are also, you know, professional conduct committees to consult, and I think collaboration and consultation, as I've said before, with other justices is the typical practice according to Justice Ginsburg's description of it. So it is a legal question that's governed by statute and precedent, so it's not one that I can make an advanced resolution of. All right, thank you. <clears throat> now I want to move to, um, frankly, back to California v. Texas, or Texas, yeah, California v. Texas, and the uh, pre-existing conditions issue that has been raised by a number of my colleagues here. Uh, we've heard a lot about the Affordable Care Act yesterday and today. Uh, I serve on the Finance Committee as well as the Judiciary Committee, and so this is an issue I really care about a lot. I'm passionate about ensuring that all individuals, especially Idahoans, have affordable quality health care coverage and making sure that they have coverage for their pre-existing conditions is especially important. Uh, regardless of what one thinks about the Obamacare legislation, reasonable people can disagree about the totality of the success of Obamacare. And this is something that I think should be remembered. But many of the policies in Obamacare were policies that, on which we had agreement between Republicans and Democrats as we moved forward at that time trying to craft a health care law. People may recall this was being negotiated in the Finance Committee for a, quite a while before President Obama pulled it back and then brought his own statute out. And one of the things that we had agreement on was protecting pre-existing conditions back then. There was no fight over that. 
And uh, in fact, I think every single U.S. Senator wants to protect access to coverage for patients with pre-existing conditions, Republicans and Democrats. So here we are now talking about the Obamacare legislation that was pushed through the Senate when there was a Senate and a president of the same party and the ability to avoid a filibuster. And we're now looking at legislation challenging one part of that. Again, you've talked about this, but I'd, I'd like you just to set up this next question. There's a difference uh, between NFIB versus Sebelius, the case which you have made some commentary on, mm -hmm. and Texas v. California. Could you tell me the difference? Yes, NFIB versus Sebelius involved whether the mandate violated the, con it, it was framed initially as a case about whether the mandate um, violated the Commerce Clause. And the majority in that case, as you know, I've discussed in earlier interchanges, interpreted the mandate provision to be a tax rather than a penalty. And Chief Justice Roberts said that he thought it was justified as an exercise of Congress's taxing power, but would have been invalid under the Commerce Clause. Um, now, the new case that the Supreme Court is poised to hear involves a different question. Um, if the mandate, which has now been zeroed out, the, the initial question it does resemble NFIB versus Sebelius, because the initial question is, is something a tax if it's zero dollars? So is it still a tax? And if it's not a tax, can it be justified under Congress's taxing power? But severability, even assuming that it is no longer a tax because it's zeroed out, the next question is, if that provision is unconstitutional, does just that provision become inactive, so to speak, or does the whole statute fall? And that is the question of severability. So in some respect, whether one thought that the mandate was unconstitutional or not, the act would have to be found, it, that would have to be unseverable. Um, and haven't, uh, haven't uh, you may not know the answer to this, but I, I believe that in the last session of the Supreme Court, seven members of the court said that there's a very strong presumption against, uh, in favor of severability rather than knocking down an entire statute. That is true. It's a, an established doctrine, and it was reiterated even last term. So uh, did you participate in a moot court case on this last month or in, in the last near future? I did. Um, so William Can you tell us what a moot court case sure. is? So William & Mary Law School has every year what it calls its Supreme Court preview, and it includes a moot court case. There's a long tradition of moot court exercises at law schools. Um, you know, sometimes they're called mock trials. Sometimes they're called moot courts. That's when they're appellate. And it's a chance to educate the community around the law school, the students, or in the case of this William & Mary program, it also draws in people from around Williamsburg so that they can see how the judicial process works. And so, judges often participate in moot courts, right? Judges often participate in moot courts. And in this particular one, there were maybe comprising the panel. Um, you know, the, the conference involved several other events. But this moot court involved a panel. It was supposed to be a mock argument for this case. And there were about four judges, um, a couple law professors, and some journalists. Um, who were on the panel with advocates um, fleshing out the case so that we did it by Zoom because of the pandemic, but so that students could see how the process might look. And so what, what did the court, the moot court decide? Um, well, I do want to preface this, Senator Crapo, by saying it was an educational exercise. I understand. So it was made very clear to the audience both at the outset and then in the deliberation room and then outside that this didn't, it was not designed to reflect the actual views of any of the participants, and nor could it, because you know this was show up, you're not reading the briefs, diving de deep down, and you know a lot of times people change their votes in the deliberation room just for the sake of mixing it up and making it interesting. I understand, um, and I appreciate you making yeah, that. Yeah, I just yeah, I just want to make clear the context. Um, the vote was in the the panel. The majority said that the mandate was now a penalty and was unconstitutional but severable. Um, I think there was also a group in a minority who said there was no standing. Um, to be honest, now I can't remember. Maybe, maybe there was, 
I could be wrong about this, and I feel like there's maybe another minority that said it wasn't unconstitutional. And how did you vote? That. I voted to say that it was unconstitutional but severable. All right. So you voted in favor. The, the one clue we might have as to your thoughts on the issue, even though this was just an exercise and you didn't have the whole case presented, and, and I understand that. But I'll just say to the, to the viewers, the one clue we have is your ruling in this moot court case. And I think that's kind of an answer, frankly, to a lot of those who are raising this specter that you're going to try to take the whole Affordable Care Act away from everyone because of this very narrow case that is in front of the Supreme Court. Although I do want to be very clear, Senator Crapo, for the record, that it wasn't designed to reflect my actual view. So to the extent that people think I might have been signaling to the president or anyone else what my views on the Affordable Care Act are, you know, they couldn't have taken any signal from that. Certainly. I understand. But I wasn't trying to signal anything because it was a mock exercise. It, it was a mock case. It was a moot court. I understand that uh, very much. Uh, let me just go into a couple of others uh, of other issues here. Uh, in fact, I can hit them very fast. Uh, Senator Ernst mentioned the Orchard Hill versus Army Corps of Engineers case uh, on the waters of the United States. That is a big deal in Idaho and, frankly, in most of the Western United States, in fact, most of the entire United States. And um, I appreciated your your uh, ruling. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to ask you a question about it. I appreciated your ruling. I am going to ask you a question about the Chevron doctrine. And this is one of those you may not be able to respond to, but um, the well, would you tell me what the Chevron Doctrine is? Sure. So um, I got into this a little bit with Senator Ernst. The Chevron Doctrine is the doctrine that when a statute is clear, then that's end of case. But if Congress passes a statute that's giving an agency authority or that's describing the boundaries of an agency's authority and there's ambiguity in that statute, then the court will treat that ambiguity as a delegation to the statute, a delegation to the agency to fill in the details. Yeah, and, and I, I'll just tell you, I disagree with that doctrine. I think that the courts ought to have the ability to interpret the statute, and if it's ambiguous, they should interpret it as best they can, and that the, the interpreter in our system should not be the agency that is enforcing the statute. I think the courts should oversee this. Now, that's just my opinion. Um, so the question that I've, you probably can't answer is, what's your opinion? <laughs> You're right, I can't answer, Senator <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just had another couple of quick questions. I was going to go into the Heller case. Well, I, I will ask you, uh, tell me, what, you, what do you believe the basic ruling of Heller is? The basic ruling of Heller is that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms for self-defense. So, uh, so if I were to, to characterize it as that the, the Heller case reaffirmed that the right to bear arms is one of the rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights to individuals. That is what Heller held. That's what Heller held. Okay. You know, I, I do have a number of additional questions which were just kind of softballs. But, uh, I like softballs. <laughs> Maybe you deserve softballs right now, but I think instead I'll give you the break. Uh, and you can, like have, too, you can have the last five minutes of my time or, or you'll get done five minutes sooner. Uh, thank you very much for thank being willing to do this. You are an outstanding nominee, and I am very glad to be able to support you. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Uh, with that uh, goodwill in mind. We'll break and we'll come back, uh, say, 6.50. It'll give us about 30 minutes to grab a bite and we'll start with Senator Harris when we get back.
I'm late. I owe you a minute. <laughs> Apologize. Uh, Senator Harris, is she available? Senator Harris, if you could, there you are. We see you. Can you say something? Can you hear me, Senator? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, okay, the floor is yours, Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to extend greetings to Judge Barrett, and uh, I look forward to our conversation this evening. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I begin, I, I want to just take a moment to talk directly with the American people uh, about where we are and how we got here. So we are in the middle of a deadly pandemic that has hit our country harder than any other country in the world. More than 215,000 of our fellow Americans have died, and millions more, including the president, Republican members of this committee, and more than 100 frontline workers here at the Capitol complex have been infected. This pandemic has led to an historic economic crisis, causing millions of workers to lose their jobs without warning, and 12 million Americans have lost their employer-based health insurance. The Senate, I strongly believe, must be and needs to be laser-focused on you, the American people, to help you get through this pandemic. To do so, the Senate urgently needs to pass critical financial relief for those who are struggling because of this pandemic and many are struggling. People need help. They need help to pay their rent or mortgage. Parents need help putting food on the table. The millions of American workers who have lost their jobs need help making it through the end of the month. And small businesses need help so they don't have to close their doors for good. But sadly, Senate Republicans have rushed to hold this Supreme Court confirmation hearing rather than help those who are suffering through a public health crisis not of their making. As I said yesterday, these priorities are not the American people's priorities. Since President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law, Senate Republicans' number one priority has been to tear it down. And remember, before the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Insurance companies held virtually unchecked power over our health care system. They could refuse to cover basic medical expenses like maternity care, like mammograms, like prescription drugs or hospital stays. Worst of all, if you were sick, they could deny you coverage altogether and there was nothing you could do about it. Over the last nine years, Republicans in Congress have tried 70 times 70 times to repeal or roll back the ACA in the United States Congress. In 2013, Senate Republicans were so desperate to stop its success that they shut down the entire government for weeks. After President Trump was elected, Washington Republicans spent nearly a year trying to repeal the ACA. But I will always remember the thousands of Americans from all over our country and all walks of life who crowded into the halls of the United States Capitol to require that lawmakers see their faces and understand how they would be hurt if there was a repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Brave activists in the disability community staged sit-ins on the Hill Seniors protested to keep prescription drugs affordable. Mothers and fathers walked the halls with their children in strollers to show Congress the face of those who depended on the law. And doctors and nurses protested to protect their patients' access to the care they desperately need. Together with many of my colleagues, I joined civil rights and community leaders to speak to the thousands of people who gathered outside the Capitol as they pleaded, as they begged with lawmakers to do the right thing. All of these dedicated Americans demanding that their voices be heard. And they made a difference. They made a difference. History will remember 
that late night, thumbs down movement when the great, great John McCain denied Republicans the opportunity to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And now, following a decade of failure, Washington Republicans have realized that the Affordable Care Act is working too well and helping too many people to repeal it without facing serious political consequences. But what are they doing? After suffering the backlash they provoked by targeting the law in Congress, they decided instead to circumvent voters and try to strike down the Affordable Care Act through the courts. Right now, the Trump administration and Senate Republicans are urging the Supreme Court to strike down the entire Affordable Care Act and all of its patient protections. Republicans are scrambling to confirm this nominee as fast as possible because they need one more Trump judge on the bench before November 10th to win and strike down the entire Affordable Care Act. This is not hyperbole. This is not a hypothetical. This is happening. And here's what you have to know. People are scared. People are scared of what will happen if the Affordable Care Act is destroyed in the middle of a pandemic. There are more than 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions like asthma and diabetes, heart disease, who know that they could be denied coverage are charged more by insurance companies if Donald Trump is successful in getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. And because of the coronavirus, more than 7 million people have now a pre-existing condition that they didn't have earlier this year. Those who depend on the ACA are afraid of their lives being turned upside down if the court strikes it down. They know what could happen. And Judge Barrett, I will share with you and the American people a list. No protections for pre-existing conditions. Higher costs for health care for women and people over the age of 50. Young adults kicked off their parents' insurance. More expensive prescription drugs for seniors. Insurance companies refusing to cover mental health care. Insurance companies refusing to cover maternity care. No free mammograms, cancer screenings, or birth control. Insurance companies reinstating annual and lifetime caps. And more than 20 million Americans losing insurance at the worst possible time, again, in the midst of a pandemic, including nearly 2 million Texans, 607,000 North Carolinians, 288,000 South Carolinians, 227,000 Iowans, and 4.2 million Californians. And the pain of losing these protections would disproportionately be felt among the 9 million African American, Latino, Asian, and Native Americans who gained coverage under the Affordable Care Act. But this isn't about statistics. This is about millions of real people living real lives who deserve their government and its institutions to see them and to heed their call. And I know a Republican member of this committee said earlier today that the people who will lose health care are somehow not relevant to this hearing. I disagree. Helping these people is supposed to be why we are all here, why we all ran for office in the first place. And I'm here to fight for people like Felicia Perez. And this is her. Felicia is a writer, a public speaker, and former high school teacher from Southern California who now teaches at the University of Nevada, Reno. She has multiple pre-existing conditions, including arthritis, asthma, and a rare autoimmune disorder that caused tumors that have wrapped around her optic nerve and part of her brain. Her life depends on periodic cancer-fighting infusions that cost $160,000 a year. Felicia is terrified. She knows that without the Affordable Care Act, she could not afford ongoing treatment, the treatment she needs to stay alive. And here's exactly what she said, and I will quote. 
My life is in the hands of people I do not know, who do not know me, who are essentially telling me I don't matter, that my life doesn't matter, that my health doesn't matter, that the day-to-day -day quality of my life doesn't matter. And that's really hard. Tragically, Felicia's story is not unique. Her fears are shared by millions of Americans. The Affordable Care Act and its protections hinge on this Supreme Court and the outcome of this hearing. Before being elected, President Trump promised that every justice he put forward would, quote, will do the right thing, unlike Bush's appointee, John Roberts, on Obamacare, unquote. Judge Barrett, 18 months later, you criticized the Chief Justice for upholding the Affordable Care Act when you concluded, quote, Chief Justice Roberts pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. My question is how many months after you published that article did President Trump nominate you to be a judge on the Court of Appeals? Senator Harris, I apologize. I don't remember the timing of that article. I was nominated. I believe my nomination to the Court of Appeals was announced in May of 2017. That's correct. But I don't remember when the article came out. The article was published in January of 2017, so that would have been five months later. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, whose seat you are seeking to fill, provided the critical fifth vote in a 5-4 decision that upheld the Affordable Care Act. So let's lay this out for everyone who's watching. As I've discussed previously, one, Republicans have spent a decade trying to destroy the Affordable Care Act. Two, Donald Trump promised to name a Supreme Court justice and Supreme Court justices uh, who would tear down the Affordable Care Act. Three, President Trump is before the Supreme Court right now arguing that it be struck in its entirety. Four, the Supreme Court could be just one vote away from overturning the Affordable Care Act and all of its protections, including for everyone who has a pre-existing condition or may ever get a pre-existing condition. In other words, the Affordable Care Act and all its protections hinge on this seat and the outcome of this hearing. And I believe it's very important that the American people understand the issues at stake and what's at play. Judge Barrett, the day after President Trump announced your nomination to the Supreme Court, he tweeted, quote, Obamacare will be replaced with a much better and far cheaper alternative if it is terminated in the Supreme Court, end quote. But in reality, there is no alternative that protects the millions of Americans who depend on the Affordable Care Act every day. The horrifying truth is that President Trump and the Republicans in Congress are fighting to take health care away from the American people in the middle of a pandemic, as I have said. President Trump has said that he wants to protect the American people's health care. But the reality is right now he is asking the Supreme Court to take it away, period. Senator Klobuchar, Judge Barrett, asked you earlier today but did not receive an answer. Prior to your nomination, were you aware of President Trump's statements committing to nominate judges who will strike down the Affordable Care Act? And I'd appreciate a yes or no answer, please. Well, Senator Hess, I want to be very, very careful. I'm under oath. I, as I'm sitting here, I don't recall seeing those statements. But if, let's see, I don't recall seeing or hearing those statements. But I don't really know what context they were in. So I guess I can't really definitively give you a yes or no answer. What I would like to say is I don't recall hearing about or seeing such statements. Well, I imagine you were surrounded by a team of folks that helped prepare you for this nomination hearing. I have did had they, them. Yes. Did they, well, let me finish if you don't mind. Oh, I'm so did sorry. They, did they inform you of, of the president's statements and that this might be a question that was presented to you during the course of this hearing? Um, when I had my calls with senators, um, it came up many of 
many of the Democratic senators wanted to know about the Affordable Care Act and to satisfy themselves that I had not made any pre-commitments to the president about it. And so you then became aware of the president's statement, is that correct? Um, let's see, Senator Harris, in the context of these conversations, I honestly can't remember whether senators framed the questions in the context of President Trump's comments, perhaps so. I think from my perspective, the most important thing is to say that I have never made a commitment, I've never been asked to make a commitment, and I hope that the committee would trust in my integrity not to even entertain such an idea, and that I wouldn't violate my oath if I were confirmed and heard that case. So just so I'm clear, and then we can move on, are you saying that you are now, oh, before I said it, aware or not aware that President Trump made these comments about who he would nominate to the, to the United okay. States Supreme Court? All right, Senator Harris, what I was saying, I thought you initially framed the question as whether I was aware before this nomination process began. And my right, answer and to that I'm question is you if you are aware, were you aware before this hearing began? So you, you you're that. changing, you're asking me now whether I was aware before the hearing began? As a follow up question, I am, yes. Um, and what I said was that when I had my calls with Democratic senators, this question came up, and I don't recall, but it may well have been that they referenced those comments in the course of those calls. Even if so, that wasn't something that I heard or saw directly by reading it myself. Senator Leahy asked you earlier today, but I think it bears repeating, do you think it is important for the American people to believe that Supreme Court justices are independent and fair and impartial? And that is a yes or no answer, please. Yes, Senator yes. Harris. A number of my colleagues have asked you today whether you would recuse yourself from cases on the Affordable Care Act. You did not directly answer their questions, and instead you described a process by which that would um, work or happen. And so my question is, isn't it true that at the end of that process, regardless of that process, that it would be you who ultimately would make the decision about whether or not you would recuse yourself? That is true, and I can't have you elicit a commitment from me about how I would make that decision in advance. That would be wrong. Right, and what I've asked you is that, is it not correct that that is the process, that ultimately it would be you, and you alone, that would make the decision about whether you would be recused? You've already opined on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, and that position satisfied the president's promise to only nominate judges who would tear down the Affordable Care Act. And Senate Republicans rushed this process so that you could rule on this very case. The reasonable question about your impartiality will undoubtedly hang over this court's ultimate decision in the Affordable Care Act um, case if you refuse to recuse yourself. I strongly believe that. Um, Supreme Court justices, routinely consider the consequences of their decisions on people's lives. Earlier this year, the Supreme Court ruled against President Trump in his effort to repeal DACA protections for DREAMers. Children, of course, who have arrived in the United States, many before they could talk or walk. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for a 5-4 majority that included the crucial vote of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The court rejected the Trump administration's attempt to end production protections for DREAMers. Chief Justice Roberts said the administration had not taken into consideration the fact that many DREAMers rely on those protections when they started their careers and businesses, when they served in the military of the United States, um, when they bought homes, and when they started families. Senator Hirono, asked you whether it is appropriate for a Supreme Court justice to consider real-world impacts. But you're a sitting judge now. So my question is, in deciding whether to uphold government action, do you currently consider the consequences of your rulings on people's lives? Well, Senator Harris, that's part of the decision of every case. And so you do. Every case has consequences on people's lives, so of course I do in every case. That's part of the judicial decision-making process. And would you do that as um, if you are um, actually voted on the United States Supreme Court? Would you do that there as well? 
Senator, considering how a, the resolution of a dispute will affect parties, will affect people, is part of the judicial decision-making process, and I will continue engaging in that process to the best of my ability. So if the Affordable Care Act is struck down, more than 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer would pay more for insurance or be denied coverage entirely. More than 20 million Americans could lose their health coverage entirely, including nearly 3 million black Americans and over 5 million Latino Americans who received access to health insurance because of the Affordable Care Act. Insur insurers will once again be able to discriminate against that more than 50% of African Americans and nearly 40% of Latinos with pre-existing conditions. Insurers will be able to deny coverage to more the more than one quarter of Native Americans with conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. All of this in the midst of a pandemic that is not going away anytime soon. A pandemic that when age is taken into account has been three times as deadly for Black, Latino, Pacific Islander, and Native Americans. A pandemic that has killed approximately one in 1,000 Black Americans one in 1,200 Native Americans, and one in 1,500 Latino Americans. Judge Barrett, would you consider the 135 million people who gained protections under the Affordable Care Act when deciding uh, a case that challenges that law? Senator Harris, if I were to be confirmed and conclude that I was not, that I was able to sit on the case pursuant to the recusal statute, and then if I heard the case and decided the case, I would consider all the protections that Congress put in place. And as I said earlier, um, earlier during this hearing, the question would be figuring out whether Congress, assuming that the mandate is unconstitutional now, whether that, consistent with your intent, you know, this is Congress's law, would permit this uh, act to stand or whether the flawed portion of it could just be excised out. And that is a question not of what judges want. It's not a question of the Supreme Court. It's a question of what Congress wanted in the statute. And that is the statute you know, that you enacted and extended this health care coverage to millions of Americans. What weight would you give the fact that 135 million Americans with pre-existing conditions are now depending on the protections of the Affordable Care Act? What weight would you give that? Well, Senator Harris, as I mentioned to Senator Hirono, stare decisis takes reliance interests into account. Um, because as I've said before, stare decisis is about keeping stability in the law. So the law often takes into account reliance interests. I can't really say, sitting here, how they would play in or weigh in this case because that's part of the legal calculus of the case. So I can't really give you the kind of commitment or pre-commitment that you're asking for me of how I would weigh factors or how I would structure my decision-making process. I would ask you to consider, if you are confirmed on the court, a credible benefit of the Affordable Care Act and that a, 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 a destruction of its protections will have a devastating impact on millions, hundreds of millions of Americans. Um, Judge Barrett, you testified yesterday that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg opened the door for many women in law. Um, and I certainly believe and know that to be true as a personal matter. She was a trailblazer for women's equality and gender equal equity. Um, as a law student, as a teacher, as a civil rights lawyer, and as a second woman, um, ever to sit on the United States Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg broke many barriers for women across the country. Uh, we, I believe, all fondly remember her as, as, a, as a person who had patience. She had the will and the vision to make our country a more equal place and a more just place. And one of the things she fought for was a woman's right to control her own body and to make decisions about her own body and health care and reproductive choices. The Constitution of the United States protects a woman's right to choose whether or when to become a parent. And it protects a woman's right to choose abortion. Women of color, immigrant women, women with low incomes, 
and women in rural areas face significant barriers when attempting to access birth control, cancer screenings, and comprehensive reproductive health care. Moreover, anti-choice activists and politicians have been working for decades to pass laws and file lawsuits designed to overturn Roe and the precedents that followed. The threat to choice is real. Just last year, the court heard a case that gave it an opportunity to revisit and overturn its abortion precedent in a case called June Medical Services. The Supreme Court struck down a medically unnecessary restriction that would have closed all but one abortion clinic in Louisiana. Chief Justice Robert, Roberts agreed with the court's four liberal members that the court was bound by its own precedent to strike down the Louisiana law because it was virtually identical to a Texas law that the court ruled unconstitutional in 2016. As a result, women in the state were able to receive the full range of reproductive care. But Chief Justice Roberts wrote his own separate opinion in the case to make clear that in the future, he could not be counted on <clears throat> to uphold a woman's right to choose. Justice Ginsburg provided the critical fifth vote to strike down the unconstitutional abortion restriction in June medical services. So we must be honest about the impact of her passing and the impact it will have on the court's decisions in cases regarding women's access to reproductive health care. Now, my Republican colleagues have said that there is a minimal chance that the Supreme Court will overturn Roe. But back in January, 39 Republican senators, including 10 members of this very committee, signed their names to a Supreme Court brief that asked the court to, quote, take up the issue of whether Roe should be reconsidered and, if appropriate, overruled. So let's not make any mistake about it. Allowing President Trump to determine who fills the seat of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a champion for women's rights and a critical vote in so many decisions that have sustained the right to choose, poses a threat to safe and legal abortion in our country. After all, President Trump said that overturning Roe v. Wade will, quote, happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. Judge Barrett, several times today, you have quoted Justice Ginsburg's testimony about not making predictions in future cases. However, she was far more forthcoming at her confirmation hearing about the essential rights of women. In 1993, Justice Ginsburg's confirmation hearing shows that she testified that, quote, the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It is a decision she must make for herself when government controls that decision. For her, she is being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. Then Judge Ginsburg went on to say, quote, it is essential to women's equality with man that she be the decision maker, that her choice be controlling. If you impose restraints that impede her choice, you are disadvantaging her because of her sex, unquote. Now, Justice Ginsburg did not tell the committee how she would vote in any particular case, but she did freely discuss how she viewed a woman's right to choose. But Judge Barrett, your record clearly shows you hold a different view. In 2006, you signed your name to an advertisement published in the South Bend Tribune. It described Roe v. Wade as, quote, an exercise of raw judicial power and called for putting, quote, an end to the barbaric legacy of Roe v. Wade. You signed a similar ad in 2013 that described Roe as, quote, infamous and expressed opposition to abortion. 
Also in 2013, you wrote an article about Supreme Court precedent in which you excluded Roe from a list of well-settled cases that you said, quote, no justice would overrule even if she disagrees, suggesting, of course, that you believe Roe is susceptible to being overturned. On the 40th anniversary of Roe, you delivered a speech in which you said that the court's recognition of the right to choose was, quote, created through judicial fiat rather than grounded in the Constitution. And during your tenure on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, you have been willing to reconsider abortion restrictions that other Republican appointed judges found unconstitutional. As the Senate considers filling the seat of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was straightforward enough in her confirmation hearing to say that the right to choose is, quote, essential to woman's equality, unquote. I would suggest that we not pretend that we don't know how this nominee views a woman's right to choose and make her own health care decisions. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the following three documents be entered into the record. A letter opposing Judge Barrett's nomination from the NAACP, a statement opposing Judge Barrett's nomination from the Planned Parenthood Federation of America and Planned Parenthood Action Fund, and a report opposing Judge Barrett's nomination from the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Senator Harris. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, a letter here in support of Judge Barrett, signed by 281 graduates and former classmates of hers at the extraordinary St. Mary's Dominican High School in New Orleans. And I'd like to offer that into the record. Without objection. You tired, Judge? I'm looking forward to the end of the uh, hearing today, I must admit. Me too. <laughs> I'm still going to ask you questions. I was hoping you'd say you were going to yield your time, Senator. No, ma'am. A lot of my colleagues, and you as well, have talked about the oath that you will take if you're confirmed and sworn in as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. What's in that oath? What's it say? Well, that oath requires a judge, you know, I've taken the oath as a judge, to do equal justice to all, you know, without fear or favor, you know, regardless of wealth. Um, you know, to, to fairly apply the law is what it boils down to to not give preferential treatment or express bias in plain terms. It says you'll administer the law in an impartial manner without regard to your personal feelings, doesn't it? Yes, it does, Senator. It says you will support and defend the Constitution, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, pretty serious oath, isn't it? It is. Uh, are you going to uh, take that oath and affirm it if you're confirmed? Yes. You're not lying. I'm not lying. I took that oath before I began as a judge on the Seventh Circuit, and I have not violated that oath, and I would take it again, and oaths are serious to me. Well, now, Senator Harris just called you a liar. She said that if you take that oath, you'll be lying, that you've already made up your mind on how you're going to vote on some cases, particularly dealing with with abortion and the Affordable Care Act. Let's just cut to the chase. She said you're a liar. Are you a liar? I am not a liar, Senator Kennedy. All right, I want you to tell me again. Look me in the eye here in front of God and country. If you take that oath, will you mean it? I will mean it. If I take that oath, I will mean it. You swear to God? I swear to God. And you'll I have sworn at the Seventh Circuit, and I meant it there, too. You'll never break that oath. I will not break that oath. No matter what your personal feelings are. No matter what my personal feelings No matter what your religion is. No matter what my religion is. So when Senator Harris and her colleagues say you're a liar, they're wrong. They are. All right, let's see. 
you're 48 years old, you're an honors graduate of Rhodes College, an extraordinary liberal arts school. You're an honor, honors graduate of Notre Dame Law School. Uh, you clerked for two distinguished federal judges. You've been a chaired law professor. You've, uh, you're a devout Christian. You've raised seven children. I don't mean to wax too metaphysical here, but do you have personal values as a result of this? I would hope that no one would consider me to be nominated for anything if I had no values. Do you have uh, personal opinions? Of course, I have personal opinions. Do you have principles? I have principles. It wouldn't be fit for office if I didn't. Let's suppose that uh, we had a nominee appear before us. It happens to be a man in my hypothetical. And he said, uh, I've been nominated for a federal judgeship, and I finished law school, but I hadn't cracked a law book since law school, since uh, civil procedure. And uh, I don't have any opinions. I don't have any principles. Um, I don't read newspapers. I don't even read the news. I hadn't read a book since law school. Um, I'm like Bluto in Animal House. I'm just <laughs> fat, drunk, and, and, and stupid. Uh, I think, I think uh, the Germans are the ones who bombed Pearl Harbor. I think, uh, I think climate change, I think it didn't it cause the Cold War. But I'm your guy. Because I don't have any value. I'm a blank slate. And that's what requir is required, isn't it? For me to be impartial. Do you think we ought to confirm that gentleman? Well, then Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote an opinion on this issue um, and addressing recusal. And he said, basically, that if someone reached middle years, which one is basically middle-aged, if one would be a justice on the Supreme Court, and had a mind that was a blank slate and had no opinions, then one would question such a person's fitness for office. Well, my colleagues seem to think you, you're only qualified if you're, if you're dumb, if you have a blank slate, if you've never thought about the world. You've thought about the world, haven't you? I indeed have. Have you thought about a social problems facing our world? I have thought about social problems facing our world. Economic problems? Sure. I, I don't want to know uh, what, what your feelings are, but uh, uh, have you thought about uh, the merits and or lack thereof of nuclear energy? Um, no, I really haven't. How about I'll affirmative action? That one. Have you thought about that as a, just as a sure. subject? Yeah, yeah, I've thought about it. How about climate change? I mentioned climate change. Have you read about that? I've read about climate change. And you have some opinions on climate change that you've thought about? Uh, you know, I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm not I've saying been, you are. I mean, I, I've read things about cli climate change. I would not say that I have firm views on it. How, how about, have you thought about, uh, um, the merits of a flat versus progressive income tax? I have thought fleetingly about that. <laughs> yeah. These aren't things that I, you know, I'm not a tax lawyer or an I'm not trying to trap, uh, trap sure. you. Sure. Um, how about Justice Kagan? I've always been impressed with her credentials. Um, graduate of Princeton. Did an MPhil at Oxford. I think she went to Harvard Law. Was dean of Harvard Law mm -hmm. School. She was. You think she's thought about the world? I'm sure she has, and I too am very impressed with Justice Kagan. Yeah, me too. You think she's thought about climate change, and has personal feelings? I don't know. I mean, probably, but I can't really say what you know Justice Kagan has thought or not about. Okay. Now you have personal feelings about abortion, don't you? Um, I do have personal feelings about abortion. Do you have personal feelings? Have you ever thought about how we deliver health care in this country? 
I do, but Senator Kennedy, one of the things about the judicial role that I've repeatedly emphasized in the hearing today is that I've got personal views and personal feelings on a range of matters just like every human does and just like every judge or justice on the court does. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Now, my colleagues say, and Senator Harris said, that even though you have a personal opinion about abortion, that you will violate your oath to put aside those personal feelings and fairly decide abortion cases. Is that true? That, I gather, was the thrust of what she was saying to me, yes. Is she right? No, she's not right. Um, let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. It's going to, you know, California v. Texas. You've thought about the delivery of health care. Yes. You've got seven children. S spent a lot of time. You've probably been to an emergency care. room. Yes. Um, you, form, you, you, you formed opinions about the delivery of health care. Are, are you going to, do, should you recuse yourself? Well, Senator Kennedy, any opinions that I have, everyone has opinions. Every, any opinions that I have are just not relevant to the resolution of the case. Right. Affordable Care Act case or anything else. And a lot of my opinions, you know, are not ones that are expert, for example, in scientific matters or taxing matters. I mean, I have, might have dinner table discussions, but I don't purport to be an expert in any of those fields. Well, I'm, I'm going to hit this one on another lick now, because this is serious. Okay. Some of my colleagues in Senator Harris say you're lying. Are you lying? I'm not lying. Are you going to take that oath and abide by it? Yes, sir. Will you ever break that oath? I will not break that oath, Senator Kennedy. Okay. Now, one of my colleagues, I don't remember which one, said that uh, because President Trump appointed you, or nominated you, rather, that if there's a, a, a case that happens to go before the United States Supreme Court after you're confirmed dealing with the upcoming election, they ask you to recuse yourself. Remember that question? Mm-hmm. Um, and you said you would go through the process of determining right. the recusal question. But you yes. didn't commit to recusing yourself until you, uh, in one way or the other. You said you'd go through the process. I said I would go through the process. I committed to going through the process of determining whether to recuse. But okay. I did not commit to it. When, 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 now, P President Trump nominated uh, Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Did anybody ask him to recuse himself when the President's tax returns were before the court? I don't know. Uh, Justice Gorsuch was nominated by President Trump and, and confirmed by the Senate. Did anybody ask him to recuse himself when I, President Trump's uh, tax returns were before the court? I don't know if any motions were filed. Do you know who Paula Jones is? I do. Okay. She sued the President of the United States, didn't she? She sued President Clinton. Yeah. Clinton v. Jones. Famous case. Um, President Clinton nominated Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer to the United States Supreme Court. They heard that case. Did anybody ask that Justice Ginsburg recuse herself because President Clinton nominated her? I don't know if any motions were filed. You think she should have? Well, that's not something I would opine on. I'm sure that she discharged her oath to consider the question. Did any of my colleagues ask that uh, Justice Breyer recuse himself? from hearing Clinton v. Jones because President Clinton had appointed him? I don't think that's come up in the Yeah, case. I don't think so either. All right, I, I'm going to finish this housekeeping because I want to talk about the law. I want to give you a chance to respond to something. Some butthead professor at Boston University says that because you and your husband have two children of color, that you're a white colonist. The implication is that you're a racist and that you use your two children as props. Do you use your children as props? Senator Kenny, it was the risk of people saying things like that which would be so hurtful to my family that when I told Senator Graham this morning that my husband and I had to really weigh the costs of this, it was saying deeply offensive and hurtful things, things that are not only hurtful to me, but are hurtful to my children, who are my children, who we love, and who we brought, brought home and made part of our family, and accusations like that are cruel. 
Yeah, they are, aren't they? How low can you go? I didn't want to ask that question when your kids were here. I'm sorry I have to go through that. Okay, let's talk about the law. <laughs> uh, let's suppose, I don't, I'm not going to ask you how you're going to rule on a case. Okay. Be and you can't, couldn't answer anyway. You'd violate the judicial canons of ethics. I don't know what ha would happen to you, but it'd probably be pretty bad. Because uh, you're, you're a sitting judge. You're on the and Seventh Circuit. Judge. But, but let's, su let's suppose that, that a litigant, that, let's suppose Congress passed a statute making distinctions on the basis of wealth. Okay. And uh, somebody filed a lawsuit and said that their argument is that wealth is a suspect classification. How, do you, how are you going to analyze a case like that? Tell me, tell me how you'd analyze it. I just want to know how you think. Sure. Well, someone argued that wealth was a suspect classification. I assume you're saying that they're probably making an equal protection claim. Yep. So I would go to precedent would be the first source because the Equal Protection Clause um, has a rich body of precedent under it that identifies suspect classes. For example, classes drawn on the basis of race are suspect and they get heightened scrutiny. So I would look through Supreme Court precedent to determine whether there was anything relevant to the question of whether wealth was a suspect class or not. Okay. You're familiar with San Antonio School District B. Rodriguez? Mm, my mind's getting mushy this many hours into the hearing, so you might need to. Well, let me, let me put it another way. Wealth's not a suspect classification, is it? Um, I am not aware of a case saying that wealth no. would be a suspect yeah. classification. Well, here, here's what I don't understand. I've always wondered about this. Okay, this is remember this is Congress passing the statute, not some state. So, so the litigant is, is not pursuing this under the 14th Amendment. He's pursuing it under, or she, under the 5th Amendment. And um, he's making a substantive, well, he's, no, he's making an equal protection argument, not substantive due process. That would be a fundamental right. Where does the, where does the 5th Amendment mention equal protection? Um, well, the 5th Amendment has a due process clause. But I know. The 5th Amendment doesn't. But the, but, but the 14th Amendment has a due process clause and an and equal protection, protection clause, but the fifth, which applies to the states. But the Fifth Amendment clause, Fifth Amendment uh, uh, to the Constitution has a due process clause, but it doesn't say a word about equal protection. That's true, but the Supreme Court has interpreted it as applying the equal protection clause as well against the How can they do that if the words aren't there? Well, there was a case, um, I believe the case in which the court addressed this was the one that addressed the constitutionality of segregation in the District of Columbia, which is governed by federal law. Um, and the court said the same principle applies. And so essentially the reasoning of Brown applied there. Okay, I remember that. All right, let's talk about how our Senator Craypill talked about it a little bit. I went back and took a look at how Scalia wrote, you know this better than I do, Scalia wrote the majority opinion. I think Stevens wrote the leading dissent. And, and it was interesting, they both took an originalist approach, and I went back and looked it up. Scalia relied on, and, and, a, and a, tell me what, what an originalist approach is again. I know there are different strains, but what's your strain? Sure. You take the Constitution, so in Heller, for example, what Justice Scalia did, and, and this is an example of originalism, he went back to the time of the ratification of the Second Amendment to figure out whether when people, when that amendment was ratified, whether that right to bear arms was considered to be an individual right mm -hmm. or one that was a civic Excuse right. Excuse me for interrupting, but considered by whom? Considered by the people. The people. By the people at the time, not in the minds of the framers, but okay. by the people. Okay, I, I went back and looked, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I've had a little coffee, I'm kind of jacked up. <laughs> um, I went back and looked, looked it up. Scalia, he relied on, to reach his opinion, he relied on founding era dictionaries, founding era treatises, English laws, American colonial laws, British and American historical documents, colonial era state constitutions, post enactment commentary, all on the Second Amendment. And then here comes Justice Stevens, he's dissenting. He relied on, in his dissent, 
he relied on linguistic professors, an 18th century treatise on synonymous words, a, a, on a different editor of one of the same colonial era dictionaries on which Scalia relied. So they, they both went back and looked at history. Here's my question. Since when did justices become historians? Let me put it another way. If this is the way we're going to interpret the Constitution, by looking at history, why do we need you guys? Why don't we just hire professional historians? Well, so justices and judges interpret laws, and we interpret texts. And if texts are unclear, you have to figure out what their meaning is, right? And so with the Constitution, sometimes that does require delving into history. One point that I think is worth, uh, Justice Scalia would make this point, that the alternative is, let's say you have um, an amendment like the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. If it's not evident, looking at it, whether it's an individual right or a collective right for the sake of the militia, um, one approach would be to rely on the moral judgment of the judge, of the justice, say whether they think it's a good thing or a bad thing for the common good for people to have that individual right. And of course, judges aren't moral philosophers either. So when you're interpreting a text and you need to turn to something, what judges know is words and what judges know is law. And so having them go back and look at the history, those are familiar things to lawyers. And they're things that all justices consider. As I said earlier in the hearing, all justices do consider the history and the original meaning. And that's been true since the beginning of the court itself. Throughout the 19th century, this idea of originalism isn't new. So throughout the 19th century, you know, throughout the 20th, the court has resorted back and looked to see what the original meaning is. Um, it's just that, I would say, the difference between those who identify themselves as you know, originalists and those who just consider it is the amount of weight that they give it. So all judges have to be skilled in, in doing it to a degree because everyone agrees that as a matter of law, the original meaning matters. Tell me what the Ninth Amendment means. Um, well, the Ninth Amendment was once famously described by Judge Bork as an inkblot. Um, the Ninth Amendment has not been fleshed out in litigation. I don't think it's an inkblot, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but it's not one that, that there's a whole lot of case law on. I want to talk to you a little bit about originalism, or at least your strain of originalism, and how it's, how it's related to, uh, to uh, textualism, and how it's different from uh, from uh, purposivism. Um, did I understand you correctly to say that an originalist believes that judges have to follow the original public meaning of the Constitution? Correct. The original public meaning. Public meaning as distinguished from private intentions of those who drafted the document. Okay. Does this mean, when you say original public meaning, whose meaning? The average person in the community at that time? Well, we would say informed observers. So I'm sorry? I would say informed observers, like so those who were familiar with the debates, which is why looking at the state ratifying conventions, um, debating the Constitution can be a fruitful source. Is it okay, I know it's not okay to, to do it exclusively, but is it okay to consider what the drafters thought? Sure, and you know, James Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention are a source that the court routinely looks to in trying to determine original meaning. It's just that it's not conclusive. What's the dimension of time? I mean, it, at what point in time do you look at the original public meaning? Well, I would say there's some debate about that because you, know, you won't necessarily have all the evidence you need right from 1791, which is when the Bill of Rights, as you know, was ratified. You know, I think looking at the evidence from before that, so we see that in Heller, um, that Justice Scalia looked at how people understood that right all the time leading up to the ratification of the Second Amendment because it cast light on the language people were speaking at the time and how they would have understood it. So you definitely can look some before. Okay, excuse me for interrupting, yeah, but sure. my clock's running. Okay, 
Is it if you if you look at ten years after the Constitution was adopted, is that okay? How well, about twenty? I think it's. I think all of that can be relevant evidence. I think the farther that you get away from the ratification of the document, then I think the dicier it gets, because we might say that you know, well, with between 1791 and you know 1801 that people had roughly the same understanding. But of course, as time passes, you know, then attitudes can change. So I wouldn't say that there's a firm cutoff, but I think it's clearly the case that the evidence that's closer to the time is the most probative. OK, what's the difference between originalism and textualism? Well, textualism is a, how we describe a method of interpreting statutes. So it actually, in many respects, is kind of like originalism applied to a statute. So it would say you take statutory text, you know, um, you know, for the Clean Water Act or you know, the make up one, the um, the Amy Barrett Act <laughs> passed today. You look at what the words would have meant to those who um, read the act at the time and verbs ob informed observers of the of the debate. So you're looking at the ordinary meaning of the words. You're looking at the ordinary meaning of the words. The plain meaning of the words. The plain meaning of the words. What, what, if, uh, what, what, if, what if they're unclear? Um, well, there are a series of canons of interpretation um, that judges employ to decipher language. They're like linguistic tools. Like sometimes a list means the expression of some things implies the exclusion no, of I'm others. I'm familiar with all those. You, you know them better than I do. But but if, if, if the statute's unclear, if there is no ordinary meaning, meaning, can you look at legislative history? Um, generally, I think that legislative history is a less fruitful source um, because generally when people make arguments about legislative history, they tend to be less about what a word meant and how a statute would apply to a certain circumstance, which is a little bit different. But if it's amb ambiguous, you can look at legislative history as a last resort. You can look at legislative history to determine whether there was a particular understanding of a word or a phrase. But I think it would be, um, in most cases, inadvisable to look at legislative history to make a determination, and certainly not to treat it as binding, about how a statute would apply to a particular set of facts. OK, well, well how, how ambiguous? A, a, a lot of textualists say, if, it's, if, it, if, it's, if the statute's ambiguous, if it's unclear, mm -hmm. then I can consider secondary sources. How ambiguous does it have to be? 51%? 65%? How do you know how ambiguous? Well, it's not it a has precise, it, it's an art, not a science, I would say, Senator Kennedy. Um, you know, you exhaust all the canons of interpretation, and that includes even ones that are not the grammatical canons, but are like the avoidance canon. You run through all of those, and then you look at the structure of the statute. And I mean, I think deciding when something crosses the threshold and becoming ambiguous so you can consider canons like the rule of lenity or the avoidance canon, you know, that that's a very difficult question. And it's part of the debate about the Chevron doctrine. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the term uh, purposivist? Yes. Okay. I think, tell me, you correct me now, a purposivist says, look, I look at the statute, uh, even, even if it's clear, I can still look at secondary sources and try to figure out what problem the legislative body was trying to solve. That is so, yes. A purposivist would say that to be faithful to Congress would be to be faithful to the purpose of the statute, yeah. um, and that sometimes the text doesn't align exactly with the purpose, and that in that circumstance, the judge should go with the purpose rather than the text. Now, everybody's a, a textualist now, or an originalist. Um, but really, aren't, aren't a lot of our textualists really purposivists? In other words, they go, well, I looked at the language of the statute. It's unclear. So. I checked off the originalist or, te or rather textualist box, and now I can just go look at what problem Congress is trying to decide and do whatever the hell I want to do. There has been um, some academic commentary, definitely in the last 
five or ten years, saying that that's become kind of the new strain of textualism. You might know the case Holy Trinity. Yeah. Yeah, calling it the it's new. Been overruled though, hasn't it? Um, Holy Trinity, you mean its approach to statutory interpretation the and its yes. endorsement? Yeah. No, it's never been overruled, but it's fallen out of favor. But this idea of doing what you're saying, stretching to find ambiguity in text, the argument that some make is that it's kind of a new form of Holy Trinity because rather than saying that the text is clear but inconsistent with the purpose, the argument is that um, the purpose renders the text unclear. All right, let me ask you a couple more. Um, I want to talk about a state constitution. In Louisiana, we had a, a, a constitutional convention in 1973. We wrote a new state constitution. And we recorded everything. We've got, uh, I think, 14 volumes of transcripts, committee reports, anything you could possibly want to know about the drafting of the 1974 Louisiana constitution. You're an originalist. Are you telling me to just throw all that stuff out? No. Those things would be the equivalent of looking at James Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention or the state ratifying conventions. All those things shed light on what Louisianians were thinking when that Constitution was drafted and ratified. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I want the record to reflect that I landed this plane with 26 seconds left. So noted. Thank you very much, yeah. Senator Kennedy. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Judge. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I have three letters to submit, one from uh, Penny Nance, the CEO of Concerned Women of America, on behalf of that organization, Amy Kramer, chairperson of Women for America First, on behalf of their organization. They're both in support of Judge Barrett, and then a letter from Tennessee Secretary of State Trey Hargett, who is applauding her record on textualism and stands in support of her nomination. No uh, objection. Judge Barrett, you have been a trooper, and so we're going to do a little bit of loose end tying up and then get you on your way. And we appreciate the commitment that you have made. And Jesse, I tell you what, my hat is off to you. You have just been great to be here uh, today and to stand right with her. I tell you, my, I wish my husband were here. We were talking a little bit earlier today about uh, when I called him about how you have been right here, hardly leaving the chair the entire time. And we appreciate that. My husband has said he's someday going to write a book, and he's going to call it, I Carried Her Purse. <laughs> <laughs> because we couldn't do what we do without supportive spouses. First thing I want to say, and Senator Ernst touched on this, um, our colleagues across the aisle have spent a lot of time talking about COVID relief and the importance of that for healthcare and for people that are suffering, they have the opportunity. We can put our bill back on the floor. They each chose to vote no, every single one of them, on additional PPP, unemployment insurance, money for testing and vaccines, getting schools open, and liability protection so that businesses can open. So, we would be very pleased to have that bill back on the floor and to pass it to get needed relief to the American people. Um, the second thing I want to touch on, I think there's been a little bit of confusion on with some of the comments that were made. Um, it's important to note that abortion is not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. The word abortion does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. That is correct. And Roe versus Wade is not an amendment to the Constitution. Roe versus Wade interprets the 14th Amendment of the Constitution and locates the right to terminate a pregnancy in the liberty, um, in the due process clause, the liberty interest. Correct. I think that from some of the comments from some of our colleagues, there has been confusion about that. Uh, the next thing is uh, Senator Whitehouse kind of came at you saying you had never tried a case. And I think it is important to note that Justice Kagan had never tried a case. 
and um, we want to have that. She's been mentioned several times today, so as a point of clarification, we would uh, want to mention this. Um, one thing that we have heard a good bit about at this committee, and some of our colleagues chose to mention this yesterday, is that Republicans don't nominate enough female judges. But when we nominate a highly qualified woman for a Supreme Court vacancy, what is the very first thing they do? They turn their attack machine on. And then they start into the politics of personal destruction. And they uh, attack you for not being, for not fitting into the paradigm of the left because you're pro-life, pro-family, pro-religion. And we have seen this happen with other judges that have come before us. Judge Naomi Rao, uh, Wendy Vitter, they have been criticized. And if you don't buy into this agenda of the left, if you're female, then they act as if you're not a real woman. And I will tell you, quite frankly, they do not believe that all women deserve to have the opportunity to have a seat at the table. It's only certain women, and we have seen their liberal narrative play out today. Senator Hirano really tuned up on this when she suggested that you, of all people, would not support women in the workplace. And I, I will tell you this, as a woman who has worked in the private sector and then in public service, when comments like that are made, it discourages all women from trying to step forward and trying to take the skills that they have developed in one area of their life and then use it as an opportunity to serve their nation, to serve their community, because they don't want the liberal attack machine pointed at them. And I will tell you, quite frankly, it is so discouraging to me to see groups on the left say, we want diversity, but let that diversity come from a woman who is on the political right, and it's like their heads explode. They do not want that as a part of the conversation. What they prefer to have is that very narrow, liberal viewpoint. And I look forward to the day when that will stop because all women deserve the opportunity to rise. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it, I find it so interesting that they don't want to support women from the political right because we do not submit to the leftist agenda. We won't submit to that. So then free thinkers end up being called bad women and traitors to our gender and other disparaging comments uh, that are out there. And you have endured some of these pretty extraordinary revelations today, many of which have um, involved accusations that you're part of some sort of backroom conspiracy to rig the system against the American people and that your record as a judge is somehow frightening and is going to cause a panic. But I have a feeling that this isn't the first time you have heard such rhetoric or been subjected to such rhetoric by a group of your peers that have probably tried to hold you back because of your personal beliefs. I think that most of us that come from the political spectrum on the right have endured that, a professional organization that would have been nice to join. But because you're pro-life, you can't. Opinion not wanted, participation not wanted. Because you're pro-religion, pro-family, opinion not wanted. Do not apply. 
for admission. And um, this is the kind of wrongheaded perceptions that need to stop. It is not uncommon for women who practice their faith or who hold pro-life views to endure this, especially in a professional context. And that is what we have seen the left throw at you today. And I find it so interesting that they have tried to use this focus to evaluate your professionalism as a judge, doing to you exactly what they say they despise. Interesting take. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the intellectual and personal discipline you mentioned during uh, Senator Lee's line of questioning. Let's go back to that. You said that discipline is required when resisting the urge to exercise your own will when deciding how to rule on a case. So talk for just a second about that. Why it's important to stay true to your basic constitutional statutory framework rather than favoring the living constitution approach. Well, Senator Blackburn, I think as it came up with Senator Lee, and I know with Senator Sass and Senator Hawley too, that judges are not policy makers. And you know, we live in a pluralistic society where we have lots of different views on lots of different matters, as Senator Kennedy was pointing out. And so in a pluralistic society, you know, I may approach a particular problem, let's say it's a problem of constitutional law, and I may really feel like the result I want is one way, but I'm just one person. And there are surely other people um, in America, other people on the bench, who would see the best resolution going a different way. So who am I or who is any judge to say that their result, like, oh, just this once or just this time, I'm going to reach the result that seems the best, even if it runs against the law that the people have ratified. And so it would be wrong because, I mean, I, I, I don't think people, I think I said earlier, want to live under the law of Amy. I mean, we have the United States Constitution, and, and that's what judges should be faithful to. I see Senator Kennedy don't want to live Well, but I Amy. think probably <laughs> the law of Amy uh, prevails at the Barrett household <laughs> <laughs> over those children. 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tell my children, and my son's birthday is today, and we were chatting earlier, and we were laughing about how when I wanted them to do something that they didn't necessarily want to do, I would remind them that I was the chief mama in charge. <laughs> so it was, it was something that was going to happen. Uh, let me touch just a second on Obamacare, because uh, they have, our friends across the aisle have seemed to express just a deep concern about a case that is coming up on November 10th the severability clause and how this would take Obamacare down. Uh, again, this is, goes into their fear-mongering and causing panic, and we know that, because it's not about the ACA case that is scheduled for November 10th. This is all about their concern that a constitutionalist judge on the Supreme Court just might get in the way of their push to implement government-run health care, to do a socialized medicine plan, or to do the Green New Deal, or to do statehood for D.C., their wish list of um, items that they have. But we do, for the record, need to clean up the numbers that are around this. We've heard some wild numbers get thrown around today when it comes to the ACA. There are right now 8.3 million Americans enrolled in the ACA marketplace exchange, enrolled in Obamacare. So, and what they're doing is blowing that number up. And um, they have tacked on the entire individual market and added Medicaid and Medicare to get to their number, 
that they are saying is 150 million Americans are going to lose their, their health care. What they're not saying is there are 153 million Americans that are in the private health care marketplace. So if they got their way, every one of those individuals in that private health care marketplace would lose their health insurance. So our goal is to make certain that all Americans have access to affordable health care. And I think it's a bit disingenuous the way they're, um, that 8.3 million is the number that comes to us from CMS and HHS. And then, as I said, they're blowing that up by adding in the entire individual market and Medicaid and Medicare and forgetting to mention that there are 153 Americans that have uh, a private health insurance. Um, my colleague from California would really like to have people believe that your sole mission in life is to overturn the ACA, and you have stated that you are not on the mission to overturn the ACA. I am not, Senator Blackburn, and I have no mission and no agenda. Judges don't have campaign promises. That's a good thing. And they've made much about a letter that you signed opposing a, a contraceptive mandate and an article that you wrote criticizing an interpretation of the ACA as a tax. Mm -hmm. But I had a very interesting conversation today. I actually did a Facebook Live with one of your former students who had written an op-ed for Real Clear Politics, uh, Chase. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chase um, Giacomo uh, said one of the things he appreciated about you is that you made your students think. And I think that is a wonderful trait for a judge because what you did was to cause them to get into problem solving. And at a time when we live in a cancel culture, that is a very positive thing to have students do, to cause them to think. So we really appreciate that. And I know that you've stated that you're going to put aside personal opinions and abide by the Constitution when it comes to addressing all of uh, the cases that would come before you. Um, let's move on. Uh, Senator Sass went to the Fourth Amendment with you, and I want to touch on this uh, pertaining to electronic searches and surveil surveillance. And um, the Fourth Amendment is so important for safeguarding the privacy of our citizens and our data from unreasonable searches and seizures. And so many Americans are doing so much of their life online. And I think it is imperative that Americans have the ability to protect their virtual you, which is their presence online, their data, their transactional life. And now, for so many people, it is the way they're working. And as you said at the White House uh, ceremony, the Barrett E. Academy, of which you all co-principled, people are going to school um, online. And um, there was a case, Carpenter versus U.S., mm -hmm. and it outlined just how far the Constitution pro uh, protects searches of electronic evidence. It was a 5-4 decision and the court ruled that law enforcement must obtain a warrant in order to track a person's cellular location information beyond seven days. Justice Thomas and Gorsuch both dissented, and Justice Gorsuch objected that the majority's reasonable expectation of privacy standard was not faithful to the Fourth Amendment text. 
Instead, govern, uh, Justice Gorsuch reasoned the Fourth Amendment protects only those searches included in the original text, searches of persons, houses, places, and effects. Uh, some critics of originalism complained that today's laws should not be governed by the dead hand of the past. Can you explain to us how the Fourth Amendment can still govern the modern world's searches and seizures, and how will it continue, how will it continue to apply to emerging technologies that the founders never could have imagined? Sure. So I think as a general matter, you know, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And it doesn't mean that it protects only the kinds of searches and seizures that those who lived at the time of the adoption of the Bill of Rights could have anticipated. So surely they couldn't have anticipated the internet or cell phones or you know, airplanes, for that matter. Um, but one can reason from the kinds of privacy protections that were in place in 1791 when the Fourth Amendment was ratified to see if the search of modern technology now is analogous to it. So one example is the Kylo case. Justice Scalia wrote that opinion, and that's a case um, where law enforcement had used an infrared detector to see if someone was growing, I think it was marijuana on the inside, and they could use the infrared to see if it lit up if people were using heat lamps right. essentially inside. And Justice Scalia said that, yes, that was a search, you know, that the Fourth Amendment did apply and the police had to have a warrant. Even though that technology didn't exist at the time, it was the same kind of invasion um, into the home. And so it didn't matter that, you know, infrared machines were not in the contemplation of the generation that ratified the Fourth Amendment. Okay. And then um, is there a difference between searching for data via a device that is in a person's possession and searching for, uh, say, data on the servers that are hosting? Let's see. So that would be a question I probably can't answer. In okay. addition to the Fourth Amendment, there would also be statutes that, you know, govern how much data one could mine. So that would be one of those legal hypothetical situations that I wouldn't be able to answer in the context of the hearing. All right. Um, let's end it at that so that you can get out of here. There are a couple of things that uh, tomorrow we're going to have time, and we will talk about a couple of those other questions, uh, campus free speech, executive overreach, uh, a couple of other things we'd like to have on the record. But uh, thank you very much for your patience and for your desire to serve. Thank you, Senator Thank you, Blackburn. Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Blackburn. I'd like to <clears throat> echo what Senator Blackburn said. You've been very patient, very poised, and uh, I really appreciate the way you've handled yourself today. To the committee, I quite frankly think this has been a good example of what can be in the Judiciary Committee challenging questions on things that matter to people in a way that you can leave the arena saying, well, that worked pretty well. One more day, 20 minutes apiece, see you at 9 o'clock.